Are you ready, Sarah? Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. Order. Question to the Secretary of State for Scotland. I'm going to call Secretary Alistair Jack to answer the substantive question number one from Stuart C. Macdonald. Secretary of State. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We can assess the strength of the Union every day as we see the number of people vaccinated across the country continue to rise, as we see the number of jobs we have protected, as we see our vital, ambitious plans to rebuild our economy. I have to say, Mr. Speaker, I'm surprised the Honourable Gentleman is asking about recent assessments because the one thing that we learnt this week was that his boss, Nicola Sturgeon, has made no recent assessment of her plan to rip Scotland out of the United Kingdom and the damage that would cause. Right, let's go to Stuart C. Macdonald. Stuart. Mr Speaker, if he's so confident about the Union, why is he stopping the Prime Minister from coming to Scotland to campaign for it? Have the dubious donations for renovations made that impossible? The contracts for contacts? Or just the disgraceful comments about bodies piling high? Or is it simply that the Prime Minister represents a fundamental problem for Scotland being in the Union? year after year of Prime Ministers, parties and policies Scotland wouldn't vote for in a million years. Well, what I can say to the Honourable Gentleman is that in all the conversations I have with the Prime Minister, and I have them on a weekly basis, in person, one-to-one, -one, by telephone, his passion for the United Kingdom and strength of the United Kingdom burns brightly. Let's go to Douglas Ross. Douglas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As of yesterday, 61.3% of Scots 16 and over had received at least one dose of COVID vaccine. Comparing to the European Union, just 24.3% of those aged 18 or over have received a vaccine in the EU. Does the Secretary of State agree with me that the outstanding efforts of our NHS staff, our British Armed Forces and vaccinator volunteers it has only been possible here in Scotland because of the success of the UK vaccination programme and Nicola Sturgeon's claims that somehow an independent Scotland within the EU would have done it differently are complete rubbish. Secretary of State. Mr Speaker, I do absolutely agree with my honourable friend. I think just once on something as important of life-saving vaccines, it would be nice to see the First Minister congratulate the Prime Minister and the United Kingdom Government on our highly successful UK-wide vaccine procurement programme. We now come to the Shadow Secretary of State, Ian Murray. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I hope you'll allow me to pay tribute to everyone who's commemorating International Workers Memorial Day today, and also to wish the Secretary of State a very happy Ed Balls Day, which is also uh, landing on today. Uh, Mr Speaker, on the Andrew Marr show on Sunday, the First Minister admitted that there has been no analysis done on the impact of incomes from separation. That's wages, livelihoods and, of course, pensions. It follows a long list during this election campaign where the SNP has avoided answering questions on currency, EU accession, jobs, deficit, debt, public spending, the parallels with Brexit and, of course, the spectacle of senior SNP M MSPs saying last week that a border with England would be desirable because it would create jobs, a rare honest admission about a border with our largest trading partner. And two days in a row, respective think tanks have warned that leaving the UK and giving up our share of UK resources means supercharged austerity. Surely one of the strongest positive cases for the Union is the reality of separation. So can I ask the Secretary of State, if proponents of separation continue to refuse to answer critical questions that fundamentally impact people's livelihoods, incomes and futures, what can be done to inject some much-needed honesty and integrity and truth into this debate for the benefit of all Scots? Thursday. Well, Mr Speaker, I absolutely agree with the Honourable Gentleman that independence would have a whole, series, a whole series of negative consequences for the people of Scotland, not just on their pension and benefits, but around currency, around borders issues, armed services. The list, the list is endless. And there's been no assessment done of those things, as I said earlier. We, this is the time we should be coming together for COVID recovery, to rebuild our economy, not even considering an irresponsible independence referendum. And, and I would very much welcome his and other political parties uh, willing, if they showed a willingness to come together to work on how we can strengthen our union. I'd welcome that. Ian Murray. As, as, and as Sauer has said throughout this campaign, we need to unite the country to deal with the global pandemic. Uh, talking of honesty, integrity and truth, 
Can the Secretary of State take this opportunity to apologise on behalf of the Prime Minister for his let the bodies pile high comment when so many have lost loved ones due to COVID, over 800 deaths in my city of Edinburgh alone? And while he is apologising, perhaps he can tell us, if the Prime Minister has nothing to hide, who funded the refurbishment of Downing Street Flat? And does he think that endemic sleaze in his government, with continual questions about the personal conduct and integrity of the PM, strengthens or weakens the union? Well, I mean, what I'd say to him on the, on the body's remark is that in every conversation I've had with the Prime Minister in the last year, his, his desire at all levels has been to save lives and protect the NHS. And I have, in many conversations, both in, in Cabinet committees, Cabinet and in private, I have no recollection of him being anything other than totally focused on saving lives and protecting the NHS. And he's been entirely focused on this pandemic, uh, uh, his pandemic all the way through. It, without, he hasn't been distracted, as others have, the nationalist uh, Nicola Sturgeon admitting to, she took her eye off the ball. He hasn't taken his eye off the ball. He's been focused on the pandemic. He's tackled vaccines and the programme, he's, and he now wants to lead our economic recovery. And those are the things that we should hold him to account for. That's, those are the things that strengthen the United Kingdom. Right, let's go to John Lamont. John. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. There's been much reckless chat from SNP politicians about creating a hard border between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, my constituents in the Scottish border want to see the threat of a border and indeed the threat of another referendum removed. So does the Minister agree with me that the voters of Scotland have an opportunity to remove that threat next week in the Scottish elections by depriving the SNP of a majority and that the best way of doing that is by voting Scottish Conservative? Bit of a toughie. <laughs> well, you, you won't be surprised, Mr. Speaker, that I do agree <laughs> with my honourable friend. And, and I would note with some astonishment, Mr. Speaker, the comments of the South of Scotland MSP Emma Harper that a border would be a good way of creating jobs, despite the fact that 60% of our trade is with the rest of the UK. And all I would say is if the SNP think that a border is such a good idea for jobs. I'm surprised they don't want to go the whole hog and propose building a wall. Right. Let's go to SNP spokesperson, Murray Black. Murray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Particularly as we rebuild after COVID, we have an opportunity and a need to make radically different economic choices. Now, after a week of troublesome allegations from the government and the Prime Minister, it should be of no surprise that many in Scotland want to take a different independent path to that of this government. So if that request is reflected in the upcoming Scottish government elections and a majority of pro-independence MSPs are elected, will he and his government respect that as a mandate for a second independence referendum? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the first thing I'd say is let's not take the outcome of the election for granted at, at this stage. And let's recognise that the focus for Scotland has to be on pandemic recovery. We've, we've saved lives through the vaccine pro procurement. It's now time to save livelihoods and to rebuild as one United Kingdom. Let's go back to Murray Black. Murray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I didn't hear an answer to my question there. You see, the, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives was asked multiple times on recent media what would be the democratic path for Scotland to an independence referendum, and he couldn't answer the question. So can the Minister tell us what the path is? Well, it, you know, I, I would say to the Honourable Lady that in 2014 there was a referendum. It was many years since the, quest, the, the question had been asked. And that was with the consent of both Scotland's governments and all the main political parties. And I'm glad to say that in, Scot in Scotland, people shared my opinion in 2014 and consented to continue being members of the United Kingdom. Right. Let us go to Pete Wishart. Pete. And thank you, Mr Speaker. There's only one surefire way for the union to be strengthened in the next week, and that's to get the Prime Minister to Scotland and on the campaign trail. The Secretary of State surely knows that there will be throngs of happy Scots rejoicing in his sleaze-free presence, helping the Electoral Commission with their inquiries, sharing their anecdotes about bodies piled high on the street. What could possibly go wrong for the Scottish Tories? So can the Secretary of State and I start working on the itinerary? 
Surely Scotland deserves to see its Prime Minister before he inevitably has to resign. Secretary of State. Well, the Prime Minister's diary is not my, as you well know, is not my concern, and he certainly won't be resigning. And I come back to the point I made earlier. In all my discussions with him, his passion for strengthening the United Kingdom burns very bright indeed. David Lynn, number nine. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the UK Government's approach to welfare is to recognise the value and importance of work, making work pay and supporting people into work whilst giving extra help to the most vulnerable in society. On this basis, we consider that a universal basic income is fundamentally the wrong approach. David Lynn. Thank you. I'm very grateful to the Minister for that reply and I know that he's very committed to devolution and the respect agenda that he would want to take very seriously the outcome mm-hmm. of the result of the, the election in Scotland. Now, given that all of the main parties in Scotland have indicated support for trialling the concept of UBI, except the Conservatives. That represents 80 per cent of Scottish voters. Would he accept that if indeed those parties are elected in the next parliament, there is a mandate and it would just be respecting devolution to go ahead with those trials? Well, I, I would make two points in response to the Honourable Gentleman. The first is that if he looks around the world where uh, UBI has been trialled, uh, in Finland and Canada, for example, it's not been a success. Uh, and indeed, in Finland, uh, the Finance Minister has scrapped it and is instead looking along something along the lines of our universal credit system. The second point I would make to the Honourable Gentleman is that the Scottish Government already has substantial powers over welfare. Let's go to Christine Jardine. Christine. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, While I share um, the Honourable Member for Glasgow East's um, determination that universal basic income is the way ahead and his disappointment that it's not being trialled in Scotland, does the Secretary of State share my disappointment that the SNP government at Holyrood was not able to get its processes in shape in time to be able to adopt the powers over welfare in the 2016 uh, Scotland Act, which may have given them more influence over the situation. Minister. Well, I I certainly agree with with the Honourable Lady's point. Uh, The Scottish Government still has much to do to unlock the full potential of the powers devolved to it in the Scotland Act 2016. We are committed to working closely with them to allow them to implement uh, those powers. Uh, But it does strike me that the separatists are always quick to demand more powers or more money to shift the blame away from their failures in office uh, on delivering for the issues that matter to the people of Scotland. We now have a substantive question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And with permission, I will answer questions 11 and 12 together. I have regular discussions with ministerial colleagues as well as industry stakeholders on the opportunities that COP26 offers across Scotland. The COP26 Devolved Administration Ministerial Group brings together the COP President, Territorial Secretaries of State and Devolved Administration Ministers to support delivery of an inclusive and welcoming COP26 Summit representative of the whole United Kingdom. Let's go to John Howell. John. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last year, the SNP government missed their own legal emissions targets, with source emissions in Scotland actually increasing by 1.5% in 2017-18. Does my my honourable friend agree that as we approach the crucial COP26 summit in Glasgow later this year, the Scottish people deserve a government that is 100% focused on a green recovery, not another divisive independence referendum. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm sure you'll agree I can't. It's not for me to answer to the failings of the Scottish Government. Uh, However, I can assure my honourable friend that the UK Government is absolutely focused on achieving a green recovery plan as set out by the Prime Minister in his 10-point plan last year. This Government is also focused on safeguarding the Union, and I agree with my honourable friend that a divisive referendum on Scotland's separation from the UK at this time would be an irresponsible distraction from the necessary work required towards that green recovery. Alexander Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the ambitious new target this Government set last week to cut the UK's carbon emissions by 78% by 2035? And does my honourable friend agree that in the run-up to the crucial COP26 summit later this year, it is more important than ever for all parts of the UK to work together so we can meet this target, so we can build back better and greener from the pandemic? Minister. Again, I completely agree with my honourable friend. Our proposed world-leading target marks a decisive step towards net zero by 2050 and would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 78% by 2035 compared to 1990 levels. 
Through this year's COP26 summit, we will urge countries and companies around the world to join us in delivering net zero globally as we continue to work together across all parts of the UK to achieve our net zero ambitions and achieve a green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The reality is the Minister should be embarrassed that renewable generators in Scotland face the highest locational grid charges in the whole of Europe. Ahead of COP26, we need to see a route to market for pump storage hydro for wave and tidal, go ahead for ACON CCS and CFD for hydrogen. What capabilities the Scottish Health has got at working with Cabinet colleagues to actually get these matters resolved? I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question, and I, I share his enthusiasm for all things related to energy renewables. Um, but he will know as well as I do that by law transmission charging is a matter for Ofgem as the independent regulator. And, and Ofgem, he, I would imagine he would be aware as well, is currently considering some aspects of transmission charging arrangements through its access and forward looking charges review. Let's go to Angela Crawley. Angela. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The SNP Scottish Government has committed to doubling its Climate Change Justice Fund. If re-elected next week, this is £24 million fund is used to help combat the effects of climate change in the Global South while we tra tackle carbon emissions at home. In the year of COP26, will the UK Government follow Scotland's lead and commit to a comparable Climate Justice Fund to help those affected by climate change? Uh, I, I, I uh, thank the Honourable Lady for her question. Uh, not only will we uh, commit to a comparable financial commitment, the recent spending review committed to spend £12 billion on green measures to support the 10-point plan and boost the UK's global leadership on green infrastructure and, and technologies, not just ahead of COP26 this year, but beyond as well. Substantive question to Minister Stewart. Uh, the United Kingdom is and will remain a research superpower, with R&D spending at the highest level for four decades. The Government has committed to invest nearly £15 billion in research and development in 2021-22, much of which will be used to fund the work being led by our world-class universities. Let's go to Andrew Gwynne. Andrew. Thank you. But both Aberdeen and St Andrews Universities stand to lose £2.5 million each as a result of ODA cuts. Among the ongoing projects at risk at Aberdeen is a £1.8 million research initiative into the spread of infectious diseases between rodents and humans. Given that we've recently been reminded of the importance of long-term, well-funded research in responding to a global crisis, what steps are being taken to ensure that these cuts do not impair Scotland's ability to respond to future crises? Well, the first point I'd make to the Honourable Gentleman is I'm always willing to discuss individual programmes with specific universities, and I've done that through uh, the Honourable uh, Lady, the Member for North East Fife, in the case of uh, St Andrews. But the second point I'd make is all the universities he has listed have benefited from significant investments, either directly through UKRI um, or through our city and regional growth deal programmes, looking at uh, R&D into issues like uh, clean energy and sustainable farming. We now come to Shadow Minister Chris Hall. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's strange, Mr. Speaker, because University of Scotland says that the ODA funding is unprecedented and egregious, and yet the Minister stands at the dispatch box and says it's OK because they get funding from other sources. University of Scotland say that this amounts to a 70% cut in overseas funding of development for projects across universities in Scotland. So, can the Minister explain how these cuts are reconciled with the Conservative Government's idea of their post Brexit ambition to build a global Britain? Well, as I said uh, in response to his, his honourable friend, I'm more than happy to discuss individual programmes with the universities concerned. But if you look at R&D investment from this government in the round, it is significantly up. Uh, and will Scottish universities are punching above their weight in securing a share of that. We now have a substantive question to the Secretary of State. With permission, Mr Speaker, I will answer questions 17 and 18 together. The defence industry in Scotland is strong, thanks to sustained UK government spending. My department has a close, positive relationship with the industry and the UK armed forces in Scotland, including on the implementation of the recent integrated review, defence command paper, and the defence and security industrial strategy. Let's go to Mark Mantis. Mark. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Shared expertise and infrastructure is key to supporting jobs across the United Kingdom. 
such as at Wharton in my constituency and those north of the border at BE Systems site at Clyde. What estimates does my right honourable friend make of the positive impact the UK government's defence manufacturing has on job opportunities for the people of Scotland? Well, I'd say to my honourable friend, the Royal Navy shipbuilding programme will provide a pipeline of work and sustain valuable jobs and skills for shipyards around the United Kingdom, including those in Scotland, being in Rosyth and, Cly and the Clyde, uh, which are they're currently constructing the new frigate fleets. The Ministry of Defence has spent £2.7 billion with Scottish industry in 2019 and 2020 alone, and that has supported 12,400 jobs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The integrated review published last month made clear that our strongest asset is the capabilities, the expertise and the skills we have across the United Kingdom. But would my right and friend agree with me that it is that same expertise and skills shared across the country that has enabled us to spend billions of pounds over the next decade on shipbuilding in Scotland? Sure. Sure. Yes, Mr Speaker, I will absolutely agree with my honourable friend. Uh, wholeheartedly, we saw a fine example of Scotland's contribution to the UK's defences this week with the deployment of our new aircraft carrier strike group. And that was built in yards around the United Kingdom, but it was constructed in Scotland and Her Majesty's ship Queen Elizabeth will fly the flag for global Britain right around the world. We have a substantive question to Minister Stewart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last month's budget provides continued UK-wide support and security to manage the ongoing impacts of COVID-19. One in three jobs in Scotland has been supported by the UK Government's employment support package. Scottish businesses have benefited from more than £3.4 billion of loans and support, and we have also provided a much-needed boost to the Scottish tourism and hospitality sector with our UK-wide extension of VAT reduction. Right, let's go to Sally Ann Hart. Sally Ann. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Scotland's Auditor-General recently said that the Scottish Government had received an extra £9.7 billion from the UK Government during 2020 to 2021 to tackle Covid, yet had only made £7 billion worth of spending announcement in response to the pandemic up to the end of 2020. The Auditor-General said that this left £2.7 billion unallocated and does my honourable friend agree that this highlights the need for transparency and scrutiny of Scottish Government spending as people in Scotland have a right to know how much money to help Scotland deal with the pandemic is being spent? Thank you. My honourable friend is right to draw the House's attention to this uh, alarming finding. Uh, people in Scotland want to know that the money that this government has provided is reaching them and their businesses. Uh, and it is of great concern that Audit Scotland has identified uh, this shortfall. Uh, I absolutely agree that this must be given the maximum transparency. Robin Miller. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, we stand on the edge... Sorry. I'm sorry. Question 20, please, Mr Speaker. I regularly discuss opportunities for Scotland arising from the signing of trade deals with my Cabinet colleagues. This Government has already struck deals with 67 countries around the world worth £218 billion a year, including with Canada, Japan and Singapore, and with many more to come. This will create new markets for Scotland's exporters, including our world-leading food and drink sector. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A new free trade agreement with Australia is now in sight for the UK. Does my right honourable friend agree that this is a tremendous opportunity for exporters of agricultural products and indeed food and drink producers across Scotland and Wales? My right honourable friend is right about that and he's right to welcome the, the breakthroughs over the past few days with the Australian Government. Businesses in Scotland exported goods worth over £352 million to Australia in 2019 and reducing tariff barriers for our world-class food and drink industry could bolster Scotch whisky exports to Australia. As the Secretary of State for International Trade made clear at the weekend, this deal will be based on fair competition, maintaining our high standards and providing excellent, exciting opportunities for British products. Right, we have a substantive question to Minister Stewart. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The UK Government works with the Scottish Government on a daily basis on a range of constitutional matters, including uh, delivering on our devolution commitments through the Scotland Act Order Programme. I would have thought, Mr. Speaker, that a more interesting question would have been to ask what discussions his new party has had with the First Minister uh, on an unnecessary and devices further referendum and separation. Let's go up to Neil Hamby. Neil. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, when Scotland opens negotiations for independence following the election of a supermajority on the 6th of May, can I ask, will those talks be led by the Secretary of State or the Minister for the Union, should, of course, he still be in post by that time? Well, I must say to the Honourable Gentleman, he's being rather presumptuous about the outcome of the elections next week, so let's wait and see what uh, the, the people of Scotland decide. I would have thought they will be more interested in uh, keeping the protections of the pandemic uh, in place, helping businesses recover, and helping children catch up on the education that they've missed over the last year. That's the end of questions, of Secretary of State for Scotland. We are now going to come to the questions for the Prime Minister. I will first call the Prime Minister to answer the engagements question, and then I will call Andrea Jenkins to ask her supplementary. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I know the thoughts of members across the House are with the people of India. We are supporting India with vital medical equipment, and we will continue to work closely with the Indian authorities to deter determine what further help they may need. Mr. Speak, Mr. Speak, I also welcome last week's Court of Appeal decision to overturn the convictions of 39 former sub-postmasters in the Horizon dispute, an appalling injustice. So, Wynn Williams is leading an ongoing independent inquiry that will report this summer. Mr. Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and, other, and others in addition to my duties in this House. I shall have further such meetings later today. Let's go to Andrea Jenkins. Andrea. You're on mute, I think, Andrea. Have you got the answer? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more about PMQs. I'm, I'm sure the Prime Minister knows the answer. Prime Minister. Can't do it. What, what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and come back. I'm going to go to Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in his remarks about the humanitarian disaster we're witnessing in India? I know the UK has already committed some support, but given the scale and gravity of the disaster, I hope the Foreign Secretary will set out today what more the UK will do to help the Indian people in their hour of need. Can I also join the Prime Minister in his remarks about the post office case and ongoing um, injustice? Um, and of course, today is International Workers' Memorial Day. And this day, uh, this year, after all the sacrifices our frontline workers have made during the pandemic, it's even more poignant than usual. I join in solidarity with all those mourning loved ones today. Mr. Speaker, it was reported this week, including in the Daily Mail, the BBC and ITV, backed up by numerous sources, that at the end of October the Prime Minister said he would rather have, and I quote, bodies pile high than implement another lockdown. Can the Prime Minister tell the House categorically, yes or no, did he make those remarks or remarks to that effect? Prime Minister. No, Mr. Speaker. And I think what I think uh, the, the right honourable gentleman is a, is a lawyer, I'm given to understand. I think uh, that if he's going to repeat allegations like that, uh, he should come to this House and substantiate those allegations and say, and say where he heard them and who, who, exactly, who exactly is supposed to have said those. Who exactly is supposed to have said those things, Mr. Speaker? Uh, because uh, what I certainly can tell him. Uh, and he asked about the October decisions. They were very bitter, very difficult decisions, as they would be for any Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, because no one wants to put this country uh, into a lockdown with all the consequences that means for loss of education, for the damage uh, to people's life chances, to the huge medical backlog that, that it entails. But it was thanks to that lockdown, the tough decision that we took, 
Mr Speaker, that, that, and thanks to the heroic efforts of the British people, that we have got through to the, this stage in the pandemic where we find ourselves rolling out our vaccine, where we've done 50% of the population, 25% of the adult population have now had two doses, Mr Speaker. And I want to, I, I, lockdowns, lockdowns are miserable. Lockdowns are appalling things to have to do, but I, I have to say that I believe that we had absolutely no choice. Yes, well, somebody here isn't telling the truth. The House will have heard the Prime Minister's answer, and I remind him the Ministerial Code says, and I quote, Ministers who knowingly mislead Parliament will be expected to offer their resignation. I'll leave it there for now. Turning to another issue, who, who, there will be further on this, there will be further on this, believe you me, who initially, and Prime Minister initially is the key word here, who initially paid for the redecoration of his Downing Street flat? Uh, well, uh, Mr Speaker, when it comes to misleading Parliament, he may recollect that it was only a few weeks ago uh, that he said uh, that, he sub he, that he didn't oppose this government, uh, this country staying in the, uh, leaving the European Medicines Agency. The fact that he was then uh, forced to retract and leaving the European Medicines Agency was absolutely invaluable uh, for our vaccine rollout. And actually, it was just last week. Uh, that, he, that he said that James Dyson, he said that James Dyson was a, f a personal friend of mine, uh, a fact that James Dyson has corrected uh, in the newspaper this morning. Uh, as for, as for the, 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 the latest stuff that he's, uh, that he's bringing up, he should know that I paid for uh, Downing Street refurbishment personally, uh, Mr Speaker, and I, contra I contrast it, uh, I contrast it, and any, any, any further declaration that I have to uh, make, I will, uh, if, if any, will, I will be advised upon uh, by Lord Guy. But if he talks about housing costs, uh, Mr Speaker, then the people of this country can make their own decision in just eight days' time. Uh, because on average, Labour councils charge you £93 more in Van D, uh, the Conservative councils, and Liberal Democrat councils charge you £120 more. That, I think, is the issue. That, I think, is the issue upon which the British people would like him to focus. Yes, Starmer. Mr Speaker, normally when people don't want to incriminate themselves, they go, no comment. Let me ask this. Let me give, well, let, let's, let's explore this a bit further, Prime Minister. Let's ask it a different way. Either, this is the initial invoice, Prime Minister, initial invoice, either the taxpayer paid the initial invoice, or it was the Conservative Party, or it was a private donor, or it was the Prime Minister. So I'm making it easy for the Prime Minister. It's now multiple choice. There are only four options. It should be easier than finding the chatty rat, Mr Speaker. So I ask the Prime Minister again, who paid the initial invoice, initial invoice, Prime Minister, for the redecoration of the Prime Minister's flat, the initial invoice? Hey, Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I've given him the answer, and the answer is I have, I have covered the costs, and I think most people will find it absolutely bizarre. And, of course, there's an Electoral Commission uh, invest investigating this, and I, I can tell him that I've conformed in full with the Code of Conduct, with uh, and, uh, Minister's Ministerial uh, Code, and I, I've, uh, uh, officials have been kept, uh, 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 have been advising me throughout this whole thing, but I think people will think it absolutely bizarre that he is focusing on this issue. Uh, when what people want to know is uh, what plans the Labour government might have uh, to improve uh, the life of people in this country. And let me tell you, if he talks about housing again, uh, we're helping people uh, on the house. I'd rather not spend taxpayers' money, by the way, like the last Labour government, we spent £500,000 uh, of taxpayers' money on the Downing Street. Fact, I'd rather... If I, I, I would, that, yes, they did. Yes, they did, tarting it up. I, I, would much rather, I would much rather help people on the, get on the property ladder, and it's this Conservative government that has built 244,000 homes in the last year, which is a record over 30 years. This is a government that gets on with delivering on the people's priorities while he continually raises, I think, issues that most people would find irrelevant to their concerns. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, he talks of priorities. What's he spending his time doing? This is a Prime Minister who, during the pandemic, was nipping out of meetings to choose wallpaper at £840 a roll. A roll. Last week, just last week, he spent his time phoning journalists to moan about his old friend Dominic Cummings. And he's telling the civil service to find out who paid for the redecoration of his flat. The Cabinet Secretary has been asked to investigate 
who paid for the refurbishments in the flat. Why doesn't the Prime Minister just tell him? That will be the end of the investigation. Mr Speaker, it's been widely reported that Lord Brownlow, who just happens to have been given a peerage by the Conservative Party, was asked to donate £58,000 to help repay for the cost of this refurbishment. Can the Prime Minister, if he's so keen to answer, confirm? Did Lord Brownlow make that payment for that purpose? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think I've uh, answered this question uh, several times now. And, and the, answer, the answer is that I have covered the costs. I have met the uh, requirements that I've been obliged to meet in full. And uh, I, I, when, it comes to, when it comes to the taxpayer and the costs of Number 10 Downing Street, it was the, Labour, it was the, the previous Labour government, I think Tony Blair racked up a bill of £350,000. And I think what the people of this country want to see is, a, is minimising uh, taxpayer expense. They want to see a government that's focused on their needs uh, and delivering more homes for the people of this country and cutting council tax, which is what we're doing. And it, it's on that basis that I think people are going to judge our party parties on May the 6th. Keir Starmer. Answer the question. That's what the public s scream at their televisions every PM queues. Answer the question. The Prime Minister hasn't answered the question. He knows he hasn't answered the question. He never answers the question. The Prime Minister, the Prime Minister will be aware that he's required to declare any benefits that relate to his political activities, including loans or credit arrangements, within 28 days. 28 days, Prime Minister, yes. He will also know that any donation must be recorded in the register of ministers' interests and that under the law any donation of over £500 to a political party must be registered and declared. So the rules are very clear. The Electoral Commission now think that there are reasonable grounds to suspect that an offence or offences may have occurred. That's incredibly serious. Can the Prime Minister tell the House, does he believe that any rules or laws have been broken in relation to the refurbishment of the Prime Minister's flat? Prime Minister. No, I don't, Mr Speaker. What, what I... What I, what I... What I believe has been strained to breaking point is the credulity of the public. Uh, he has half an hour every week uh, to put serious and sensible questions to me about the state of the pandemic, about the vaccine rollout, about what we're doing to support our, our NHS, about what we're doing to fight crime, about what we're doing to bounce back from this uh, pandemic, about the economic recovery, about jobs for the people of this country. And he goes on and on, Mr Speaker, about wallpaper when, as I've told him umpteen times now, I paid for it. Mr Speaker, can I remind the Prime Minister of the Nolan Principles, which are meant to govern the behaviour of those in public office? They are these. Selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership. Instead, what do we get from this Prime Minister and this Conservative Government? Dodgy contracts, jobs for their mates and cash for access. And who's at the heart of it? The Prime Minister, Major Sleaze, sitting there. Mr Speaker, meanwhile, he talks about priorities. Crime is going up. NHS waiting lists are at record levels and millions of people are worried about their jobs, including Liberty Steel. Mr Speaker, don't the British people deserve a Prime Minister they can trust and a government that is mired in sleaze, cronyism and scandal? Yeah. Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, last week he came to this chamber and he attacked me for talking to James Dyson about ventilators, where we're now sending ventilators to help the people of India. And the following day, the following day, Mr Speaker, uh, the Labour front bench said that any Prime Minister in my position would have done exactly the same thing. It wasn't only a few months ago that they were actually attacking Kate Bingham, as it, saying she was a crony when she helped to set up the vaccine task force that delivered millions of vaccines for the people of this country, Mr. Speaker, and helping us to get out of the pandemic. This is a government that is getting on with delivering on the people's priorities. We're rolling out uh, many more nurses, 10,000 more nurses in the NHS now than there were this time last year, 8,771 more police officers on our streets now than there were when I was elected, including tougher sentences, Mr. Speaker, for serious sexual and violent criminals, which he opposed, Mr Speaker. We're getting on. And by, and by the way, I, I forgot to mention it. I forgot to mention it. Last night, our, our friends in, in, in the European Union voted to approve our Brexit deal, which he, which he opposed. 
uh, which enables us not just to take back control of our borders, Mr. Speaker, but to deliver free, uh, which it does, which he fervently opposed, and a- enabling, us, enabling us, amongst other things, to deal with such threats as the European Super League, uh, Mr. Speaker, but it enables us to deliver free ports in places like Teesside, and above all, taking back control of our country has allowed us to deliver the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe, as he well knows, Mr. Speaker, which would not have been possible, which would not have been possible if we'd stayed in the European Medicines Agency, which he voted for. Mr. Speaker, week after week, the people of this country can see the difference between a Labour Party that twists and turns with the wind that thinks of nothing except playing political games, whereas this party gets on with delivering on the people's priorities, and I hope that people will vote Conservative on May the 6th. Thank you, William Carmick, down a little. Joy Morrissey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The UK is indeed a world leader in COVID-19 vaccination. May I thank the Prime Minister for the swift action he has taken to deliver this for our country. And will the Prime Minister join me in thanking the many local volunteers, such as Kirsty Griffith, who has been volunteering at the Marlowe Vaccine Centre, and Guy Hollis and Paul Bass, who, was, who have been volunteering alongside the Denham um, Community Health. And thank you for the vaccine rollout in South Box. Uh, well, uh, she, my, my honourable friend should thank everybody involved, and it's been a fantastic national effort, led uh, by the, the, the NHS, led by, overwhelmingly by GPs, but also by many others, by local council uh, officers, uh, officials, uh, by the army, by many others, and of course, huge numbers of volunteers in, in her constituency and elsewhere. And I thank Kirsty Griffiths, Guy Hollis, and Paul Bass very much for everything they've done. Let's go to the leader of the SNP. Ian Blackford. Ian. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition over the humanitarian crisis in India and the injustice over the horizon issue at the post office? Mr Speaker, over 127,000 people have died from COVID in the United Kingdom. People have lost their mothers and fathers, their grandparents and even their children. NHS staff have given their all, fighting to keep people alive. That's why so many people find the Prime Minister's remark that he would rather let their bodies pile high in their thousands than go into lockdown utterly, utterly sickening. The BBC and ITV have multiple sources confirming that this is what the Prime Minister said. People are willing to go under oath, Mr Speaker, confirming that the Prime Minister said these exact words, under oath, Mr Speaker. Now, parliamentary rules stop me from saying that the Prime Minister has repeatedly lied to the public over the last week. But can I ask the question, are you a liar, Prime Minister? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I leave it to you to judge whether the uh, arrival of gentleman's uh, remarks were in order. But I, what I will say to him is I that... Just say, unfortunately, we're in knowledge of but we're not savoury and not what we would expect. I'm grateful to you, Mr Speaker. Uh, But what I would say to the uh, right honourable uh, gentleman is that if he is going to relay that kind of uh, of quotation, it is up to him in a place like Parliament uh, to produce the author. Uh, the person who uh, claims to have heard it, because uh, I can't find them. Uh, he says that they're willing to, to go on oath. Perhaps they're, they're sitting somewhere in this, in this building. I rather doubt it, uh, because, uh, because I didn't say those words. What I do believe is that a lockdown is a miserable, miserable thing. And I did everything I could to try to protect the British public throughout the pandemic, to protect them from lockdowns, but also to protect them uh, from disease. And he's right to draw attention to the, to the, to the wretched uh, toll uh, that, that COVID has, has brought. And we grieve, and I know the whole House grieves for every family that has lost a loved one. It has been a, it has been a horrendous time. But it is thanks to that lockdown and the vaccine rollout, combined with the vaccine rollout, that we're making the progress we are. And I, I, and I, and I may say uh, we're making progress across the whole of the United Kingdom. Let's go back to Ian Blackford. Ian. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And of course, it's the Prime Minister's behaviour which is not in order. This is a Prime Minister who is up to his neck in a swamp of Tory sleaze. We've seen contracts for cronies, tax for tax breaks, and cash for curtains. The Prime Minister has dodged these questions all week, and he's dodged them again today. But these questions simply are not going to go away. 
So when exactly was money funneled through Tory HQ into his personal bank account? When did he pay back this money? Was it an interest-free loan? And who is the donor or donors who originally funded it? Is the Prime Minister aware that if he continues to fail to answer these questions, that the Electoral Commission has the powers to prosecute him? Will the Prime Minister publish these details today? Or is he going to wait until the police come knocking at his door? Yeah, uh, um, uh, Mr Speaker, I, as I've said, I, I look forward to what the Electoral Commission has to, uh, has to say, uh, but I can tell him that uh, for the rest of it he's talking complete nonsense. And uh, it is, um, the only thing I, I will say is that uh, it, it is thanks to our investment uh, in, uh, in policing uh, that we're going to have another 20,000 more officers on the, on the street uh, of, our, of the streets of our country. And that is a fantastic thing. And, and, and we will be making sure that that gets through uh, to Scotland as well. What we want to see, what we want to see is a Scottish nationalist government stop obsessing about breaking up our country, which is all they, all they can think about and talk about, and talk about tackling crime and using that investment to fight crime, which is, I think, what the people of Scotland want to see. Gary Samrock. If the Prime Minister was to walk down Bristol Road South in Longbridge today, he would see a small army of JCB diggers levelling out the old MG Rover Westwork site to provide one of the biggest levelling up projects locally, uh, with 5,000 extra jobs at an industrial site. But what people want to see too is a regeneration of Northfield High Street with a proper plan and money on the table. And so does the Prime Minister agree with me that we need people like Andy Streets, driven and energetic mayors, delivering for the West Midlands, working with me and local Conservative councillors to deliver on this plan? Because after all, Mr Speaker, teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I, I, I'm, I'm lost in admiration for what Andy Street is doing. He's a fantastic mayor. Uh, of the West Midlands, and he's got a, a fantastic a vision for transport, for jobs, for growth and recovery, and I hope everybody votes for Andy Street on May the 6th. Right, let us go to Liz Savile roberts Liz. I think it's worth repeating the Ministerial Code 7 guiding principles. Selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership. The Prime Minister has spent the week ticking them off on his don't do list. At the same time, he tries to play down allegations of saying, let the bodies pile high. Given that the sole judge on questions relating to the conduct of ministers and the conduct of the Prime Minister is the Prime Minister himself, what happens when a Prime Minister goes rogue? Mr Speaker, the people of this country have a chance to uh, make their own minds up on, on May the 6th. And uh, they, uh, when they look at uh, what's happening in Wales, uh, Mr Speaker, they have a chance to um, make a choice between a, uh, uh, well, I'm afraid, a continually failing Welsh Labour government uh, or Welsh Conservative uh, administration uh, in Cardiff that I, I believe has a fantastic vision. 65,000 uh, high skill, high paid jobs, doing up the A, finally addressing the problems of the A55, getting 5,000 uh, more teachers, uh, 3,000 more nurses uh, into, into the Welsh NHS, uh, solving the problems of the M4, which I've spoken about so movingly many times uh, in this chamber uh, before, Mr. Speaker. I hope uh, that people will avoid voting uh, for, for, for Plaid Cymru and that they will vote uh, for Welsh Conservatives on May the 6th in Wales. Duncan Baker. Mr Speaker, as probably the only former sub-postmaster in Parliament, last, sun, uh, last Friday's ruling was the beginning, not the end. Yes, it will cost a lot of money and yes, it would take time and there is more compensation that is needed. But does the Prime Minister agree with me that only a proper, judge-led public inquiry can really bring justice to those victims of this horrendous accounting scandal and also hold to account those involved behind the scenes? Uh, I, I share, I'm, so, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for uh, his expertise in this matter and uh, uh, thank him for, uh, for what he has just said, because he's totally right. I think that uh, what happened to those post office uh, workers, the postmasters, the sub postmasters, was appalling. It was one of the biggest miscarriages of justice in our history, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and we are looking indeed 
at uh, uh, the issues uh, involved, and uh, the former High Court Judge Sir Wynne Williams uh, will be making uh, recommendations about what further actions, what further apologies uh, we need to make. Let's go to Howell Williams. Howell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The PM uh, just raised the matter of the Welsh Gender Election. Well, in March last year, this United Kingdom Conservative government intercepted a deal between Wales and the Roche Pharmaceutical Company for 5,000 daily COVID tests, instructing the company to reserve all additional COVID tests to England. Those tests would have been crucial to saving thousands of lives in Wales. So, as we go to the polls next week, will the Prime Minister tell us why Welsh lives meant so little to him? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm afraid he, the, the Honourable Gentleman is completely wrong in what he says about tests, but I can tell him uh, I can tell them that he's right about one thing, which is that Wales has made an amazing contribution to our national, our UK fight back against COVID. And it, it was incredible to, again, to go uh, to the Wockhart factory in, in Wrexham, uh, to go to that site. And it's, it's Wockhart working together with Oxford Biomedica that has enabled us to roll out the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, Mr Speaker, that has made such a difference. It, it, and I, I want to uh, say a massive thank you again to those, uh, those Welsh scientists, all those people working in that factory, because they have helped to save countless lives across the UK. Laura Farris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The integrated review confirms the vital role the atomic weapons establishment in Berkshire will play in our future nuclear capability. I want to pay tribute to them, and particularly to the senior female employees who have won a slew of national awards for their work in defence, science, engineering and nuclear security. Given the government's significant investment in all these sectors, would my right honourable friend say how he plans to improve women's participation in these fields where they've been historically underrepresented? And could I invite him to the AWE to illustrate our success? Yes. Uh, I, I will be uh, honoured to take up her, her invitation as soon as I, I can. Uh, uh, in terms of the uh, female uh, representation in that sector. She, should, of course, knows that Alison Atkinson became the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of, of AWE uh, in, in May 2020, and there are huge numbers of opportunities uh, for women to join our, our, our armed services. Thanks, Mr Speaker, above all, for the biggest uplift in defence spending since the end of the Cold War. Let's go to Sir Rupp, Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I welcome uh, the Prime Minister's commitment last week to include aviation and shipping into our target emission, emissions. But surely the Prime Minister knows that we will miss this target if we proceed with a third runway at Heathrow. And furthermore, that that would undermine the progress that this government hopes to make towards net zero. So will the Prime Minister take this opportunity to commit to amending the airport's national policy statement in light of these commitments? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, the, the, the third runway at Heathrow is, a, as she knows, a, a private sector uh, venture. It's up to them to produce the, the capital to, to do it. I don't see any immediate sign of that particular project coming off. I think what we should be looking at instead, and what we are looking at, is the prospect of jet zero aviation, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker of, of flying uh, without carbon uh, emissions uh, or with far lower carbon emissions. And uh, it is in that area that uh, the Department of the Bays uh, and DFT are working together with the manufacturers so that this, ca this country leads in guilt-free flying. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Right now, in every part of the country, levels of business optimism are higher than they have been since the start of the pandemic, with many firms planning to hire more staff and create more pre apprenticeships for our young people. And there's one factor, more than anything else, that underpins that optimism, and that is the success of the UK vaccination Program. So does my right honourable friend agree with me that there's never been a more important moment for voters in Scotland and in Wales to reject the negativity and the divisiveness of the nationalists and instead look forward to a brighter and stronger future as one united kingdom? 
uh, absolutely. I don't know why the, uh, sh the, the sh shadow uh, leaders, uh, PPS, is shaking her head, because uh, surely she would agree with that. Uh, we, we want to work together across the whole of the UK, and I, I pay tribute, to, as, I, as I have just said, to the incredible work of the, of the Watcart factory in Wales, but there's also the Valneva uh, factory uh, in Scotland, uh, and the whole of the United Kingdom coming together, uh, represented by our armed services, and above all, by our NHS helping to deliver that vaccine rollout to protect the country and take it forward. Let's go to Janet Davey. Janet. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is absolutely shocking that we have heard the Electoral Commission is investigating funding of the Prime Minister's Downing Street flat, saying there are reasonable grounds to suspect an offence. Why does the Prime Minister think all of these stories about sleaze, corruption and dishonesty keep happening to him and his Conservative government. I tell you what, Mr Speaker, I think it's because people are absolutely determined uh, to find anything they can hang on to uh, to talk about except the vaccine rollout, except our plans to unite and level up across the country, uh, except our plans to fight crime and give people the opportunity to buy their own homes, because they don't want to discuss those issues, because they can't win on those issues, Mr Speaker, because they've got absolutely nothing to say. And that's what's become clear over the last year. Let's go to Nick Fletcher. Nick. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Before I ask my question, may I first ask the Prime Minister to join me in thanking all the staff at Doncaster Royal Infirmary and the emergency services for dealing swiftly with a major water leak yesterday. Fortunately, no one was hurt and all patients have been moved safely to other wards. However, back to my original question, the local elections are only days away and would therefore like to ask the Prime Minister if he would offer his full support to Doncaster Conservative mayoral candidate James Hart. James, like me, is a local businessman and will shout up for our town and work closely with me on delivering the government's levelling up agenda. Minister. Well, I, look, um, uh, um, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right. First of all, he's... He, oh, hang on. He's right, Mr Speaker. Uh, to want to thank all the staff of Doncaster Royal Infirmary uh, for what they did for the emergency services in dealing with the incident uh, last night. And I, I, I'm glad to take that opportunity. But well, I'm also glad to take the opportunity uh, to support him uh, for, in his campaign for James Hart. And I do hope that the people of Doncaster will go out to vo vote uh, and support him on May the 6th. Let's come to Christian Matheson. Speaker, the Prime Minister promised in a series of texts to fix a tax issue for his mate, Sir James Dyson. At that dispatch box last week, he promised to publish those texts, but of course he's not made good on that promise. So when will he publish them? Uh, Mr Speaker, I promised to publish the account of my dealings with James Dyson, which is exactly what I have done. And I can't believe they don't learn their lesson, Mr Speaker. Uh, they, they, attacked, they attacked the government uh, for having any kind of discussions uh, with a, a British ventilator maker uh, last week, or potential ventilator maker last week, and, and, then, and then the following day they did a, a, a U-turn and said that any Prime Minister would do it, and they've now done another a double U-turn, Mr Speaker, and they're, they're trying to bash me again. Which is it? Do you, do you believe the government should be supporting British manufacturing delivering va ventilators? Yes or no? That's the question for Labour. Let's go to Dr Luke Evans. Luke. Mr. Speaker, my constituency is best known for Battle of Bosworth, but we also have many other attractions like Twycross Zoo, Mallory Racecourse, um, Burbage Common, and Thornton Reservoir. Now, these attractions all support superb cafes and pubs. With the bank holiday weekend coming up, does the Prime Minister have any plans? Does he want to pop up to Bosworth? But more importantly, what is the government doing to support these attractions and domestic tourism as we go into the summer? I want to thank my uh, honourable friend. I want to tell him that no matter how many pints uh, I joined him in lifting in the pubs of, uh, of, Bob's, of Bosworth, uh, I, it could not do as much uh, for the economy uh, uh, of Bosworth as what we're already uh, doing with the £56 million welcome back fund, uh, probably even more welcome than my presence in, uh, in Bosworth, uh, I, venture, I venture to suggest, uh, that you're hotly contested perhaps, uh, and, uh, and the, the, we've extended the cut in VAT for tourism and hospitality uh, to 5% right the way through uh, till the end of September. To Lillian Greenwood. Lillian. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Isn't the truth behind all of this the sleaze, the scandals, the jobs for your mates, the cash for curtains that the Prime Minister thinks that rules, laws, and decency 
are for other people. The sort of people who shop at John Lewis or Ikea or Argos, who don't have wealthy donors to fund their lifestyle, not for people like him and his ministers. Prime Minister. And Mr Speaker, I think what people think is that the Labour Party are losing all the arguments uh, across British politics. They've got nothing to say. Uh, they've got no plan uh, for our future, and no vision for our country. They see a Conservative government that is getting on with uniting and levelling up with the most ambitious agenda any government has had for generations. And I think that's what they're listening to. Let's go to Ben Bradley. Ben. I mean, it's the next week residents here in Nottinghamshire will go out to vote for the first time since that incredibly successful 2019 election, where they elected a full slate of conservative MPs across every constituency in this county. Despite that success, many areas like Mansfield and much of the new blue wall across the Midlands and North will still have mainly Labour councillors at a local level. Does my right honourable friend have a message for Nottinghamshire voters? You have the opportunity next week to elect a conservative local team that can work with our MPs to deliver for Nottinghamshire. I, I want to, yes, I do, and I want to thank him for all the wonderful work that he does uh, for his constituency. My message uh, would be yes, I hope that uh, people of uh, Nottinghamshire will uh, get out and vote Conservative because it's we who share your priorities on crime, on the NHS, on investment in infrastructure, and on levelling up across our country. So I hope you will vote Conservative on May the 6th. Right, let us go to Rachel Hopkins. Rachel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When was the Prime Minister and his Chief of Staff first made aware of the plan for a European Super League? I, I first was made aware of the plan for a European Super League on, I think, the Sunday night, and uh, we acted decisively using, using the, the arsenal of legislative freedoms that we now have, thanks to leaving the European Union, which he opposed. Uh, of course, we reacted decisively uh, to make clear that the UK, that the UK government, the UK government took a dim view, took a dim view of this matter, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the same goes for my chief of staff. Siobhan Bell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My constituency of Stroud recently won the best place to live, and there is much to visit there, including a historic lamp standard that was erected to celebrate Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. And next year, our own Queen will mark her succession to the throne of 70 years. Uh, and I would ask the Prime Minister, will he join me in supporting the gift being proposed by Parliament to mark Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I want to thank my honourable friend for uh, a, a wonderful uh, uh, proposal and I would certainly encourage all colleagues uh, to support and to contribute to her project. We're now going to go back to Andrea Jenkins. Andrea. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Next week we will have up our first mayor of West Yorkshire. Now, does the Prime Minister agree with me that for far too long Labour have taken our northern heartlands for granted? On Thursday, the 6th of May, we'll have the opportunity to elect patriotic, hard-working northerners like Matt Robinson, Ben Houchin and Jill Mortimer in Hartlepool. They will be strong voices and champions for infrastructure and housing and jobs. We must seize this chance to build back better after the pandemic and that only the Conservatives will deliver on this. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I, I, they don't like that sort of thing, do they? They, they, don't, they don't like focusing. They don't like focusing on the issues that actually matter to the to the British people uh, and, and the people of, of West Yorkshire. I thank my honourable friend. She's absolutely right. I hope they will go, the people on, on May the sixth will go, get out and vote for a party that believes in supporting our NHS, that believes in fighting crime, not being soft on crime, and uh, that will bring jobs and regeneration across the entire country. And I hope that they will vote Conservative on May the sixth. Order, I'm now suspending the House for three minutes to enable the necessary arrangements for the next business.
We now come to the urgent question. I call Lisa Nandy, the show secretary, for the urgent question. To ask the Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Affairs if he will make a statement on the support the Government is providing to the Indian Government. Adam. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The heartbreaking scenes in India in recent days have shocked us all. The pandemic has brought horrific human suffering and we send our solidarity and condolences to the Indian people at this difficult time. As the Prime Minister has said, we stand side by side with India as a friend and partner in the fight against COVID-19. The Foreign Secretary spoke with his counterpart, the Minister for External Affairs, Jai Shankar, on the 26th of April. He emphasised the UK's commitment to provide urgent medical equipment to support our Indian friends at this difficult time. Ministers and officials are in close contact with counterparts in the Indian Government to follow up on that commitment. The Government of India told us that oxygen has been a particular challenge, so we moved quickly to deliver a package of medical equipment to address this need. The first shipment, Mr Speaker, of 200 ventilators and 95 oxygen concentrators arrived in India in the early hours of yesterday and is already being distributed to Indian hospitals. A further 400 oxygen concentrators will follow today and tomorrow. This equipment will boost the oxygen supplies in India's hospitals, which remain under severe pressure. So it's without doubt that support provided by the United Kingdom will save lives. I'm pleased that other countries are also responding to India's needs. The pandemic has shown the importance of international action. No one is safe until everyone is safe. So we'll keep working closely with the Indian government to help them meet the huge challenge they face. And we'll continue to show our solidarity with the Indian people. This response is just a part of the UK's wider international efforts to tackle the pandemic. The United Kingdom has committed up to £1.3 billion of official development assistance funding to address the health, economic and humanitarian impacts of COVID-19. We've been at the forefront of efforts to get vaccines to developing countries. We are one of the largest donors to the COVAX advanced market commitment created to do just that. Our commitment of £548 million will support the distribution of 1.3 billion doses of vaccines to up to 92 low and middle income countries. This includes India. Despite the urgency of the current situation in India, this remains an important year in the UK-India relationship. India is a key partner for the UK and the Prime Minister had planned to visit India this week. Uh, regretfully, he had to postpone due to the COVID-19 outbreak and he now has plans to speak to Prime Minister Modi via video link in the coming period to take forward key deliverables across trade, defence, climate change, health and migration. We also look forward to the Prime Minister meeting Prime Minister Modi at the UK-hosted G7 summit in June and to welcoming India's guest participation in the G7 Foreign and Development Ministerial meeting next week. Subject to the COVID-19 situation, situation in India, there may also be an opportunity for the Prime Minister to visit in person later in the year. Mr Speaker, we stand with the Indian people in this time of need. Taking our lead from what the Indian government advises is most useful. We face this pandemic together and the UK will continue to support global efforts to overcome the grave challenges that we all face today. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The domestic tragedy engulfing India is now of such a scale that it constitutes a global emergency. India is now afflicted with at least 40% of all new cases in the world. More than 2 million have been confirmed in the last week alone, and the peak of this crisis may yet be weeks away. This surely ought to be a priority for the Foreign Secretary, who I would have expected to have made a statement to this House as the scale of the crisis became clear over the last 10 days. For more than a million Britons, with loved ones in India, this is a moment of fear and anxiety. The ties between our countries are woven into the fabric of this nation, something that through my own heritage I am personally and acutely aware of. Many Britons of Indian origin will have gone to work today in our NHS, in our 
care homes, helping to carry us through this crisis while desperately worried about loved ones in India. We can and must do more. So can I hear from the Minister today a clear plan to ramp up the delivery of vital equipment? I welcome the 600 pieces of equipment that we have shipped so far, but he will know through his discussions, as I do, that India is still badly short of oxygen, cylinders, concentrators, ventilators and therapeutic drugs, especially remdesivir. He must coordinate with our global partners. I spoke to the EU ambassador this morning to discuss how we can avoid duplication and get help quickly to where it is most needed. Has the UK been part of discussions at the UN and with the World Health Organisation? He needs a plan for increasing the production and manufacturing capacity for vaccines and to overcome barriers to expanding supply. And I was surprised, Mr Speaker, not to hear a commitment to make good on the Health Secretary's promise to throw open our unique expertise to the world. We are world leaders in genomic sequencing and epidemiology, tracking mutations and variants would be a major contribution, not just to India, but to the world. Mr Speaker, it's now almost a year to the day when the UK, steeped in our own crisis, woefully unprepared for the pandemic, was forced to ask the world for help. It was India who stepped forward and approved the export of three million packets of paracetamol in an act of solidarity and of friendship. There are millions of people in India around the world and here in the UK for whom this is really a test of the bond between our two nations. I heard what he said. I thank him for his warm words, but words are not enough. Now is the time to step forward with a real plan of action to tackle this domestic tragedy and this global emergency. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady uh, for her questions. I can, um, if I could just say to the Honourable Lady, the Foreign Secretary, uh, may very well have answered this uh, question today, but he is in Geneva speaking to the UN, so he's, in, um, he's out of the country. Um, what I would say, and, and she makes some good points, particularly over um, the cooperation we've seen from the Indian people, the Indian government, specifically around um, drugs last year, uh, we, we're very thankful for the support we had in that regard. Um, but what I, what I would say, uh, she references words, not deeds. I think what you've seen over the weekend is deeds, not words. We were the first, first country to deliver support to the Indian people. Um, in fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, well, it is absolutely the case. We'd be described by the BBC, no less. The UK has been commended for the speed of its initial package. They described it as the first international shipment aimed at stemming a devastating COVID-19 surge. I'm not entirely sure uh, how much quicker we could have been. We've been working on this late last week, over the weekend. I'd like to thank our staff across our networks and in the uh, Department of Health for all the work that they've done in putting together this package. Um, so instead of talking, we were shipping and we were delivering these uh, vital pieces of equipment. Uh, there. And there is more uh, to come, Mr. Speaker, in terms of equipment and support. And we will continue, we are continuing to speak with um, the Indian uh, government on what they actually require and, and we will respond to what their requirements are um, in, in very short order. Let's go to the Chair of the Select Committee, Tom Tugendhat. Tom. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I had the great privilege yesterday of speaking to my Indian opposite number and he expressed great gratitude for the UK's contribution uh, to support the Indian people and I must say I was very pleased that he said so. However, India is not the only country with which we have a living bridge and a common uh, feeling. We need to make sure that we are prepared to support other countries in the Commonwealth, and not just for their own benefit, but actually for ours. Could the Minister assure me that we are ready, that we have the ODA budget available, and that we are prepared to act should such a pool of infection arise in any other country, particularly one with which we share such a close link? Minister. I thank uh, my honourable friend, the Chairman of the Select Committee, for that question. Of course, we are, we are speaking with our international partners on a regular basis. We, this is a situation where uh, no one is safe until everybody is safe. We are working collaboratively. Um, I mean, a good example of that is on the vaccines. Yeah, we are one of the biggest contributors uh, to the vaccine programme, the COVAX programme, that's been set up uh, particularly to support uh, countries in this regard. Um, we will 
continue to do whatever we need to do to support our international partners. What we had to do because of the pressing uh, emergency in India, which is one of our closest um, allies, is, is react quickly, um, get the equipment into the planes and on the ground, and that's exactly what we, we have done. Right. Let us go to SNP spokesperson Chris Law. Chris. Mr. Speaker, the scenes we have all seen emerging from India are truly tragic, and our hearts go out to all those who are suffering. There is nothing more tragic than seeing people dying on pavements outside already overstretched and under-resourced hospitals full of COVID patients and dead loved ones being lined up for cremation. Sadly, we must recognise that the scenes in India will not be the last of the devastation of COVID that we see, and the UK must step up its efforts, not just in India, but across the world. It is welcome that the UK has been able to offer some support to India, but what assistance has been provided on vaccines to prevent further COVID waves across the country? Furthermore, will the UK government support a waiver to overcome intellectual property barriers so that developing countries have much needed access to vaccines and we do not see what is happening in India replicated elsewhere? And finally, Mr Speaker, given the need for a fully resourced global vaccine rollout, will the government finally listen to the experts and retreat from the proposed cut to the UK's life-saving aid at this critical time. Minister. Thank you, and thank the Honourable Gentleman uh, for his question. I mean, it's clear we've been at the forefront, um, Mr Speaker, of efforts to get vaccines to developing countries. I, I can't think of many countries that have done more. Um, I mentioned previously the advanced market commitment by COVAX. Uh, this was created to deliver uh, exactly that. We will be supporting the distribution of 1.3 billion doses of vaccines um, up to up to 92 low and middle income countries. This, this does include India um, and others. Um, we will um, obviously need to complete our own uh, rollouts and we will be looking uh, to what we do with any particular, if there are any surplus doses available, we will keep that under constant review. But I'm proud of uh, our commitments, Mr Speaker, the £548 million uh, and leading the international funding conference last year on vaccines to help protect those who need our assistance. Let's go to Debbie Abrahams. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As in the UK, the impact of COVID in India is a human tragedy. I heard from a family friend in Delhi, and he says people are terrified, frantically looking for beds and oxygen, disgraceful profiteering, ramping up prices, making support unaffordable to the poor. As we've heard, with nearly half of all global COVID cases now in India, and nowhere in the world safe until we're all safe, it was absolutely right that the UK has provided ventilators and oxygen. But there are also issues with vaccination logistics and therapeutic supplies. But can I ask the Foreign Minister what he knows about how Kashmiris are, uh, in Indian administered Kashmir affairing, given that there has been no opportunity for an independent visit by parliamentarians or journalists to the region since the revocation of Articles 370 and 35A nearly two years ago? Minister. Um, I thank the Honourable Lady for a, a question. I'm not the Minister responsible for that particular region, but I know we have regular dialogue sorry for that particular those particular countries, but we have regular dialogue. Um, the, um, my uh, honourable friend, the um, Lord Ahmad, who is the minister responsible for that region, I know uh, speaks uh, on a regular basis with Pakistan, with, with Indian representatives, and I'm very happy uh, to, to ask him to give the honourable lady an update. Let's go to Caroline Noakes. Caroline. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many of us have constituents deeply worried about loved ones in India. Please, can my honourable friend, reassure them that the Foreign Secretary will continue to engage with the Indian government about the practical help that is needed and how we can provide it. Minister. My honourable friend is absolutely right. Um, uh, my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, has spoken directly uh, in the last few days with um, Foreign Minister uh, Jai Shankar on exactly this. We're responding on, um, to the Indian government's request. We are listening to what they're telling us they want. Uh, we're responding. We were the first country to respond and get wheels on the ground and deliver equipment. This is a, a, um, a, a huge emergency uh, 
um, that's affecting India. We have responded. We'll continue to speak with the Indian government and see what further assistance we can deliver them. Scott Benton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the exceptional budgetary challenges facing the Treasury, the overwhelming majority of my constituents support the decision to temporarily reduce the foreign aid budget. Of course, we will still be spending more money than nearly every other nation on earth on international aid, allowing us to support nations in their hour of need. Nine airline containers full of life-saving equipment have already been shipped out to India, but can my right hon. Friend confirm that he will continue to engage with the Indian Government to provide any further assistance as required? Minister. I thank my hon. Friend, the member for Blackpool South. He's right to point this out, uh, Mr Speaker, the support uh, that we've already delivered to our Indian friends. Our teams have been working round the clock uh, and, and over the weekend to ensure that that first shipment, 200 ventilators, 95 oxygen concentrators, arrived in India uh, yesterday morning. And we, as I said before, we were the first um, to deliver support there. Um, and given the rapidly changing situation on the ground, we're working closely with our counterparts uh, to ensure that we're coordinated uh, and we're in close contact with the Indian government over anything else that they need. Let's go to Leila Moran. Leila. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What is happening in India is an absolute tragedy, uh, but it's also a stark warning that this virus thrives when we relax. After all, many in India thought that they had beaten this virus. And every time a surge happens, the virus mutates faster, and with every mutation, our collective fight goes back a step. There is only one way to beat this virus, and that is to work together in lockstep across the global community to keep cases low, minimize the risk of new variants, and vaccinate. So will the minister now commit to both increasing the money the UK gives to COVAX, much that that is, we need to do more, but to also start sharing vaccine doses through COVAX now, today? I thank um, the honourable lady for a question. What we are doing, and she's right to ask um, about uh, vaccine doses, but right now we're moving through the UK prioritisation list. That's what I think... Uh, the country would expect us to do uh, for our domestic rollout, and we don't currently have surplus doses, but we keep it under constant review. Of course, um, I recognise that no one is safe until we're all safe with this pandemic, but that's why I'm proud um, that the United Kingdom, despite the challenging financial uh, pressures that this pandemic has brought us, we've donated over half a billion pounds to COVAX. We've led the international um, vaccine funding conference last year, encouraging in every, in every conversation that I as a foreign minister and my colleagues have, we're encouraging uh, our counterparts around the globe to, to do the same and to contribute to COVAX. Let's go to Gagan Mahindra. Gagan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As someone that has family in India, it breaks my heart to see what is happening there. Some of the most worrying stories coming out of India have been reports of a lack of available oxygen for patients in need. Can my right honourable friend confirm that a key portion of the equipment that our government is delivering is made up of the oxygen uh, concentrators and ventilators that are so desperately needed? Well, my honourable friend, the member for South West Hertfordshire, uh, speaks uh, from the heart in this. I mean, obviously, um, as we've, uh, I've already said, I want to thank uh, the teams and the FCDO uh, around the globe for working on this. We've been the first to respond. We are providing the uh, life-saving equi medical equipment my honourable friend refers to. This includes 495 oxygen concentrators and 200 uh, ventilators. So this is equipment that's based on the most acute need, which has been communicated to us by the Indian government and it simply, um, and I understand why people are so passionate about this, it si this simply will be uh, helping save the lives of the most vulnerable in India. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given the population of India is 1.3 billion and the country is currently recording more than 320,000 new COVID infections every day. Does the Minister agree with a senior Indian health official who described the support that has been received so far as a drop in the ocean? Yeah. Minister? Um, 
Well, what I can tell the Honourable Lady is we've been first out of the blocks. We've provided uh, from surplus stocks the ventilators, the oxygen concentrators. Of course, it's a huge country, and that's why we're continuing to liaise with uh, the Indian Government to see what further we can do. We are going to be doing uh, more in terms of equipment, but we've responded quicker than anybody else. We've got planes uh, on the ground delivering equipment. There's more planes out there going out there today and tomorrow with more equipment, and we will continue to work with the Indian government, listen to their requests, and respond. Global Cup. Thank you, Speaker. Gracious as ever. Our special relationship with India is a bond of kinship and affinity rooted in the living bridge that is the Indian diaspora. As we now seek a transformative post Brexit UK India relationship, it is only right the government has taken the initial steps to assist India at this unprecedented time. It has been heartening to see a billion shoulders to the wheel, be it the Oxygen Express run by the railways or the Indian Air Force flying back the empty oxygen tanks for Indian industry to refill, which has risen to the desperate need. France and Germany have managed to rapidly assist India significantly with the supply of cryogenic oxygen tanks, which can store and transport a much bigger quantity of liquid oxygen. Can my honourable friend say what steps our government has taken, or is taking perhaps, to assist similarly befitting our vision for the UK-India relationship we seek to build? Minister. I thank uh, my honourable friend, the member for Lincoln, for, for that uh, point. Um, I'm, I'm not particularly aware of the arrangement that France and Germany, whether that's a commercial arrangement that the Indian government has entered into, but it'd be certainly something we can um, look into. We've been working incredibly uh, closely with our technical experts in the Department of Health on how to respond to the most urgent needs, um, while ensuring that the equipment sent can be used and will make a difference. Um, donating oxygen cylinders, as I know some people have called for, has been rejected uh, as compatibility issues would prevent them from being refilled within India. So what we're doing is we're taking the lead from the Indian government uh, on what their most urgent priorities are uh, so that we can ensure that whatever support we provide matches their requests. Let's go to Dr. Philippa Whitford. Philippa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Minister keeps repeating that no one is safe until everyone is safe. But the reality is that 80 per cent of all COVID vaccines have been delivered in just 10 wealthy countries, and COVAX is struggling to obtain vaccines. Unless there is greater international solidarity, other healthcare systems like India's will collapse, and vaccine-resistant variants will inevitably threaten those who live here. Does the Minister not accept that the UK needs to play its part by lifting the ban on exporting vaccines, sharing COVID technology with others, and increasing rather than slashing overseas aid? Minister. Well, I would just say to the Honourable Lady, I can't think of many countries that are doing more than the United Kingdom on vaccines for the international country. It was absolutely right that we move through the United Kingdom's vaccine priority uh, list for our, our own rollout. Um, and as I said in answer to a previous question, currently there are no surplus doses. Um, but of course, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we are one of the biggest donors uh, to COVAX. To COVAX will be supporting the distribution of 1.3 billion vaccines uh, across 92 countries that need that support, then this, and this does include India, of course. Sir Christopher Chill. Mr Speaker, may I uh, express strong solidarity with my honourable friend in his words of sympathy with our Indian friends? Can I ask my honourable friend uh, whether it's going to be possible for Indian citizens of, who are living here in the United Kingdom to travel to India, should they so wish, so that they can help their grieving relatives or provide other support? Because it would surely be unreasonable that we should prevent people leaving our country who wish to go and help in these circumstances. Minister. Well, of course, I absolutely um, get the, uh, the point that the Honourable Gentleman has uh, raised. Of course, people will be incredibly worried. I've got, my, I've got friends of my uh, my own, who uh, got Indian, Indian heritage, and they're, uh, they're at their wits' end about what's happening um, in India. In terms of um, travelling to India, you'll be aware that we did add India uh, to our red list. That was to ensure that we protect 
against uh, any variants and against, and against other um, uh, developing variants. The, the situation in India has deteriorated. Um, currently, um, travel um, abroad is uh, against the law, and until that situation changes, then people uh, in the UK need to be mindful of the travel advice. Let's go to Chiamwara. Chi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've spoken to Newcastle's Hindu temple who emphasised just how distressing these desperate scenes from India are for those with friends and family living there, and indeed for all of us. We have known of concerns for some time now. That's why the Prime Minister cancelled his visit and giving us special links to India. What conversations has he had with counterparts in the United States and the European Union to ensure that international assistance is coordinated and effective? Of course, uh, it's a, a very good question from the Honourable Lady. We regularly are in contact with uh, our counterparts, uh, coordinating support. That's why uh, COVAX was set up in the first place on, on vaccines. I understand the EU of also coordinating or in the process of coordinating support for this emergency. Um, I'm not entirely sure when their shipments arrive, but they're, on, they're certainly on the case, as is the United States. But rest assured, we do, uh, we do speak to our uh, international partners when an emergency like this flares up. David Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think everyone in the country has been distressed by the images of the reports they've seen in India, and I welcome my honourable friend's statement about the equipment we've provided and the speed, it, the speed at which we've done so. Obviously, India is a vastly different size to the UK, but, but if it's wanted, will we also provide logistical advice from the NHS, the Army, our scientists, about the things they've learned of how you best control the spread of this virus and get vaccinations to people as quickly as possible? Minister. Of course, we stand ready to, the Honourable uh, Member for, for Wantage raises a very good point, we stand ready to su provide support in whichever uh, form it comes uh, with the, and that's why we're talking to the Indian Government, asking them what support they require. Um, we need to do that so that we can best match uh, and understand what they require and uh, what we supply uh, are in lockstep. Uh, and of course, we're, given the situation, now the pandemic is, is spreading, we're working um, closely with the Indian uh, counterparts to ensure coordination also with other countries so that we support uh, those with the most urgent need. Let's go to Khalid Mahmoud. Khalid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I commend the support that the government is providing promptly to the uh, Indian people during this devastating COVID surge, and my thoughts and prayer are all those affected uh, by this uh, surge. Uh, is it not realistically, in order to tackle this issue, is to start providing licenses for those countries, particularly in the subcontinent where India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, you talk about almost 2 billion people that could be dealt with by actually giving them the vaccines that they can produce themselves and therefore better look after themselves and help reduce the effect of COVID very quickly. And further, will you look at the supporting the people of Kashmir who have been under lockdown because of India for the last 18 months, that they receive their fair proportion of the aid and the vaccines that we're supporting them with. Minister. Well, um, the Honourable Gentleman makes a, a, a very good point. It, but it, of course, it is for we are providing support to the Indian government. It is for the Indian government to decide, not for us to dictate where that support goes or how it's um, rolled out. And of course, India is one of the largest um, manufacturers of vaccine, as the uh, Honourable Gentleman will know. And of course, he will know that uh, those supplies are under pressure, like they are, um, you know, with all with all manufacturers. But we will continue. Uh, liaising with uh, the Indian government, find out uh, what it is they require, uh, and if we can match their demands, uh, we will supply it. Let's go to Bob Blackman. Bob. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I congratulate my honourable friend and the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office for their offer of help and provision that has been made to the Indian government. He will know that at a time of humanitarian crisis, the people of this country are incredibly generous. The Indian diaspora, in particular, are conducting fundraising events via temples and other uh, religious places 
across the country this weekend, um, including the world-famous Neesden Temple that is doing a static bike-sponsored bike ride for 7,600 kilometres, the distance between London and New Delhi. What advice is being given to those religious organisations who are raising money to make sure the money gets to the right place at the right time to assist in alleviating the suffering going on in India? Well, there are many, many champions uh, of constituents of Indian heritage in this House, uh, none more so than my honourable friend, uh, the member for Harrow East. There are some, I've been made aware of some incredible fundraising efforts uh, uh, across the country where there are large uh, Indian diaspora people raising money um, uh, through various means, and, it, and it's really heartwarming to see. It's absolutely the case uh, that that needs to be delivered in the most efficient way. Um, I will find through what mechanism um, I'll find out through what mechanism that advice is being filtered down to those communities. He raises a brilliant point, as ever, uh, and I'll make sure that by the end of today he's able to have some information to take to his communities uh, to ensure they're doing the right thing. I'm sure everybody is doing the right thing, it's just to make sure it's delivered uh, in the correct way. Stephen Bob. Mr Speaker, only last week I stood here and questioned this Tory government's obscene betrayal of those in need by cutting the foreign aid budget. This week we have perhaps seen the direct consequences of such decisions. And I'm sure, along with every member, they agree with me that the scenes from India are nothing short of devastating. And we cannot stand idly by while oxygen becomes a premium and not an easily obtainable necessity. So given the severity of the situation, will the Minister now go on record to say that the UK Government will undertake any and every possible measure of support to India and her people, including the potential distribution of vaccines when we are in a position to do so? Minister. Oh, I agree with the Honourable Gentleman's sentiments, apart from his first sentence, uh, which I know is a, you know, a, a mild uh, dig. Uh, however, we will continue to uh, support India. We were the first country to do so. When this crisis um, flared up, we weren't talking about it. We were actually getting on with it and doing it, delivering uh, ventilators and, and oxygen concentrators. There are more in the air now that are going to land uh, today and tomorrow. So we, we are continuing to do that work. And as I said, in terms of vaccines, um, it would be great if you could point to me who's doing more in terms of putting more money into uh, COVAX. That's going to help 1.3 billion people. Um, the priority, obviously, is the domestic rollout here for the vaccines that we've got. And once we have a uh, clear idea of surplus, then we will be in a position to support other countries. Let's go to Jen Stevenson. Jane. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So many of my fellow Wolfgrunians have friends, family and other loved ones in India. And I want to thank the government for the swift response to this heartbreaking situation. Could my honourable friend tell me what discussions he's having with our international partners so that we can encourage them to send similar assistance and also ensure that the global effort is as effective as possible? Minister. Indeed, my honourable friend, the member for Wolverhampton uh, North East, makes a very good uh, point. And like all honourable and right honourable members uh, uh, today, they're speaking up passionately uh, for those constituents uh, in their particular areas. The cooperation on an international uh, level is absolutely at the heart of responding to, to this pandemic. It, it's a pandemic that don't, doesn't recognise borders, obviously, so we've been speaking directly uh, with the Indian government to understand what they need. Um, we're, as I said, we're in, in regular contact with a range of international partners, Mr Speaker, making sure that we support, uh, coordinate and do everything we can to respond to the needs of India at this difficult time. Let's go to Zara Sultana. Zara. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The images from India are horrifying. From people gasping for air and dying in the streets, to hospitals overrun, to seas of blazing makeshift fires. This is a human catastrophe for India, and with a virus that does not respect borders, none of us are safe until we are all safe. Vaccine supply is artificially limited by patents, leading to the global vaccine apartheid. At the World Trade Organization, India and South Africa have proposed a temporary waiver to vaccine people, allowing production to 
banned. Public money funded these taxes. So will the government put public health before the profits of big pharma and support a wave back of the vaccine taken? Minister. Um, Mr Speaker, I think the audio was a bit sort of uh, in and out there, but uh, I think I got the gist of the Honourable Lady's question. We are doing an immense amount. I, I, I've said it several times uh, during my response. We're, we're at the forefront of efforts to ensure that vaccines are getting to the most vulnerable countries, those in developing uh, countries, not only being, um, I think, the second or third largest donor to the COVAX uh, programme. And I would, just, I would just gently remind the Honourable Lady that support is going to assist 1.3 billion people uh, in the uh, low and middle countries uh, across the globe. This, of course, includes India, um, a country where we've seen such, such horrific scenes and our hearts are with them. Marco Lobby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the um, Minister agree that the coronavirus pandemic has demonstrated more than ever before the absolute need for strong and reliable partners, especially in the interconnected world that we all live in. And can he confirm that the Prime Minister will, in fact, be visiting India as soon as the country recovers from this dreadful outbreak? Minister. Indeed, my honourable friend, the member for Dudley North, uh, raises a very good point. We, um, uh, I mean, the irony is the Prime Minister would have been um, in India had it not been for this uh, latest outbreak uh, in India. I know he's going to be speaking to Prime Minister Modi uh, shortly via uh, video link. We want to make sure we continue that cooperation on trade, defence, um, climate change, um, on health as well, which is uh, key, uh, absolutely key. So what we want to do is finalise a 2030 roadmap for India-UK future relations, and this, provide, this will provide a strategic uh, basis for our relationship in the coming years. Um, so we look forward to the Prime Minister uh, meeting Prime Minister Modi uh, as soon as pra practically possible. And there may be an opportunity, depending on how um, the pandemic goes in India, for the Prime Minister to visit in person later this year. Let's go to Navendu Mishra. Navendu. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for Brigham for securing this urgent question. Uh, I have family in India and, like others, I've found the news from the country quite distressing. Mr. Speaker, does the government believe that people in low- and middle-income countries should have fair and timely access to life-saving COVID vaccines and drugs? If so, is the government willing to reverse its position on opposing the proposal from South Af India and South Africa of a patent waiver in relation to COVID vaccines, medicines and medical equipment at the World Trade Organization? Well, I can tell the Honourable Gentleman we agree uh, that uh, countries, low- and middle-income countries should have equitable access uh, to vaccines. That's why we're putting the over half a billion pounds worth of um, UK taxpayers' money into the COVAX arrangement. And also, 1.3 billion people in those countries are going to um, be assisted by these vaccines that are going to be provided. Sir Edward Lee. Um, over the years, quite a few people, I must admit, even including myself, have questioned aspects of international aid and its efficiency. But I wonder if the Minister will acknowledge that public opinion is changing in the middle of a global pandemic, that international aid isn't just a moral duty, it's well, part of one humanity, and if health systems around the world collapse, then sooner or later it comes back to bite us. So in that respect, can the Minister give a categorical assurance that the recent budget cuts in overseas aid would have not affected in any way our ability to help the world's poorest countries deal with this global pandemic? Minister. Well, my uh, right honourable uh, friend makes a, a very good point, and um, the total amount that FCDO will spend on global health uh, is £1.3 billion. Uh, we'll focus on the, um, this will be focused on the uh, UK's position at the forefront of the international response to COVID. Um, this is not just through, not just through our commitments. Uh, with COVAX and the vaccines I've been talking about, but also with the Gavi Alliance and through the WHO. And basically our investment will be, um, and expertise will be where, on issues where we can make the most difference and achieve maximum uh, impact and value for money. Let's go to Christine Jardine. Christine. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As uh, many honourable members have said, the images from India are both difficult to watch and um, painful for many of, of our constituents with, with family there. And in the light of what is happening, can I ask the Minister whether the $1.3 billion, which he has mentioned, which is going into COVID relief worldwide, how much of that is going to India and whether he will, it will be reviewed um, and possibly in light of what is happening across the world with a, a view to upgrading it? Um, I, think, I think the Honourable Lady was referring to, um, if she could nod whether this is the case, if she was ref, uh, referring to the 1.3 billion doses, vaccine doses. Um, of course, um, we have made our commitment and our financial commitment to COVAX. Um, they will make the decisions on where those, um, where those vaccines will go um, to those 92 low and, and middle, country, middle income countries. That's not a decision the UK takes, but this will be taken uh, strategically uh, by Co COVAX and uh, through the advanced market commitment that they are operating. But we've committed the money, we're paying the money, and we should be proud of the support the United Kingdom uh, is giving in terms of support for international vaccines. Claire Coutinho, Claire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like the 1.5 million other members of the British Indian diaspora, I've been watching with my heart and my mouth, worried for friends and families in India over the last few weeks. Could I just put on record and ask the Minister to join with me my thanks to all the officials, the government ministers and also the private sector businesses which have been involved, not only in our work in COVAX, I think we were the largest donor up till uh, December last year, to our work with AstraZeneca, which is doing crucial work providing vaccines to the world's poorest, and to our deliveries of oxygen as well. Well, can I uh, thank my honourable friend for her thanks? Uh, in this regard, there is an extraordinary uh, amount of work that's been done, not just by government, and she was right to mention the private sector, uh, who have stepped up uh, with this pandemic. It's been an incredible um, international uh, joined up effort under e extreme circumstances. But I, I really do want to uh, commend the work, not just of the FCDO, but across government in ensuring that this initial shipment got out to India um, with great speed. We were the first to uh, deliver equipment and there'll be more to come, but I will certainly ensure uh, that the, um, her thanks are amplified to the relevant parties. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, at a time when India is registering the highest ever recorded cases globally of COVID, we must help the Indian people in their hour of need. I have close family there and many of my South constituents are extremely anxious about their loved ones, terrified of seeing apocalyptic scenes of people dying on the streets for want of oxygen, a collapsing health system and crematoriums and cemeteries being overwhelmed with thousands of people dying every day. So I'm sure the Minister will join me in commending the incredible work of volunteers, including British-based charities. But given our close historical ties, will he ensure that the UK is the number one aid donor, especially of medical expertise and equipment, including ventilators and oxygen concentrators? Well, the Honourable Member uh, for Slough makes a, a very good point, and we are indeed uh, committed to supporting uh, the Government of India. Um, as I've said on a number of occasions here, we were first out of uh, the blocks. I know other international partners are going to be doing exactly the same. Of course, there are close historical ties, there are family ties uh, with India right across this House, and we will ensure we're at the forefront of this support. We're, we're doing it. Uh, there is more to come. Um, there will be more um, information um, when we've concluded our current conversations with the Indian government in terms of what we're going to be supplying. But rest assured, he can rest assured, the whole House can rest assured that the United Kingdom government is doing its bit to support the Indian people. Order. I'm now suspending the House for two minutes to enable the necessary arrangements to be made for the next business.
Tim Furren. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I beg to move that leave be given to bring in a bill to establish an independent regulatory body to monitor and enforce the compliance of public bodies with climate and environmental requirements and targets, to make provision for associated sanctions, to require the regulatory body to assess the environmental effects of potential trade agreements, to make provision about environmental standards, including in relation to animal welfare and for connected purposes. I am bringing forward this bill because the UK is currently without meaningful environmental regulation and without any kind of independent environmental regulator. Having now left the EU and having promised four years ago to bring in legislation to provide the UK with its own independent regulator, the Government continues to fail to meet that promise. Unregulated and unpoliced, our standards of biodiversity, air quality and animal welfare it need to be protected or else the government will allow them to be eroded. Politicians of all sides have a habit of saying that British farming is the best in the world. Now that claim happens actually to be true, but I fear this Conservative government does not understand why it is true. And you can only protect British farming if you understand it. I feel compelled to bring forward this bill because this government doesn't seem to understand it, doesn't seem to get it. British farming is the best in the world, mainly for two fundamental reasons, standards and culture. Standards because we have led the development of the world's most ambitious and comprehensive system of agricultural and environmental regulation alongside our partners on the continent. And culture because the unit of farming in Britain is the family farm. And it is this that has underpinned our reputation for unrivalled care and compassion for livestock, for a ratio of humans to animals that actually allows for the welfare of those animals to be a priority. And furthermore, the culture of Britain's family farms is one where they are not just proud to produce our food, but proud to be the stewards of our countryside and of our environment. So we are on the front line of the fight against climate change and on the front line of the fight to restore nature. If we lose our world-class regulation and have no effective regulator, and if we allow family farms to be undercut and go to the wall, then we fatally undermine British farming and all that is good about it. It is not acceptable for the government to promise regulation and a regulator and continuously break that promise, while our farmers are put under increasing pressure and our environment placed at increased risk. That is why, along with my Liberal Democrat and Alliance colleagues, I am pushing this bill. There is an urgent need for safeguards to be put in place. We need a regulator that is well resourced, has comprehensive and strong powers and is completely independent from government so that it can set and enforce regulation without fear or favour and have the strength to actually hold public authorities at all levels to account. We need much more than a body that just points out where the government is failing. We need an office that can force the government to comply, an office that can prosecute, can levy fines and other sanctions to prevent abuse, a watchdog whose bite is as great as its bark. Without powerful independent regulation and, regu and a regulator, we will begin to see more complexities and bureaucracy as food producers seek on the one hand to comply with traditional high quality British standards, but then also having to simultaneously operate with lower production costs as they battle to avoid being undercut by cheap imports. Of course, a huge fear for consumers and farmers alike is that this government will allow lower quality, cheaper imports into the UK as it seeks to do deals with other countries to provide some compensation for the loss of nearby European markets. Countries that do not take care of their animals like we do, that lack animal welfare protections, that do not produce food in ways which reduce carbon emissions or take care of the natural environment. Those countries allow their producers to have lower input costs due to those lower standards. Is it right then that the UK should have to see an increase in such product on our supermarket shelves that have come from inhumane or environmentally irresponsible production methods? Is it right that farmers should be undercut and ruined by these cheaper and morally inferior products? The answers to these questions are absolutely no. And yet the government's continued failure to step back and allow itself to be regulated means that we have no means to ensure that new trade deals do not open the door to food produced in ways that damage the environment, harm animals and put UK farmers out of business. 
There is, of course, a real fear that the government will do such deals, maybe by accident, but quite probably by design. After all, the farming minister wrote to Conservative MPs a few months ago telling them that if we required imports to meet the same animal welfare and environmental standards as British farmers, then it would make it very difficult to secure trade deals. In other words, please don't tie our hands because we can only get these trade deals if you allow us to throw British farmers under the bus. That is why my proposal for a new, powerful and independent regulator is vital to protect British standards and protect British farmers. Without a regulator, we are also allowing the Conservative government to continue their path of inaction on the natural environment. We see a lack of natural flood protection, loss of British biodiversity at an ever-increasing rate, and the tragic premature death of thousands of people every year due to air pollution. In the last five years, this government has been told by multiple court systems that they need to do much more to tackle the toxic levels of air pollution in this country. Their 2017 National Action Plan on Air Pollution was deemed unlawful by the UK High Court, as it was simply not strong enough to enforce change among local authorities. And this year, in a case started before we left the EU, the European Court of Justice found this government to have systematically and persistently breached air pollution limits. Without an independent regulator with the teeth to hold our government to account, they will be even less accountable for their failures to tackle these ecological and human crises. The lack of action from the Conservatives should not be left to the court systems to sort out. It should be dealt with directly by an independent body, just as the government itself has promised to do. Our lack of environmental protection extends beyond air quality and into the quality of nature in the UK. We are already living in the most nature-depleted country on the planet. Only 14% of our waterways are in good condition, and more than 40% of native species are in decline. This is an embarrassment for us all. In the run-up to COP26, where at the moment our likely message to other countries will have to be, do as we say, but not as we do. We cannot set a good example when the government is threatening the livelihoods of farmers across the UK with a lack of regulation on animal welfare and other standards. This is an error the government is compounding by its stubborn and penny-pinching approach to the transition from the basic farm payment scheme to the new environmental land management scheme. The government insists on forcing many family farms to accept a 50% cut in their income with no immediate replacement, a plan that will inevitably put hundreds of family farms out of business. And this matters because without farmers, then we have no partners to deliver natural flood prevention schemes, to enhance biodiversity, carbon sequestration, to maintain the stunning landscapes that underpin the tourism economy in places like the lakes and the dales. This stubborn penny-pinching goes hand-in-hand hand with the government's failure to ensure a powerful, independent regulator. Both of these failures seem certain to contribute to undermining British farming and undermining our natural environment unless we act. Today, I am giving Parliament the opportunity to act. This is a bill that aims to unite town and country in favour of a new deal for our environment that values British farmers and enshrines British values. How can we say that we are proud of our animal welfare standards, our environmental protections, the quality of British farming, if we then are happy to sell them out to the highest bidder with the lowest regulation? We need an independent environmental regulator, as the government has promised, and given that the government has failed to deliver that promise, I stand here today to deliver it for them and for the good of our farmers and our environment. There is no more time to lose. Thank you. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. Oh, as many as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Who will prepare and bring in the bill? Madam Deputy Speaker, Mr Alistair Carmichael, Wendy Chamberlain, Daisy Cooper, Ed Davey, Stephen Farry, Vera Hobhouse, Christine Jardine, Leila Moran, Sarah Olney, Jamie Stone, Manira Wilson and myself. Tim Farron. Environment Regulation Bill. 
Second reading what day? Tomorrow, madam. Tomorrow. Thank you. Order. Pursuant to the Order of the House of 26 April, the House shall now consider a Lord's message relating to the Fire Safety Bill. I call me... Oh. Fire Safety Bill, consideration of Lord's message. I call Minister Christopher Pincher to move the motion to disagree with the Lords in their amendment 4L. Min Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And as I've said on a number of occasions at this dispatch box, I want to express my sincere thanks once again to all right honourable and honourable members for engaging in this important debate. And I'd like to repeat the message given by my noble friend, the Building and Safety Minister, in paying tribute to the fire and rescue services across our country. Because in recent days, we have seen large fires in Greater Manchester and Shropshire, and they've been dealt with in an exemplary and professional manner. And this is a reminder of why we want to get this bill onto the statute book, to help fire and rescue services do their job, to ensure that buildings are properly and thoroughly assessed. Madam Deputy Speaker, all of us in this House and in the other place agree in the strongest terms that residents have the right to be and feel safe in their homes. This Government remains steadfast in its commitment to delivering the Grenfell Tower Inquiry Phase 1 report's recommendations. The Fire Safety Bill is an important first step in our legislative programme delivering these recommendations. And I cannot stress enough, Madam Deputy Speaker, as I have reiterated on a number of occasions throughout the passage of this Bill, the vital importance of this legislation and the ramifications if it fails as a result of outstanding remediation amendments. And that is why I beg to move that this House disagrees with the Lord's Amendment 4L. Without the Fire Safety Bill, legal ambiguity around the Fire Safety Order will continue. Moreover, the updating of fire risk assessments to cover structure external walls and flat entrance doors will be ignored by a number of negligent building owners. And fire and rescue services will lack the legal certainty to support enforcement decisions. That is a matter I know will be in the minds of members today, as it should also be in the minds of members of the other place. Now, a number of members across the House have said to me, well, uh, why not simply redraft the bill? That might be easier to do with other legislation which already has careful cross-referencing to other acts, which already has detailed secondary legislation to revise regulations, but not so this small, nonetheless important bill. Redrafting it, even if the amendments were not defective, so that it carefully navigates the intricate web of contract law and does not fall foul of such acts beloved of members of this House, including many members of the opposition, such as the Human Rights Act, will take considerable time. And we don't have that time. Following our announcement in February, I'm pleased to say that hundreds of thousands of leaseholders will be protected from the cost of replacing unsafe cladding on their homes as part of our five-point plan to end the cladding scandal once and for all, improve saleability of properties and restore confidence in the housing market. The measures, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we announced in February, including our work with RICS to reduce the need for EWS1 forms, our work with developers to put more of their own money on the table, additional to our tax and 
levy plans, our work with lenders to buy into our package of measures to ensure sensible and proportionate value is reascribed to homes valued at zero, will allow hundreds of thousands of homes to be sold, bought or remortgaged once again. And that will provide certainty to residents, to lenders, it will boost the housing market and it will reinstate the value of properties. All the amendments we have received and debated and already disposed of simply will reignite uncertainty in the market and risk lenders once again turning to leaseholders saying, computer says no, we can't value your property. Well, I must say, Madam Deputy Speaker, I find it somewhat ironic that members who are flagging these issues in the context of trying to impede the progress of the bill, because having an up-to-date fire and risk assessment which considers the external wall system of a building should enable an insurer to take an informed and proportionate approach to risk, which considers not only the material and construction of the building, but the way it is managed. But I agree, Madam Deputy Speaker, that leaseholders need stronger avenues for redress. And the Building Safety Bill, which has already gone through pre-legislative scrutiny and which we're looking closely at as a result, will bring forward measures to do this, including making directors as well as companies liable for prosecution. And I agree that industry too must play its part, as I said to my right honourable friend, the member for North Somerset, who is in his place through our high-rise levy and developer tax, we'll make sure that developers with the broadest shoulders pay their way. And I should also, particularly as he's in his place, uh, like to reiterate my comments made to him yesterday about for forfeiture. It is a draconian measure that should only be used as a last resort. And we believe that this matter should be considered as part of our wider programme of leasehold reform, which we've already indicated we will bring forward. I also welcome his suggestion, again made in his speech yesterday, about the case study from Portis Head in his constituency. And as I agreed yesterday, I think that we can make good use of that opportunity for assessing in-depth lessons learned about the system on the ground. So again, I'm grateful to him for his proposals. Madam Deputy Speaker, the safety of leaseholders and residents will be compromised if we do not ensure this bill is placed on the statute book by the end of this session. We won't help leaseholders, nor will we make homes any safer by impeding its passage. With respect to Amendment 4L, this amendment lacks clarity, just like the others. Just like the others, it prohibits all kinds of remediation costs from being passed on to leaseholders. And that means that were the costs to be even minor, as a result of wear and tear, or even where leaseholders themselves are responsible for damage, they would not be expected to pay. Now, I don't believe, and I don't believe this House believes, that that is a proportionate response. And I will, of course, give way to the Father of the House, as I was unable, due to time constraints, to give way to him yesterday. I'm grateful, and I, I know that the Minister knows that this is uh, trying to play the ball and not the person. The question isn't the small amounts, the question is the large amounts. As there are estimates that the cost of remediation may go up to 15 billion, and the government are providing 5 billion, that leaves 10 billion which may fall on the shoulders of leaseholders. And to move from a situation which might, may be ironic to some to ironic for more, the point of the amendments needs to be met by government and needs to be met in good time or else many people will not be able to meet their demands for paying for the cost of remediation. And forfeiture will follow, because that will happen in a shorter time scale than the one that my right honourable right friend was talking about from North Somerset. Minister. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm grateful to my honourable friend, and I 
certainly accept his assurances that he is playing the issue and not the man as he always does. He has, as uh, we have, as he rightly says, uh, brought forward proposals to spend already £5.1 billion pounds of public money on remediating the tallest buildings as directed by the Hackett uh, report and recommendations. We've also said, as a result of our tax on the development industry, which the Chancellor will begin a consultation on imminently, that we will raise a further £2 billion. Pounds. We've also said that we'll introduce a tall buildings levy. Developers themselves are placing more money on the table. Taylor Wimpy has now placed 125 further millions on the table for remediation. Uh, Persimmon, uh, 75 million Bellway. The, the amounts are building up. We've also suggested a very, very uh, advantageous uh, financing scheme for those buildings below 80 metres, which will require or may require some remediation. Because I think, Madam Deputy Speaker, all members would agree that the taxpayer should not be paying for all and every cost associated with the provisions of the Fire Safety Bill. But that is the risk because the scope of the amendments that have been tabled are far too broad to provide a sensible solution. The amendment is also unclear on who should take responsibility for remediation works until a statutory scheme is in place to pay the costs. That would result in all types of remediation being delayed, a really unsatisfactory outcome for leaseholders. Leaseholders also, I don't think, will thank us, Madam Deputy Speaker, for voting through an amendment that will generate litigation, lots of litigation, and that they may need to pay for it. The amendment would prevent the passing on of remediation costs, but it doesn't define what these costs are. That's a recipe for litigation, a recipe for delay. There's a lack of clarity on definition of what is remedial work and what may be attributable to the provisions in this Act or in other Acts or in none. So how would members suggest that we disaggregate between what legislation works are being carried out and what definition we use to differentiate between remediation, maintenance or improvement? It's a recipe for litigation. It's a recipe for delay. In effect, Madam Deputy Speaker, it may not be possible to relieve leaseholders and tenants from all costs for remedial works attributable to the Bill without breaching subsidy control rules, a form of state aid. Further detailed consideration would be needed about that too. Practically speaking, drafting legislation, as many right honourable and honourable members will know, is a complex matter. A matter that cannot be dealt with in the time frame proposed by the amendment and to provide an arbitrary deadline as stated is neither helpful nor practical. Madam Deputy Speaker, there is a common theme uniting these points. The amendments won't work. They won't help leaseholders. They're not detailed enough for a complex and intricate problem of this nature. We have seen the key elements of this amendment time and time again. And this House has voted them down time and time again. Yet time and time again, peers and the opposition, I trust unintentionally, seem set on re-injecting uncertainty into the market which cannot help leaseholders. So I respectfully ask the House to reject this amendment today so we return a further clear and consistent message to the other place. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their Amendment 4L. Shadow Minister Sarah Jones. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, we've, we've had a lengthy speech from the Minister on this occasion, uh, perhaps trying to ensure others have less time to speak. I'm 
grateful that he took the intervention from the father of the house on this occasion when he didn't yesterday, but unfortunately he didn't answer the main point, and therefore we must conclude that the government is content for the £10 billion of additional cost to be shouldered by leaseholders. Madam Deputy Speaker, we find ourselves in a, a, an extraordinary position. We voted on this only yesterday. Uh, and in that debate, every single speaker from the Conservatives, the Labour and the Lib Dem contributors pleaded with the government to support leaseholders. No one spoke in the government's favour. And the government's majority was halved in the vote. At what point, Madam Deputy Speaker, does the Minister question the sense of his approach? At what point does he turn round and think, well, all these people who have spoken are sensible and well-meaning, perhaps they have a point? At what point does he consider he might actually agree with us? Well, I suspect, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the Minister has had those thoughts, and I suspect he even agrees with us. He knows that the Bank of England is worried about a crash directly caused by the crisis. He knows that hundreds of thousands of people are suffering. But he also knows that his Chancellor and his Prime Minister don't care enough to act. They have other priorities to their property and development donors. Fourteen separate companies and individuals with links to construction companies using the potential lethal ACM cladding on buildings have donated nearly £4 million to the Conservatives since 2006. The Prime Minister must have his new curtains. So they turn away from the screams for help for the people hit with extraordinary bills of £40,000, £50,000, £60,000. And the Minister has to bunker down, hold his nose and hold the line. I almost feel sorry for him. Can I just touch briefly, Madam Deputy Speaker, on the arguments put by the Minister yesterday and today for not accepting these amendments? Because the argument that adding these amendments would cause further delay to implementing the Grenfell recommendations does not wash and is frankly insulting to the Grenfell survivors. As the Member for Stevenage read out yesterday, Grenfell United has condemned the use and abuse of tragedy to put the blame on leaseholders. The Government's excuse that amendments to protect leaseholders will delay Grenfell recommendations is, and I quote, deeply upsetting, wrong, and shows they'd rather protect the corporate responsible for paying, the corporates responsible for paying for the mess they created. This argument against delaying the bill was put to us time and again when we were trying to add amendments to implement the Grenfell inquiry recommendations. At report stage, the Minister for Security said that accepting our amendment uh, to implement Grenfell Phase 1 inquiry recommendations would create uncertainty. The policing minister later said it's not helpful, I have to say, for the House to keep returning to this issue. It causes confusion. But after continuously voting against our amendments, Mr Speaker, the Government eventually gave in and did make the concession in the other place. It was possible then, even after months of saying it wasn't, and it's possible now. And the audacity of the Minister to imply that supposed delays from new amendments will mean people will be less safe, as if people aren't already unsafe, living in buildings riddled with fire safety issues. Has the Minister forgotten that hundreds of thousands of people up and down the country are already stuck in unsafe buildings? So I will say this to the Minister again today. If the Government hasn't managed to work out how to pursue the money from those responsible, why don't they do what's right and stop leaseholders from footing the bill now? Labour's amendment would buy the government time. They would protect leaseholders while the government comes up with a longer-term plan. Madam Deputy Speaker, as Lord Kennedy of Southwark said yesterday in the other place, it is unusual to be here again so soon. But this is an unprecedented crisis, and the government should be taking unprecedented measures to sort it out. The government knows hundreds of thousands of people are being forced to fix to pay fire safety issues which are not their fault. The government should pay and then go after the building companies and developers who are responsible. Most MPs agree. 95% of all MPs and 92% of Tory MPs said developers who built the flat should pay to make them safe. We know um, that at some point, and this is the, the tragedy, we know that at some point the government is going to have to act to fix this problem. We know that the government cannot leave leaseholders to foot a £10 billion bill. And yet, yesterday, many Conservative members voted against amendments that protect leaseholders. 
What will they do today, Madam Deputy Speaker? Keep voting against their conscience, against their opinions, against the will of their constituents? Or will they do the right thing and vote to protect leaseholders? Thank you. Thank you. We have a very short time for this debate, so I'm afraid we have to have a time limit of three minutes on that bench speeches. Royston Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, firstly, I would just like to say that I've agreed with pretty much everything that the member for Croydon Central has said in these debates over the last few weeks, but I, I disagree fundamentally with bringing this political trope into it that the reason that the government won't act is because they're all in the pockets of the developers. That doesn't help this debate. It doesn't help us move it forward. And it doesn't help the leaseholders who you just keep putting in their mind there's some sort of conspiracy. So, sadly, I agree with, you almost, uh, with the Honourable uh, Lady for almost everything, but certainly not on that. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, in yesterday's debate, and again repeated just a few moments ago from the dispatch box, the Minister said all of us in this House agree that residents deserve to be safe and to feel safe in their homes. He is correct. We all do agree on that. I think we will agree, at least the Government, from the Prime Minister down, have repeatedly said they agree that leaseholders should not have to pay for historic fire defects. The Minister reminded us that this bill was introduced over a year ago. May I remind the Minister that me and my honourable friend, the member for Stevenage, tabled the McParland Smith Amendment nearly five months ago. He has repeatedly suggested that our amendments are defective. He has done so again today. But in the five months, the Government has done nothing to take our well-intentioned amendment and to incorporate it into the bill. Madam Deputy Speaker, we have less than 48 hours until the end of this parliamentary session. If the Government and Minister agree that innocent leaseholders shouldn't pay, and if they are now concerned that they have run out of time, shouldn't they have attempted a compromise in the last five months since we tabled our amendment? Madam Deputy Speaker, noble lords from the other place have now done the Government's work for them. They have found a mechanism to save the Fire Safety Bill, which we all want, incidentally, and at the same time insert a requirement for the Government to protect leaseholders from the crippling charges for defects that are not of their making. I can't repeat this endlessly enough, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is not of their making. We have repeatedly asked the Government to compromise. They have not done so. This amendment allows them to do so now, even at the 11th hour, and finally secure the future of the bill and to protect those who have been begging the government for help. Madam Deputy Speaker, I will be supporting the Lord's Amendment today, and I hope that the government and my colleagues on these benches too will do so. If they are serious about protecting innocent leaseholders and securing the bill, they will agree to the Lord's amendments or table their own in the other place before the end of the parliamentary session. Madam Deputy Speaker, I think everyone knows it is time to take the compromise. Yeah. Thank you. We now go by video link to Hilary Benn. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister knows that this problem is not going to go away, and whether it's the fire safety bill today or the building safety bill in future, we will keep returning to this. And he knows that because what's been done so far is insufficient. He knows it because, at, as things stand, the length of time it's likely to take to sort this out will be too long for many leaseholders to be able to continue to bear the costs that they're paying at the moment and to contemplate the future costs that hang over them. And they know it because, as the government said right at the beginning of this crisis, and we intend to hold them to that promise, it's not right that leaseholders should be asked to bear the cost of something they weren't responsible for. And I really don't understand the minister's argument. The uncertainty isn't caused by us in voting for the Lord's Amendments. It is the unresolved problem is causing huge uncertainty. And as for his point about drafting complexity, well, give a commitment to go away and draft something and bring it back in the building safety bill, because either the minister's view is it's complex and no one's drafted anything suitable yet, go away and draft it, or it's simply a way of trying to resist the idea that leaseholders shouldn't have to pay. Now, in the meantime, I have a practical suggestion to make. All 
of those involved, including MPs, spend a lot of time going back and forth about practical problems in respect to blocks, difficulties, delays, lack of communication and so forth. I've had to use parliamentary questions to try and find out what's been happening in respect of applications to the Building Safety Fund from particular blocks in my constituency. And I have to say the replies I've received have been distinctly unhelpful. Now, there are a very large range of people involved in this. Leaseholders, of course, freeholders, the fire service, managing agents, building companies, developers, chartered surveyors, local authorities, mortgage lenders, insurance companies, and of course, his department. And I know that ministers and officials meet with individual groups and organisations regularly, but I think there would be great merit in bringing together representatives of all of these groups to establish, you can call it a contact group or an action group, so that he and his officials can sit round a table on a regular basis to share information about what's happening, progress chase, iron out problems, test out ideas, and find answers to the problems for which there is as yet no plan, but which my constituents in Leeds have to live with each and every day, and which weigh so heavily upon them and their lives, and their sense of whether there's a future that they can look forward to, because as things stand at the moment, there isn't one. And I really hope ministers will take up the idea, and I really hope they will finally acknowledge that only a comprehensive plan is going to bring this nightmare to an end. Thank you. Dr Liam Fox. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And again, we all want the same thing. We want the protection of leaseholders, from bills that they can't afford and shouldn't have been given. We want the protection of the taxpayers from a burden that they shouldn't have to carry. And we want the principle of polluter pays so that the developers, the insurers, the builders who are responsible for the problems in the first place are the ones who have to pay for the cost of remediation. All of that has become perfectly clear over the number of debates that we've had on this. I welcome what the, uh, my honourable friend said. Uh, both yesterday and today about establishing a study on the ground, similar in some ways to that which uh, the right wing member for Leeds Central just mentioned, actually able to talk to real people about real bills and why it is that this huge sum of taxpayers' money that's been set aside isn't getting through to the people. What are the rate limiting steps? What are the problems with the bureaucracy? What are the problems with the timescales that have been set that make it impossible for that money to get to the people who actually need it? So I very much welcome that. I hope it will be a short timescale and that the, the Minister will be able to share the lessons learned with all members on this. I also think that today the Minister has, has edged us towards uh, the necessary compromise because if we are willing to make clear that in the Queen's speech that leasehold reform will deal with the issue of forfeiture, it removes one of the biggest fears that there is. But as the Father of the House said, what about the time between that legislation passing and the potential for forfeiture to occur? That does need to be dealt with. But my honourable friend, if I may say, was clearer today than he was yesterday on that, and that is to be hugely welcomed. I've always thought the idea that we couldn't say what's going to be in the Queen's speech sits a bit oddly when we can read what's in the budget for the three days before it actually happens. Uh, I also welcome what uh, my honourable friend today said about the Building Safety Bill and the scope of that bill and the ability to set out a concept of apportionment in that. Again, that is a major element uh, going forward. And I, I hope that if we're able to take these concepts forward in the other place, we might actually get to uh, uh, a solution uh, to this problem, because it seems to me that the building blocks of a solution uh, are there. We all want, uh, as, the, uh, as my honourable friend said, and as all members on all sides of the House have said, certainty. Sent certainty so that lenders can lend, so that property values can stabilise, and that homeowners, who are the very people of this party, my party wants to encourage, can actually sleep soundly in their beds once again, as they have a right to do. Yeah. Tim Farrell. Deputy Speaker, I rise to support the Lord's amendments also. Uh, the amendment is it's simple. It protects leaseholders. It prevents them from being charged, crippling, life-changingly colossal bills to make safe properties that are only unsafe because of the actions of developers and a lack of government regulation. Here we are, the government has played to the final whistle here. It's down by the corner flag, keeping ball, feigning cramp in the hope the final whistle will go and we'll all move on. Can I assure the Minister that I want to be clear that we will, more importantly, 
encourage leaseholders who are anxious and distressed that we will not give up, that we will not troop off the field not to play again once the 90 minutes are up, that we will come back next session and we will fight the corner of those leaseholders who currently face bills they can never ever hope to be able to afford and that are not theirs to pay in the first place. Because this government's stance, as has been mentioned earlier uh, on this issue, sets out starkly whose side they are on. They are on the side of the wealthy developers, some of whom do fund their party. They are on the side of negligent officials who allowed this to happen. They are not on your side if you are working hard to afford a roof above your head. This is a Britain, it would appear, where innocent householders have to repay, pay to remove dangerous cladding while somebody else pays for the Prime Minister's new curtains. Madam Deputy Speaker, we believe in a better Britain where there is justice not crushing undeserved debt. So if we do not win today, then for the sake of leaseholders across this country, we will be back. Thank you. We now go by video link to Bob Blackman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And so here we are again debating the Fire Safety Bill and the Lord's Amendments to it. The key issue here is not whether we enshrine in law the requirements on fire safety, but who actually ends up paying for it to be done. The reality is, as, as has been mentioned by the Father of the House, the £5.1 billion offered by the government thus far will be insufficient to cover the remediation costs and indeed the fire safety costs that are identified not only in tall buildings, but also in lower buildings as well. The key the issue then is that this is going to take some five years for the work to be carried out, and leaseholders are receiving bills now of £50,000 or more in order for the work to be carried out. They can ill afford it. The government is committed to produce the uh, building safety bill, but we know that that will be announced in the Queen's speech. It will probably take 18 months to two years before that's live and operational. Leaseholders do not have that luxury of that time. They're being charged the money right now. We still don't know the details of the forced loan scheme that the government is offering for uh, uh, leaseholders below six storeys. We've been asking for that to, to scrutinise it. So we can see whether it's fit for purpose or whether, whether it will even work. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, I've had the honour and privilege of serving on the Housing Community and Local Government Select Committee for the last 11 years. We are publishing a report on cladding and the other issues tomorrow. Obviously, I'm not allowed to uh, pre-disclose what the details that are contained within it. I think it's fair to say, however, we are critical of the government in the way it's approaching this necessary means. I would urge my honourable friend, the Minister, who is a good friend uh, and I have every respect for him. Let's have some commitments from the front bench in his answer to this debate on what he will do to ensure that leaseholders are prevented from having to bear the unnecessary un and unacceptable costs. Let's have some commitments on when we will see the proposed false loan scheme. Let's have some commitments on when we expect to see the building safety bill brought into operation. And let's see some, some overall commitment to make sure that people who are living in unmortgageable, unsaleable flats are given appropriate comfort. Because frankly, without that, we have to support the Lord's Amendment to ensure that the government comes back with these proposals early in the new session. So let's make sure as we send the message to leaseholders out there, you should not have to pay a penny piece to rectify the problems that are not your fault in the first place. So I shall be supporting the Lord's Amendment once again today. Thank you. We now go to Barry Gardner. This bill has been passing backwards and forwards between the Lords and Commons because the government will not do the right thing and protect leaseholders from the ruinous costs of replacing cladding and remediating internal fire safety defects during construction. By refusing to do so, the government is making liars out of all those successive ministers and indeed a prime minister who have told this house that leaseholders should not pay for building defects for which they were not responsible. 
Today, I want to focus on the impact of EWS1 regulations and the callous way in which another operator, First Port, are treating vulnerable residents in Blackbury Court in my constituency. First Port have written to the 27 leaseholders in Blackbury Court, which is a two-storey block of flats, to advise them that the fire safety work will cost over £20,000. They've not provided any breakdown of costs, nor issued a Section 20 notice, as they're legally obliged to do, for any work costing more than £250 per leaseholder. What is most disturbing, though, is that they've been demanding access into the roof void through the only loft hatch, which is located in the bedroom of my constituent, who is an elderly lady of 94 years of age. First Port would brook no objection to this until I intervened to forestall this intrusion and ask them to create a new access to the roof void from the common parts of the building. But the fact that they had not yet been able to access the void to survey it means they must already have been aware that there is no compartmentation in the roof space. Indeed, I've discovered that Blackberry Court, which was built in 2007, never got a building's completion certificate, despite being covered by the 2005 fire safety regulations. This begs the question of why they had not acted on this fire safety defect before. Some may suspect it's because the properties became unsaleable and devalued unless the work is done because of the EWS1 form now. The government did change the requirements for, the, for a form, but the minister knows the banks and mortgage lenders have not changed their stance, nor have the insurers. Charitably, EWS1 forms are the government's attempt to force a proper assessment of fire safety defects. Less charitably, they appear to be an attempt to outsource the crucial work of assessing dangerous buildings after Grenfell Tower to an unregulated private market. Currently, there is no requirement for a surveyor to hold a minimum qualification, professional registration or certification as to their competence. Nothing to ensure a uniform approach as to how inspectors carry out checks. This means that in some cases, different EWS1 ratings are being given for the same block. According to government statistics, there are around 88,000 residential buildings taller than 11 metres in England, containing 1.2 million leasehold homes. The government has said there are currently just 212 chartered fire engineers across the UK registered with the Institution of Fire Engineers. This means that getting an EWS1 form is now an impossible, and in the meantime, leaseholders are left in economic limbo, unable to sell or move on with their lives, for my constituent at the age of 94, she simply wants to live out her life in peace and safety in the flat she bought over a decade ago. The government refusal to stop... Order, the Honourable... I've given the Honourable Gentleman considerable leeway, but he has far exceeded the time allocated. So we must now go to Sir Robert Neill. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I shall be supporting the Lord's Amendment uh, today with some regret, because I wish the government had moved to resolve this issue uh, since we last debated it yesterday. It's disappointing that they have not done so. And I do that on the basis that I want the fire safety bill to proceed. I want it to be successful. But the truth is, whilst the fundamental elements of the bill are worthy, it nonetheless has at, at present the effect of causing collateral damage to innocent leaseholders flies in the face of undertakings that the government itself has regularly given. And despite the huge sums of money that have already been put in, as is already apparent, that is not enough. And in the meantime, we have to have a scheme which protects leaseholders. And that's the absence of a provision in the bill to do that, which is the problem. If this amendment is not satisfactory to the government, then there is still time for them to produce their own. I very much hoped uh, that uh, the government would have acted upon the proposals in my right honourable friend and member for North Somerset's amendment tabled yesterday. That still offers a way forward. But absent that, at least the current amendment from the Lords gives a means of protection in the interim. At the present time, le leaseholders in blocks like North Point in my constituency have properties which are unmortgageable. They cannot move, they cannot raise any more money on them. They have already expended tens of thousands of pounds in costs relating to waking watch uh, and uh, it greatly, greatly increased insurance claims. That is not satisfactory. Uh, at the present time, uh, we need to have a matter, uh, a provision which bridges the gap 
between us ultimately getting those responsible to pay. None of us who support these amendments want the taxpayer to be picking up a blank cheque. We want those who are responsible, who were at fault, to ultimately pick up the tab. But it will take some time to uh, pin, if you like, the financial responsibility on those people. In the interim, we must have a means of protecting the innocent leaseholders. Uh, that bridging arrangement is something which only the government is able to do. Uh, and I would have hoped uh, that an acceptance of that, together with commitments uh, to move swiftly in uh, legislation in this Queen's Switch, was not an unreasonable thing to do. I must say, having served as a minister myself, I don't buy uh, the proposition that's beyond the resource of government to swiftly produce legislation that remedies the uh, alleged defects that the minister sees in the current amendment uh, and sits the bill in good order. There is still time to do that. And I really beseech the minister to reflect upon this uh, and to come back with the government's own proposals in the other house before the end of this session. Robustness is a virtue, but when it turns into obduracy, it ceases to be a virtue. I don't want the government to get itself into that situation. There's still time, and this amendment buys them time to resolve that satisfaction. I urge the Minister profoundly to listen to this. Stephen Doughty. Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's an honour to follow the Honourable Member for Bromley and Chislehurst, who I agree with the wholeheartedly in what he said, and indeed the comments of my Honourable Friend on the front bench and so many other members across this House. And I also support the Lords in their amendment, not least because of the suffering suffered by my own constituents in Cardiff, South and Path, and so many others across the UK. And the Minister talks about uncertainty, but as so many Honourable Members and Right Honourable Members have pointed out, it's uncertainty being caused by the failure of the Government to engage with very reasonable proposals put forward on all sides of this House to provide certain to the very leaseholders who have been affected. So the arguments that the Minister is making simply do not wash. Our leaseholders have been dealing with this for years. They have been dealing with the anxiety, the stress, the financial pressure, not least during the COVID pandemic over the last year. That has been intolerable for some of them. And I have met constituents who have been crying, have been in terrible state because of the situation that they have been left in. And I simply cannot understand the continued resistance of the government on this, um, not least given the cross-party pressure and support that there is across this House. And I want to thank the Welsh Government for their work in meeting with leaseholders in my own constituency, the Housing Minister Julie James, uh, my colleague, uh, Vaughan Gethin and so many others, the pressure that they've been putting on developers, um, the commitment that they've made to 32 million in the recent budget, um, the 10 million they've already committed, their active programme on leasehold reform, and crucially making clear, as the government here seems unwilling to do, that leaseholders should not have to foot the bill for fixing these fire and building safety defects. Of course, we all want to see the developers pay. We all want to see um, the resources come through for this. But the reality is we have to stand by and say clearly, once and for all, leaseholders should not be the ones paying for the remediation of this. It is not their fault. And I will continue to work closely with my constituency colleague Vaughan Gethin, with our local councillors and a range of residents and leasehold organisations on this issue. We are not going away. And some of the stories of how they have been affected have been told very, very passionately today in BBC Wales about the suffering, the anxiety and the pressures. But I want to, to say, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I have still yet to receive adequate response from the UK Government. They have left the Welsh Government in the dark, Welsh leaseholders in the dark, on the way forward. And there is no need for this unless there is something to hide. Welsh Government officials, as the Minister knows, have worked constructively with his department on the passage of this Bill and are working on a range of issues around the Building Safety Bill. Yet it took the Housing and Community Secretary over a month to respond to the Housing Minister in Wales over the crucial and um, very reasonable questions she was asking and an offer of uh, cooperation. I've raised it with the Secretary of State for Wales, I've raised it with the Minister, I've raised it with others. And yet the letter that came back um, over a month later from the Housing Secretary said he is not able to confirm the details and timing of budgetary allocations to Wales, um, although he says the Barnet formula will, and I quote, apply to that funding in the usual way. But why can't he just give a clear an, un an un unequivocal answer on the money that will be available to Wales and how they will work with Welsh officials over the proposed new tax, over the new building levy, so we can finally provide some assurances to leaseholders in my constituency, but crucially across the whole of this country. Ruth Cadbury. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow uh, my honourable friend from uh, Cardiff South and Penarth and also all of those honourable and right honourable members who have spoken since the Minister sat down. Government ministers, including the Prime Minister, have said in this House and in the other place on many occasions that leaseholders would not have to pay for the fire safety failures of their, not of their making. So why does this government still disagree with the Lord's amendments? The minister said yesterday and just now 
that they don't have that the government doesn't have time to draft appropriate amendments to the bill in the way we seek. Yet the government has had seven months since second reading and five months since third reading, uh, plenty of time to try and sort out this matter. Madam Deputy Speaker, the safety scandal exposed by the Grenfell Tower fire affects up to 1.3 million flats in this country. Current and potential leaseholders, can, current leaseholders cannot sell, potential leaseholders cannot get new mortgages until they can prove the homes are safe. Insurance is impossible to come by. But worse than this, residents of these flats are living with the fear of being trapped in a fire in their home. And leaseholders live with the fear of unaffordable costs being imposed on them for the remediation. Madam Deputy Speaker, the human cost of this is incalculable. Incal in my constituency, alone. The, the Paragon Estate, built by Barclay Homes, about 70 homeowners along with hundreds of assured tenants and students were evacuated with a week's notice and cannot return. A fire raged up the cladding of Sperry House in the middle of Great West Quarter Estate, built by Barrett's Homes. Leaseholders in at least 25 blocks in my constituency, built by volume house developers, face unknown costs. These include waking watch, replacing flammable cladding and wooden balconies, and most expensive of all, addressing the lack of fire breaks or proper compartmentalisation. The Building Safety Fund doesn't even cover the cost of the cladding across the country, let alone any uh, of the other failures uh, in these buildings, and it only provides loans for those sub-18 metre blocks. Nor does the Building Safety Fund support housing associations for the costs of rectifying the safety failures affecting the social rent flats they found themselves responsible for through planning gain. So those associations are having to take the repair costs from the funds meant for building new social rent housing. Madam Deputy Speaker, unamended, this bill means leaseholders will be forced to pay. They shouldn't have to pay. They didn't design or build their flats. They don't own the flats, the building their flat is, is built in. In conclusion, this Parliament, with the support of this Government, could take the burden from leaseholders now. But instead, we're told we have to wait for a different bill whose content is unspecified, as is its timetable. This is unacceptable. Yeah. We now go by video link to Paul Blomfield. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. We've heard a lot recently about the Prime Minister's honesty and integrity. And it's important to our democracy that people can trust the word of their leaders. But this debate highlights it again because, as I reminded the House yesterday, on the 3rd of February, the Prime Minister told us that, quote, no leaseholder should have to pay for the unaffordable costs of fixing safety defects that they did not cause and are no fault of their own. It was a clear statement of policy an unambiguous pledge to those who face ruin as a result of fire defects that are the responsibility of developers. And yet the Prime Minister has consistently whipped his members to oppose amendments to this bill which would honour his pledge. Now, I've listened carefully to the justifications from ministers for opposing the amendments tabled by the Honourable Member for Stevenage and by the Bishop of St Albans, and we heard them again yesterday. The Minister described the amendments uh, as laudable in their intentions, but unworkable and an inappropriate means to resolve a problem as highly complex as this. And his ministerial colleague in the other place, the Minister for Building Safety, said it was quote, the government's view that the bill is not the right legislation in which to deal with the remediation costs. So not the right amendment and not the right legislation. I thought the government should embrace this new amendment because it gives them the opportunity to draft their own pro proposals in separate legislation to one of the Prime Minister's promise to leaseholders. But the Minister claimed today that it will take time. The Honourable Member for Southampton Itchen rightly pointed out they've had time. Five months since his amendment, three months since the Prime Minister's promise. If the Minister genuinely felt the objectives were laudable, he has had the time to come up with his own proposals. Those in the Metis Building, Wicker Riverside, Daisy Spring Works and others across my constituency deserve nothing less because they face bills up to £50,000 each. Fix the mistakes of others. Unlike the Prime Minister, they don't have access to private donors. They face bankruptcy and ruin. 
trapped in homes that are unsafe and unsaleable, facing unbearable pressure and unimaginable mental strain. Madam Deputy Speaker, we have to recognise our responsibility. The leaseholders have not just been let down by the developers, but by a flawed system of building inspections. They are, as I know ministers recognise, the victims of comprehensive regulatory failure. The government has to step in, urgently fix the faults, and then Order. recover from Order. those responsible. Order. Again, I have allowed considerable leeway, but the honourable gentleman, I, I sort of don't understand. Uh, when people are speaking from home, can they not see the, uh, the, the time limit? I think that might well be the case, and perhaps someone would, would send a message back, because here in the chamber, we can see the time limit, and I hope the Honourable Gentleman will appreciate that I have allowed him to exceed it. I had also put on a tight time limit because I had anticipated some vigorous debate and interventions. There hasn't been a single intervention which leaves plenty of time for the Minister to answer the debate. Minister Christopher Pincher. Well, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, for that opportunity that uh, you have provided to me. I'm sorry that I unfortunately have interposed on the time that the Honourable Member for uh, Sheffield Central might otherwise have supposed to be his own. But he was making um, a careful and passionate uh, speech, as have the other nine Right Honourable and Honourable Members who have spoken from the back benches today. I'm grateful for their insight and for their considered contributions. And I want to remind them, um, both houses, that this government understands the aims which underpin the objectives which have been sent to us over the last several weeks by the House of Lords. If I can address some of the points which were made in the debate, I thought my right honourable friend, the member for North Somerset, made a typically powerful and helpful speech. I agree with him. We want to help people get onto the housing ladder. That is a good conservative principle. We also want to help them to stay on the housing ladder. And that is why we brought forward a package of measures which we believe and which the lending sector tells us will ensure that value, proper and sensible value, can be reascribed to properties so that people can get on with their lives. My honourable friend, the member for Harrow East, again asked a number of questions. He asked when the Building Safety Bill will be brought forward. My noble friend, the the Building Safety Minister is working on the feedback from the pre-legislative scrutiny process. He is also considering the secondary legislation that must sit alongside the primary legislation, and he will bring that bill forward as quickly as maybe in the next session. He also asked about the speed with which we will bring forward our tax on developers. My right honourable friend, the Chancellor, will begin his consultation on that process imminently. My honourable friend, the member for Southampton, Itchen, who has been an honourable and doughty campaigner in his cause over the last several months, asked why it was that the government didn't uh, bring forward uh, proposals uh, earlier. Uh, I have to say to him that the amendments that we received from the Lords, and indeed uh, the amendment which uh, for many months stood in his name, uh, were defective, and that's why we weren't able to accept them. That's why we're not able to accept this particular uh, amendment. The Honourable Lady, the Shadow Minister, made a number of points. I won't dignify the slur that she made on the integrity of the Conservative Party and our commitment to this cause, uh, other than to remind her uh, that any party which is owned lock, stock and barrel by the trades unions, any party that has within it such luminaries as Tony Blair or Lord Mandelson, gentlemen not unknown to the lobbying industry, should be very careful about throwing mud because mud tends to stick on those that throw it. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, one of the points that the Honourable Lady made, and which was also raised in his speech yesterday by my Honourable Friend, the Member for Stevenage, concerned why Grenfell Phase 1 recommendations might be delayed if the Fire Safety Bill does not reach the statute book in this session. I should like to remind him, her, and the Honourable Lady that the Fire Safety Bill puts beyond legal doubt the Fire Safety Order 2005 applies to external walls and flat entrance doors in multi-occupied residential dwellings. That certainty will enable the Secretary of State to make regulations with reduced risk of legal challenge to place duties on the responsible persons regarding external wall structure and flat entrance doors as the inquiry recommended. Without this bill on the statute book, there would be significant legal risk of my right honourable friend making such orders, and that is why it is vital that this bill is placed on the statute book in order for us to use Article 24 of the Fire Safety Order to advance the recommendations of the Grenfell Inquiry. Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to place on record once again that this Government is committed to protecting leaseholders and tenants from the costs of remediation as far as possible. This democratically elected House has voted unequivocally and decisively on four occasions. Shortly, we will be asked to vote for a fifth time. I urge the House to vote to reject these amendments and I urge their Lordships to listen to the will of this democratically elected House. Point of order, Sir Peter Bottomley. Madam Deputy Speaker, would it be within the standing order of this House for the Government, if they chose to, to propose a carryover motion so that the Bill would not be lost as this session comes to an end and that the Government could then improve the amendment which it keeps coming back quite rightly from the House of Lords? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman uh, for his point of order and, as ever, his experience um, shows in the idea that has occurred to him. I don't know whether that idea has occurred to the government um, and I don't know whether, if the idea has occurred to the government, it has decided to pursue it or not. Well, I do know that, actually. If the idea has occurred to the government, then the government has decided not to pursue it. Therefore, it's not a matter for me to decide what ought to happen, uh, nor a matter for the chair. Uh, it is up to the government to decide uh, how it takes this matter past this rather difficult and unusual point where the other place has sent a bill back on several occasions. Uh, I expect that, like me, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman eagerly anticipates the outcome of this division, and then we shall see what will happen next. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their amendment for L. As Mayor is that opinion, say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Division. Clear the lobby.
Order. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their amendment 4L. As mayors of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Tell us for the ayes, David Rutley and James Morris. Tell us for the noes, Colleen Fletcher and Bamble Sharalambo.
doors. Order. The eyes to the right, 322. The nose to the left, 256. The eyes to the right, 322. The nose to the left, 256. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. Um, I will... Take the Honourable Gentleman's point of order once I have appointed the Reasons Committee, if he will forgive me. And before I do appoint the Reasons Committee, uh, for the sake of clarification of the point of order raised just before the division by the Father of the House, uh, the Father of the House will appreciate that I have now had the opportunity to consider more carefully the point that he raised, and I can clarify that a bill cannot, in fact, be effectively carried over after it has been considered by the other place. And I hope that that sets the mind of the Father of the House at rest as to what the government can and cannot properly do at this particular moment. Thank you. Um, Minister, to move that a committee be appointed to draw up reasons. I beg to move that a committee be appointed to draw up a reason to be assigned to the Lords for disagreeing to their amendment 4L. That Christopher Pincher, Tom Perslove, Scott Mann and Chris Elmore be members of the committee. That Christopher Pincher be the chair of the committee. And that three be the quorum of the committee. And that the committee do withdraw immediately. Yeah, 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 yeah. The question is that a committee be appointed to draw up reasons to be assigned to the Lords for disagreeing to their amendment 4L. That Christopher Pincher, Tom Perslove, Scott Mann and Chris Elmore be members of the committee. That Christopher Pincher be the chair of the committee. That three be the quorum of the committee. That the committee do withdraw 
immediately, as many as that opinion say, aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And in order to observe social distancing, the Reasons Committee will not meet in the Reasons Room, but in Committee Room 12. Order. Point of order, Dr Liam Fox. Deputy Speaker, I raise a point of order further to a point raised at Scottish Questions today. The Auditor General in Scotland has suggested that of £9.7 billion allocated by UK taxpayers through the UK Treasury, only £7 billion had been spent on COVID-related measures by the Scottish Government by the end of 2020. This is not discretionary spending that can be diverted into other causes, such as setting money aside for a referendum, but is specifically allocated to ensure that all parts of the UK are equally able to deal with the consequences of the pandemic. Given the nature and origin of this funding, can you give me any guidance as to which committees of the House of Commons would be the most appropriate place to investigate where this money has gone? Well, I thank the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman for his point of order. Um, if the Right Honourable Gentleman were seeking to further the exchanges which took place during Scottish questions, uh, his point would not, strictly speaking, uh, be a point of order for the Chair, but I do appreciate that uh, the Honourable, Right Honourable Gentleman is asking a serious question about a serious matter, and so I can point him in the direction of the Committee of Public Accounts, which is concerned with the regularity of spending, also of the Scottish Affairs Committee, which deals with non-devolved Scottish matters, uh, and also in the direction of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, which is concerned with the operation of the devolution settlement. And it might be that in pursuing the question that the honourable gentleman, right honourable gentleman has raised, he might wish to take the matter up with the chairman of one or other, or indeed all of those three select committees. Thank you. A point of order, the father of the house. I'm, I'm grateful for your clarification of the situation, which was what I suspected it might be. Uh, it's obvious that the House of Commons dealing with business only in front of the House of Commons has the opportunity of a carryover motion and the other place has similar procedures, but not exactly the same. There seems to be uh, no precedent for what happens for a bill which has been in both houses and that may be something which could properly be considered by the speakers of each house or by the procedure committees of each house. Would, would you allow me to say that in this particular case, as carryover motion is not possible, and were the House of Lords to go on sending back helpful amendments and this bill would fail, that if it were represented with the problem of the future burns for leaseholders solved, it could pass both houses within a day? Uh, well, <laughs> the Father of the House raises a most interesting point. And, of course, he is right in saying that uh, if the bill were now to fail, that a similar bill uh, with similar purposes could be brought forward by the government in the next session of Parliament. As to whether it could pass quickly through both or either House is, of course, as ever, a matter for the members of this House and, indeed, of the other place. If members choose to make very short contributions and allow a bill to pass through quickly, and if the government chose to put all stages of the bill uh, in one day before this House and indeed the other place, then the House of Commons as a whole and the government could make those decisions and it's not for me to anticipate what might happen. I thank the Father of the House for his second interesting point of order of the day. Um, I'm now obliged to suspend the House uh, for three minutes to allow uh, the uh, arrangements to be made for the next item of business. Order.
order. We now come to motion number two on capital gains tax. With the leave of the House, I shall invite the House to debate motions numbers two and three together. I call the Minister to move motion two and to speak to both instruments. At the end of the debate, I shall put the question on motion number three formally. Minister Jesse Norman. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that the House considers the double taxation relief Federal Republic of Germany Order 2021 and the double taxation relief Sweden Order 2021. Both uh, orders insert important provisions recommended by the OECD and G20's Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Project, or BEPS, into existing double taxation agreements. For those members who may uh, surprisingly be unfamiliar with the BEPS project, this was an international effort to equip countries with the right domestic and international regulations to tackle tax avoidance. The BEPS provisions ensure that double taxation agreements fulfil their main purpose of facilitating global trade and investment. In addition, the provisions simultaneously limit the opportunity for the agreements to be used for tax evasion or avoidance. Usually, improvements to our bilateral double taxation agreements recommended by the BEPS project are made under a treaty commonly referred to as the multilateral instrument. This makes it possible to modify double taxation agreements in line with BEPS project provisions without the need for bilateral renegotiation. However, the domestic legal systems of both Germany and Sweden uh, mean that it is much simpler for these countries to modify their double taxation agreements through an amending protocol rather than through a multilateral treaty. As a result, the UK Government has agreed with both Germany and Sweden to implement these modifications through the protocols attached to these orders. These changes included introducing minimum standards to prevent avoidance through the abuse of tax treaties and improving the resolution of disputes. The protocols with both Germany and Sweden give effect to the minimum standard on preventing treaty abuse. This is achieved by inserting a general anti-treaty abuse rule known as the principal purpose test into the double taxation agreement. Both protocols also change the preamble of each double taxation agreement, which sets out its overriding purpose in order to clarify that the parties do not intend for the agreement to be used to avoid tax. These orders also make changes to the articles in both double taxation agreements that govern how disputes are avoided and resolved. These amendments ensure that the articles are in line with the minimum standard on improving dispute resolution. However, the Germany Protocol implements a rule to prevent the artificial fragmentation of activities that might result in an overseas business avoiding a taxable presence. Sweden is not in favour of this provision, which is why it is absent from that protocol. Madam Deputy Speaker, these orders make good on the Government's international commitments to tackle tax avoidance and evasion and improve dispute resolution. They strengthen the integrity of the UK's network of double taxation agreements, which plays such an important part in facilitating the cross-border trade and investment that benefits all our nations, and I commend these orders to the House. Thank you. The question, the question is that the draft double taxation relief Federal Republic of Germany Order 2021 be approved. Shadow Minister James Murray. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to respond on behalf of the opposition to this motion concerning these two statutory instruments. These two orders bring into effect arrangements between the United Kingdom and Germany and Sweden respectively, as set out in the bilateral protocols signed earlier this year. We know that both protocols amend existing arrangements between the two relevant governments for the avoidance of double taxation and the prevention of fiscal evasion with respect to taxes on income and capital gains. We will not oppose the government on this motion. The protocols that this motion seeks to bring in would give effect to certain provisions recommended by the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, or BEPS, project to protect tax treaties against avoidance activities. As the Minister will know, we welcome any provisions to combat tax avoidance and evasion. However, 
we have a few important questions and concerns to raise about the way in which these changes are being introduced and their wider context, which I would appreciate the Minister addressing in his response. First, we note that the total parliamentary scrutiny of these changes comprises this current debate, which has three speakers and is unlikely to last more than half an hour. This differs greatly from the standard practice in other countries. For instance, in the United States, tax treaties must be considered by a fully staffed congressional committee. This raises an important question around transparency and accountability, as we find parliamentary scrutiny lacking. Perhaps, however, we should not be surprised by this government seeking to avoid scrutiny. Just last week, the government voted down a Labour amendment to scrutinise the impact of their policies on tax avoidance and evasion. The sense that there is a lack of transparency is compounded by the fact that the explanatory notes for these instruments simply paraphrase the treaty changes in largely technical language and therefore do little to elucidate the matter for a wider audience. Inaccessible explanations are an obstacle to full, open accountability. These explanatory notes explain that the provisions of these protocols will have, and I quote, no or no significant impact on business, charities or voluntary bodies. Could the Minister explain what that implies about the revenue implications of the protocols being enacted? And finally, as this motion relates to international tax avoidance and evasion, I would like to take this opportunity to ask the Minister to further clarify, for the avoidance of any doubt, whether the Chancellor backs plans for a global minimum corporate tax rate, as proposed by the US President. The Financial Secretary may recall I asked him this question during one of the Committee of the Whole House debates on the Finance Bill last week. He said at the time that they welcomed the renewed commitment that the US administration have made in this area. That was not quite a yes to a global minimum corporate tax rate. So I would like to put again to the Minister a very simple question. Does the Chancellor back the plans proposed by the US President? Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Kirsty Blackman. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, this is the first time that I've stood in this House to speak since January 2020. Um, during the past year and a bit, like so many um, of our constituents, I've been battling with the black dog of depression. Um, and I know that so many people have, so I crave your indulgence for a small moment, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, please, if you know somebody who is not being themselves recently, reach out to them, um, ask them if they're okay, let them know it's okay to not be okay, offer them help, but most importantly, let them know that you are there when they're ready to talk or if they're ready to talk. I think it's hugely important that all of our constituents understand that um, they're not battling this alone. There are so many of us. Um, in relation to this uh, 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 draft double taxation relief tr treaty, um, both of them, I, I have a few questions. I'm delighted to see that somebody else has got criticisms from the explanatory notes. Um, this has been something that I've got on my high horse about. And, and don't worry, I can talk for 30 minutes. We could be here for, you know, far exceeding. I won't. And I just think I promise. Um, it, but you know, it is the case that the explanatory notes are um, generally not very good. They don't give us enough information. And the specific issue around significant impact, um, I, I think, is a concern. It is written into the, um, the ministerial code and the rules around explanatory notes what no significant impact means. But it is something that I would consider to be actually a significant impact, if you see what I mean. So I think, the, that, I think that measure needs to be broadened and explanatory notes in general for all bills need to be better um, at explaining and we need to have more impact assessments provided with those bills because we need to know the impact on the public sector, on the private sector, but also on charitable organisations and much wider than just if it meets a certain threshold of quite a significant level of millions. Um, in relation to these orders that have been put forward, we do support, as the SNP, the orders. Um, we do look forward to the UK working more closely with other EU partners as well, including in the future and in independent Scotland. Um, around the issues with tax evasion uh, that may occur as a result, um, the, the UK, even though it's got the, the general, general anti-treaty avoidance rule, still does not have a comprehensive general anti-avoidance rule for taxation. That is something that the SNP have uh, stood on this platform talking about on a huge number of occasions, and it's unfortunate the government have not yet been willing to come forward with that comprehensive regulation, particularly when um, 
HMRC are saying that there is a tax gap in 2018-19 of £35 billion, which is 5.6% of the total tax liabilities. Um, we need to have that rule. And in relation to the um, Shadow Minister's comments on the minimum corporate tax levels in the Biden plan that has been put forward on that, um, it's really important that the UK Government instead of attempting to water down these proposals, stands with them, supports the need for a minimum corporate tax level, and actually for once stands to strengthen international tax law rather than to weaken it. I think the UK Government has not, in many recent years, taken the lead on this. And if we are to be this wonderful independent nation that the Conservatives suggest that we are, it is right that we are taking the lead on tax measures, that we are saying absolutely we support the um, minimum corporate tax levels and that we are backing that to ensure a better and more level playing field internationally. I am sure the whole House will have heard what the Honourable Lady said and she is courageous to give her advice here in the Chamber and it, people would do well to listen to her advice. We're glad to see her back. Jesse Norman. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I thank very much the two honourable members who have spoken uh, in the debate. And if I may, Madam Deputy Speaker, may I start by associating myself very much with the remarks you made to the honourable lady for Aberdeen North. Uh, I think it's um, absolutely in order and right for her to bring this very, very important issue. Uh, back to the House, to do so in such a personal way only gives it additional force. I, I doubt there is a member of this House whose own life has not been affected in one way or another, either by the concerns she describes, personal, the black dog, depression, however it may be, or, or their own family or friends. And I, I think the, the, the diversity of opinion in this House is something we all welcome, but so too should be the diversity in our recognition of other people and their feelings and um, suffering. So I very, very much thank her for that. Uh, she, if I may start with the comments she made, um, she raised the question the Honourable Member for Ealing North also raised about uh, explanatory notes. And uh, the, the, both members will have seen that actually this, both of these measures have qu quite full explanatory memoranda associated uh, with them. And, of course, there's always a balance to be struck between the depth and the detail into which an explanatory memorandum goes and the desire not to provide so much detail that it becomes illegible or, or incomprehensible to uh, a normal reader. I think the point is constantly right to be borne in mind that we should be as clear and as explicit as possible on these matters. I think the point is very well made. Um, it's a point that we've pushed very hard, and certainly I and colleagues have pushed very hard with HMRC in the work they do more widely on guidance. Uh, in this case, because these uh, are, um, sit alongside a host of other instruments, including the multilateral instrument, which was debated in this House, uh, and uh, I think it's, it's, it, it's certainly true that there is a degree of scrutiny and awareness, or there could be a degree of scrutiny and awareness uh, associated uh, with it. The Honourable Lady also mentioned the question of a general anti-avoidance rule. I, I'm sure she knows that uh, it, it, it's been an important feature of our approach to double taxation agreements that we have included a principal purpose test in tax treaties, uh, which either through bilateral negotiation or through the multilateral instrument. And that itself is a very important uh, wide anti-abuse measure developed through the BEPS project, which protects treaty against the abuse of its provisions. And uh, uh, you know, we are deploying it uh, widely across double taxation agreements. And it has much of the force of the measure she describes. The member for Honor of Ealing North uh, raised the wider question of scrutiny I think, the, if I may say so, the argument would have more force if there were any other members from the opposition who had chosen to speak in this debate and to exercise that scrutiny, Madam um, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I think that, in general, these matters, for the reasons I've described, are tolerably well understood. We have a multilateral instrument. They follow a common format, uh, but, and opportunity is given to 
uh, members across the House to offer scrutiny, including to the opposition parties, and they can choose to exercise that uh, or not. Uh, in issue duration of revenue, the gentleman raised that. He, he will see that it says in the explanatory notes there are no uh, new tax burdens imposed uh, by this. And in a way, that is as it should be, because the purpose of these measures is to secure and safeguard trade and to prevent abuse. They are not, and of themselves, um, tax revenue raising measures. Uh, if I may also uh, hint that we come to the final point he raised, he asked about the global minimum tax rate uh, and whether I would expand on my remarks in uh, the uh, Committee of the Whole House. And uh, I'm not going to do that because I don't think it's appropriate for ministers to comment on uh, tax policy uh, uh, in, in, as it were, in flight. Uh, we have said we very much welcome the proactive stance that the Biden administration is taking uh, towards this issue. We have been a very strong advocate for these uh, wider measures, the two pillars, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, within the OECD, within the G20, and I know the Chancellor feels very strongly about the importance of our leadership of the G7 as a way of consolidating this progress in tax. Uh, I th I'm just winding up, so if the Honourable Lady will mind, I'm going to finish up. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, we will continue to press forward on this issue. Thank you. The question is that the draft Double Taxation Relief Federal Republic of Germany Order 2021 be approved. As may as that opinion say, aye. aye. On the contrary, no ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to motion number three, Minister to move formally. The question is that the draft Double Taxation Relief Sweden Order 2021 be approved. As may as that opinion say, aye. aye. On the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I will very briefly suspend the House now for two minutes in order that arrangements can be made for the next item of business. Order. Order. We now come to motion number four on insolvency. Minister Paul Scully to move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it's a pleasure to uh, serve under your chairmanship in this as we start on the floor of the, the, the House to discuss this important um, extension. I beg to move that this House approve the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Extension of the Relevant Period Regulations 2021, which were laid before the House on the 24th of March 2021. It is now over a year since the emergence of COVID-19 and the Government has consistently taken the swift action needed to save lives and mitigate damage to the economy. The Government's successful rollout of the vaccine uh, programme and the implementation of the Government's four-step roadmap out of lockdown are both reasons for cautious optimism that will soon enjoy a return to normality. To date, in excess of 33 million people have had a vaccination, and the British public have also risen to the challenge of suppressing the spread of virus by sticking to the rules, getting tested when needed, and following the hands, face, space, and letting fresh air in guidance. But we're not out of the woods yet, and the emergence of new strains of the virus means that this is not the time to become complacent. Social distancing measures introduced, uh, introduced to limit the spread of the virus and help save lives uh, continue to have a, uh, an effect on business. The Government recognises this. Uh, uh, whilst most businesses have been able to reopen, many continue to face uncertainty and financial difficulties. Therefore, an extension to the duration of temporary insolvency measures currently in place and the protection they provide is needed. These regulations extend until 30 June. The suspension on serving statutory demands and a restriction of filing petitions to wind up companies. The small supplier, the small supplier extension, exemption from termination clause provisions and the suspension of wrongful trading liability. In addition, the modifications to the moratorium provisions and the temporary moratorium rules are extended until 30 September 2021. I hope the House will agree that these regulations are necessary, but I assure members that we will keep them under constant review. I commend these regulations to the House. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The question is as on the order paper. Shadow Minister Lucy Powell. Speaker. Well, well, here we are again. Um, the Minister and his officials uh, who have heard me make the same speech numerous times are in for a little treat today because I am going to slightly detour from my usual remarks, um, which do centre a bit around I sort of told you so uh, on extending these provisions. But I do want to uh, touch on some of the uh, wider insolvency framework issues that I think are pertinent to now. Um, but before that, though, I do welcome the government extending the safety net for businesses in distress because of the pandemic. As I said when we supported the emergency legislation last year, we welcome any measures which support businesses who closed to keep us safe. We argued then that the protections in the Act should be extended over a longer period of time. I think this is now the third time, possibly the fourth time, we've come together to extend them, and on each occasion, unfortunately, causing real uncertainty and worry for businesses in the run-up to each previous expiry date. Uh, as the economy reopens and restrictions ease, it is right that these measures are kept under review. Through the crisis, we have called on ministers to ensure that economic support matches the public health measures in place. And whilst we have seen welcome support for workers through the furlough, there have still been gaps in government support that they have repeatedly failed to address. There is a cash crisis facing firms. For those with high ongoing overheads but still no income coming in, those excluded from all government support, and little or no help for those sectors still closed and likely to be closed or uncertain for some time, like travel, large events and weddings, and the visitor economy. As I have said before, we are very concerned about the levels of debt facing businesses, whether that is through the loans they have taken, the VAT they have deferred, or the rent holiday they have had, but have soon got to start repaying. So these measures in staving off creditors are welcome, but they do just kick the can down the road, and they do little to change the fundamentals facing so, so many firms of large COVID debt and low or no taking while, whilst the fight against COVID continues. The bombshell businesses face remain real, and that's why Labour has argued for a student loan style scheme where COVID debt can be repaid as businesses grow so that we don't see waves of insolvencies. And there's nothing in these provisions today to deal with these fundamentals. Madam Deputy Speaker, turning to the Corporate, and Corporate Governance and Insolvency Act provisions in general, it's clear that some of the issues we warned about are coming home to roost. 
particularly when we look at the impact of Greensill Capital's administration on the Gupta Family Group and Liberty Steel. Government has consistently ducked the need for wider reform of our insolvency laws, particularly in providing greater protection and support for key industries and their workers. We argued for and sought to amend the, amend the legislation to this effect, and it's not too late for the Government to act. It's clear from reports that the goals are circling, and regardless of whatever judgment people have about GFG, the Liberty Steel plants are a critical asset to our economic and national security and employ thousands of highly skilled workers uh, directly and through the supply chain. The company must be given time to refinance, but if this is not successful, then the government must keep every option open and have a plan for all eventualities to save the UK steelmaking capacity and its supply chain. Yet our insolvency laws mean that there is no safe place to refinance or protection of this company's assets until it could be too late. All the while, leaving the company searching for refinancing while trying to retain the confidence, and suppliers, uh, the confidence of suppliers and customers who risk the most should it fail. In the US, they have Chapter 11 to shepherd important industries facing distress. There, the authorities are able to wrap their arms around strategically important companies to allow them time to resolve difficulties, refinance or restructure. The Chapter 11 process, should we have this here, would have created a better context for the refinancing of Liberty Steel without the spotlight and falling confidence. We argued for its inclusion in the Corporate Governance and Insolvency Act, and the, the ministers could have brought forward changes on this today. But Unfortunately, they seem content to let the company fail first, and we know this has a high cost uh, for the suppliers uh, as well. So, but with, even without changes to the insolvency laws, if there is a political will here, there could be a way. Ministers should not be bystanders. They should intervene early, before liquidation, if necessary, and that would mean that workers would not lose their accrued services of benefit, as well as protecting the supply chain. I hope that when the Minister gets to his feet, he will, respect, he will reflect on this wider point about how we can protect nationally important businesses in the future and assure us that his Government will do whatever it takes to save Liberty Steel from insolvency. Andrea Leds. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. First of all, I really want to commend the Government on the UK Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act and for putting in place at such speed both temporary and permanent measures at such a deeply troubling time for businesses. My honourable friend will be pleased as I am and possibly a bit surprised as I am to see that statistics from the Insolvency Service show that the number of registered company insolvencies in March 21 was 20 per cent lower than in the same month in 2020 and 37 per cent lower than in March 2019. I certainly know of many businesses in my own constituency who have survived the pandemic only thanks to the extraordinary measures put in place by Bayes and the Treasury to help them get through. In the call for evidence that's outstanding on the performance of SIGA, it will be interesting to see if feedback from businesses suggest that they needed the temporary measures or the financial support or both and to what extent. And certainly the evidence points to the fact that schemes like bounce back loans, sea bills and furloughing have done a critical job in protecting lives and livelihoods. There may be the need in the future for further flexibility and I would point out to my honourable friend interest on sea bill loans and potentially more support for weddings and events organisations may well be needed in the future to protect them. But I did just want to very briefly mention the bigger picture. My honourable friend will be only too aware that insolvency legislation isn't like the proverbial London bus. You don't get none coming along for years and then lots all at once. And so I do worry that whilst there have been some good permanent changes to the insolvency rules brought in with SIGA, there are nevertheless some areas, particularly of corporate governance, where during my own time in Bayes, I was keen to see some real reform. I do hope, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the audit reform work that is underway and the forthcoming Employment Rights Bill might offer vehicles for wider corporate governance changes. In particular, 
I would be keen to have an update from my honourable friend on what is still being done at Bayes to consider some specific issues, such as the roles and responsibilities of directors, the speed of insolvency evaluations post-fact, and also consideration of the responsibilities of board directors. We've seen some major corporate failures in recent years, including companies such as BHS, Carillion and Thomas Cook, and there have been very legitimate questions asked about the performance of the directors of those businesses, wh whose, whose failure have had such a disastrous impact on lives and livelihoods. There's also the very real question about whether companies should do more through new statutory responsibilities to protect employees' pensions, to ensure diversity of the workforce, and of course, importantly, to address their own carbon footprint. I hope that my honourable friend will be able to reassure me that these issues remain very live within his department, and I would be keen to know specifically if he can point me to forthcoming opportunities to press these matters further. So in concluding, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would encourage all those who have an interest in the whole broader issue of corporate governance to take part in the current call for evidence on insolvency rules. It's a great opportunity for business owners and industry professionals to give their feedback on these two important areas. And I do hope that the imperative of putting in place the excellent temporary measures to help businesses survive during the pandemic don't get in the way of the consideration of the bigger picture of good corporate governance. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the member from South Northamptonshire and actually to pick up on the comments that she made. I think it is incredibly important that we look at the future of corporate governance, that we make sure that the future of audit is, um, uh, and the report is, is looked at very carefully and those decisions are taken to ensure that not just um, not just investors can scrutinise those organisations, but actually so that consumers can scrutinise those organisations and work out whether or not they want to be involved with them on the basis of their annual report, of their audits. And actually, I think we get a better idea of the risk that we may be at um, if those processes are more open and more transparent. So I agree wholeheartedly with the comments you made there. In relation to um, particularly this bill, um, there's an extension to June uh, this year, the end of June this year, for some of the provisions in the bill, and an extension to September for other of the provisions in, in the bill. Um, I'm concerned that we've had so many extensions to this, and that the 30th of June is, is very soon, um, and that the government is going to end up having to come back with another extension as a result. The thing is that we know that even if all of the pathway that has been laid out by the Prime Minister comes to fruition, even if we end up with um, pretty much everything being back to normal in some ways um, by the end of June, which I doubt, by the way, but if we do end up in that position, it is not going to be a five-minute job for businesses to recover. They are not immediately going to be back on their feet. They are not suddenly going to make up the money that they have spent. They are not suddenly going to be able to pay back the loans uh, that they have had to take out over this period. They are you know, they're, they're not even suddenly going to be able to take back all of their employees on a full-time basis if there is going to continue to be social distancing, for example. So I am concerned that there is not enough time there. And If the government is intending to bring back a further extension, uh, then it would be useful, I think, for these organisations to be aware that that extension is likely to come. It, I would have preferred if it had been made already, um, but actually I think an extension to September for all of the measures would have been um, slightly more helpful. Um, the other thing about this is that, uh, you know, although we've spoken about uh, the the, the impact on companies. There is also an impact um, of insolvency on the supply chain, and particularly we have seen self-employed individuals being missed out of the furlough scheme, and they are more likely to be hit by some of these organisations going under uh, than many others as a result of them being part of that supply chain, as a result of their organisations as self-employed individuals supporting these, these businesses. So um, I am concerned that uh, we're, you know, also we're looking at this big picture, which is 
great um, that there is not enough focus on the knock-on impact, particularly on those groups who have already been missed out, those groups who are already being hit particularly hard by the pandemic. So obviously I'm a representative for Aberdeen. We've had a triple whammy of Brexit, of COVID, um, and of the oil prices being reduced in recent times. So that, that doesn't just affect those, those big companies making megabucks profits in, in the oil industry, but it affects those smaller companies who are producing both tech for renewables and tech for um, oil and gas extraction at this moment. We don't want to lose that IP, that tech in renewables. We need to ensure that that support continues to be there so that if these big organisations do fail, despite what the government has put in, then those smaller organisations are supported to keep going where they are, you know, where they've got potential of being profitable in the future. So it, it would be useful if the Minister could reassure me that um, they are not just looking at this big picture, but they are also um, paying some attention to uh, the, the smaller organisations that are maybe not, not covered by this, particularly in the light of the concerns that we've raised on numerous occasions around self-employed individuals being missed out, for example, in the, in the furlough scheme. It concerns us that they may be missed out in looking at the future of this as well. Thank you, Madam Deputy. Uh, number five is withdrawn, so we go to Bill Esterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And as the Minister said, we are not out of the woods yet. There is a very long way to go, and it is right that we protect businesses that would not be viable if it were it, that would be viable if it were not for the pandemic and the loss of revenues which have resulted. These regulations play their part, but as the long-term impact of these challenges begin to make themselves known. It's clear that these measures are only part of the answer on their own. There are significant question marks over how the government plans to support businesses for the long term. For example, in the absence of an impact assessment, it's unclear which businesses are benefiting from the exemption on the rules around wrongful trading. And I'd, ask, I'd like to ask the minister, what contribution does he believe that the regulations have made in enabling businesses to recover? Because after the end of the imminent, the imminent end of the lockdown restrictions, businesses will continue to need support to recover, and it would be helpful to understand whether these regulations have worked up to now and what the likely impact of their removal will mean. Three million is the estimated number of individuals in business who have been wholly or, or partly excluded from financial support by this government over the course of the past year. That three million includes around two million owner managers, also known as the Forgotten Limited, as well as the self-employed freelancers, women who became pregnant, and people who've changed jobs at the wrong time. And let's remember, half of the excluded groups have not even been able to claim universal credit. Similarly, we need to know the impact on businesses repaying the emergency coronavirus loans, the C-bills, the CL-bills and the bounce-back loan scheme. As we head closer to the end of the lockdown cliff edge, those businesses who took out loans and have been unable to trade will need to know what the implications are for them, for their staff and indeed for the economy as a whole. And let's not forget the seven and a half million employees of the Forgotten Limited but we'll need to know what will happen to them, their jobs and the companies they work for when the loans have to be repaid. And before the minister says that the Forgotten Limited owner managers took out loans so they had support, those loans were for their business costs. Costs like the rates and the uh, costs of energy or electricity for equipment. And many owner managers have been unable to pay themselves through furlough as they are paid dividends. Unless businesses have time to rebuild their profitability, they will simply be unable to restart because of the deferred business rates, corporate and personal taxes, and COVID loans. There is a real problem of massive potential unemployment and business closure unless the end of the regulations is not just the start of financial problems induced by forced repayment Repayment, which is simply not possible without sufficient income, having first been re-established. 
According to the government's own business banking resolution service, nearly half of small businesses that have taken out emergency coronavirus loans do not intend to repay them, not because they don't want to, but because they will not be able to do so. So can the minister tell me, are company owners right to be concerned that the end of these regulations will mean business will be forced to close because of an inability to pay mounting debts and because of the associated legal problems of trading insolvently? The government declined to support the ex excluded groups, but it wasn't because of a lack of money. Billions of pounds were available for Friends of the Health Secretary or for the International Trade Secretary's advisor or for £7,000 a day consultants in a centralised contact tracing system that still doesn't work. And having the Chancellor's or the Prime Minister's phone number meant paydays for moguls in the realms of millions of pounds. So will money now be available so that businesses can start the process of recovery and their staff keep their jobs after furlough ends? and to enable debt repayments to be delayed until they can be afforded. Will the government adopt Labour's suggestion of allowing businesses to wait to repay loans until they are making enough money to do so, in a way similar to that adopted by students in the repayment of student loans? Over a million small businesses do not expect to recover from this pandemic, which is why we need to know where these regulations fit into the strategy for economic recovery. Millions of micro businesses, small and medium business owners are trying to figure out how they're going to put food on the table and pay their workers. More needs to be done to give businesses stability and security than just extending the current provisions again and again. And that means looking at proper business support, enabling smaller firms, micro businesses, sole traders, self employed workers, all of them, direct access to government contracts. That's how the US Small Business Administration operates. Why not in the United Kingdom? And does the minister share my concern that Lex Greensill made so much progress through David Cameron's access to the Chancellor in proposing invoice factoring in the public sector? The public sector is supposed to follow the prompt payment code. Why was invoice factoring even being considered by ministers and officials. Will the government use the recovery from the crisis as a reason to revisit the prompt payment code's effectiveness and to ensure, in particular, that smaller firms and micro businesses are paid in 30 days? Direct procurement and pay in 30 days for smaller micro businesses are just two ways in which firms can be supported alongside a delay in debt repayment. And I hope the Minister will respond to these suggestions. As indeed, I hope he will empower the Small Business Commissioner with proper resources to insist on prompt payment, including in the public sector. The Minister could do worse than look at the United States, where they know the value of small businesses to the economy. The US Federal Reserve Bank found that 30% that's 9 million small businesses in the US did not expect to survive 2021 without further assistance. And that's why the United States Small Business Administration has been tasked with supporting those small businesses to build back better alongside the American Rescue Plan Act of President Biden. In the UK, over a million smaller businesses face similar concerns. Wouldn't it be great if the UK had a small business administration to look after those micro businesses, the self-employed and the SMEs? And it, as the minister really should know, it's vitally important to distinguish between those different, fundamentally different types of business. The small business administration in the US shows clear intent to support smaller businesses as part of a concerted and thought out plan for the long term. Not just a quick fix, the excluded groups, the forgotten limited owner managers, the micro businesses and sole traders and the partnership businesses can all be viable again. But they need a plan, a plan that goes beyond the end of measures like the Coronavirus Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act. Failure to plan will lead to disaster for millions of people. And we'll just add 
to the significant problems that we've already seen as we come out of the crisis and into recovery. Minister Paul Scully. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank the honourable members for their valuable contributions to this debate and indeed another debate, which I seem to have just been hearing a general debate about coronavirus support going beyond these regulations. The points that are raised have been highlighted the importance of the measures being extended by these regulations and the necessity of extending them so that businesses can continue to benefit from them. And I uh, uh, welcome the return of our, 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 our work with uh, uh, the uh, Honourable Lady, for the Ma Member for Manchester Sen Central. We're in a grander setting, I think, this time than, than normal, but the conversation does remain. And I understand her concern about uh, the, the fact that we are coming back uh, to, to, to this to extend this. But it is important to remember that within these regulations there are some important powers, things like wrongful trading, things like uh, the, the moratorium when we're actually holding a lot of things within, in stasis. So I think it's right that we actually get the balance right between the, the giving businesses the certainty that, that she rightly asks for and the fact is that we use our, uh, the, the government's intervention into these areas sparingly and that we continue to scrutinise them here in this place and that we could, I'd rather come back here and us do our work um, on a regular basis um, but rather than actually step over those powers too far for, you know, for, for reasons of um, intervening too much into the economy. But it's important to keep, to, to, to keep an eye out on these sort of things. She raised the issue of um, those, people, those businesses that have uh, been excluded or, or have been coming back for requests for more support, the travel sector, the wedding sector, uh, and the visitor economy as well. And these are all hugely important um, uh, uh, businesses and sectors, uh, vital for our um, recovery. And, it's, uh, and it, these are all areas that we work on. So the, we have the Global Travel Task Force. My colleagues in the Department of Transport are working on international travel. Uh, clearly, I'm working uh, with colleagues on weddings. Uh, and in, indeed, my, um, uh, um, the uh, Minister for Tourism uh, and Sport is, is working very much on, on, on events and domestic tourism as well. And all of these areas are going to be hugely important, not just for the economy as a whole, but certainly to get our towns and cities back open. And, uh, again, and as Minister for London, that's what I, something I see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, she talked about uh, Greensill and Liberty. Now, clearly, there are, are, are concerns and, that, that need to be addressed here, but obviously speculation um, around uh, Liberty Steel and, uh, and other businesses can in itself cause uncertainty to investors, to employees, and to, uh, and, and to people seeking to, uh, um, to work with those uh, companies. Um, we are monitoring uh, the situation. We're engaging with Liberty Steel. We're engaging with, uh, with, 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 uh, with unions. Uh, and I know that the Liberty Steel themselves, their owners, are seeking a market solution, but we will continue to, to, to monitor that. But we're also engaging with uh, the sector and trade unions and devolved administrations on the longer term uh, to make sure that we can develop a longer term sustainable uh, future for the UK steel industry because it clearly has an incredibly important role um, it, uh, w within the UK. Now my, my right honourable friend, uh, the member for South North Northamptonshire, um, erstwhile of this place as the former Secretary of State, so she's, uh, we, we want to make sure that within our department that we're building on our excellent work uh, in the areas of, um, of audit reform and corporate governance because she rightly pointed out some significant failures, BHS and Carillion, to name just two. Um, and, and we want to make sure that we can work on that without, within our audit reform um, uh, work. We've already published a consultation to enhance audit, uh, UK's audit control and, uh, and f um, form of uh, regulation, and we will make sure that, uh, that we have full debates in this place as we bring those proposals to, 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 for scrutiny uh, within Parliament and in terms of legislation. The, uh, turning to the, uh, uh, the Honourable Member for Aberdeen North, and can I also associate my, my, my uh, w uh, word of thanks to others who have uh, uh, noted in a previous debate just uh, earlier on her um, comments around depression and, and it's so, so important. I really welcome her personalised um, appeal to people to, uh, to ask that it, to make sure that you know it's okay not to be okay. There were, there were wise words and words that we, we must all reach out for because the mental health aspect of um, the lockdown and, uh, the, uh, and, and obviously business uncertainty. There are lots of businesses, small and large, 
who I see on a day-to-day -day basis, hear from on a day-to-day -day basis, who are incredibly stressed, incredibly worried, and I, I value her words. But she talks about um, you know, companies not suddenly being back on their feet, and clearly that is the case. And that's why, as I say, I don't want to get into a wider uh, debate about, uh, about coronavirus support, but we realise the fact that with many of these measures there are risk of cliff edges and we will continue to, to work through those and flex to make sure that we can, we can um, support businesses. And she talked about smaller organisations as well, especially around uh, tech and, and, and uh, other technologies and IP. Yes, we must make sure that we are uh, working on those. So over the past year, businesses have faced an exceptionally challenging time with many unable to trade or their ability to trade at full capacity restricted due to social distancing measures. These regulations will provide the much needed uh, continued support for businesses as we continue to, with the government's four-step roadmap out of lockdown, allowing them to concentrate their best efforts on reopening or continuing to trade and building upon the foundations for economic recovery in the UK. We want to get to that economic recovery. And just to finally to um, answer the uh, uh, Honourable Member for Sefton Central, we talked about, he, I think he was missing when he was looking at uh, uh, thro throwing open to a wider debate, I think he missed the strengthening of our prompt payment code, which was done in consultation with the signatories to the payment code and indeed getting more to sign up to that as well. And he was looking for a wider debate about coronavirus. He also missed the plan for growth, which does exactly what it says on the tin. It looks beyond these measures. It is a plan, and it's funny enough, a plan for growth, which I think goes beyond the 30th of June. But careful consideration has been given to extending these temporary measures, and the government will continue to monitor the situation closely. I thank the honourable members for, this, for their valuable contributions uh, to this debate, and I commend these regulations yeah, to the House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the question is, as on the order paper, as many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Point of order, Oh, point of order, Lucy Pell. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. During Prime Minister's questions today, the Prime Minister claimed that, and I quote, last night our friends in the European Union voted to approve our Brexit deal, which he opposed. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is totally incorrect. She will remember... You will, you will remember, sorry, Madam Deputy Speaker, that in an extraordinary sitting of this House of Commons on the 30th of December 2020, the Leader of the Opposition and the whole Labour Party voted for the Brexit deal agreed by the Government in the EU. As limited as it was, we backed it and avoided a no-deal scenario. Uh, would you agree with me, Madam Deputy Speaker, that it's vital the Prime Minister returns to the House today to swiftly correct the record? Uh, well, I'm uh, grateful to the Honourable Lady um, for her point of order. Um, I hope she will appreciate that it's not really a point of order uh, for me, but I'm sure the Treasury bench will have heard what she has said and will report it back in the usual way through the usual channels. Um, the Honourable Lady has obviously also um, placed it on the record by raising the point of order in the way that she has. Thank you. Um, we'll have a short two-minute suspension for cleaning for the next business.
Order. Order. We now come to motion number five relating to business of the House today. Minister Whip to move. I beg to move. The question is as on the order paper, as many as are that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to motion number six on immigration. Um, Shadow Minister Holly Lynch participating virtually to move the motion. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. On behalf of my party, it's entirely right that we have the opportunity to debate the incredibly serious changes proposed in this motion in the House of Commons. And quite frankly, it's remarkable that this government sought to introduce these changes as a negative statutory instrument through the back door without any opportunity for parliamentary scrutiny at all. This statutory instrument will remove protections within the Modern Slavery Act, which sought to prevent potential victims of trafficking from being held unnecessarily in immigration detention. The changes are due to come into effect on the 25th of May, following an extremely limited consultation with a select few groups who had just two weeks to respond. The consultation, which did not seek to engage with any trafficking survivor groups, was described as poor practice by the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee. Given that these changes are being made alongside those outlined within the government's new plan for immigration, published last month, we are gravely concerned about the desire of this government to erode the rights and protections for victims of some of the most heinous examples of exploitation. So for clarity, the proposals will seek to amend the Adults at Risk in Immigration Detention statutory guidance by removing paragraph 18 on trafficking cases. This means from the 25th of next month, decisions about the detention of potential victims of human trafficking will be made without reference to the Modern Slavery Act guidance, which made clear that potential victims of trafficking are automatically considered unsuitable for detention unless there are public order reasons which would mitigate against this. <clears throat> As a result, a decision will now be assessed within the much broader Adults at Risk framework which considers a range of vulnerabilities, with the latest figures suggesting that around 39% of all those currently detained in immigration detention are considered to be adults at risk. A range of immigration factors are considered as part of this decision-making process and are far wider than public order reasons. They can include a history of offending, but additionally whether the person's immigration history includes having entered the country irregularly, not having claimed asylum immediately, or having failed to comply with Home Office reporting requirements. So often, Madam Deputy Speaker, the very nature of having been a victim of trafficking often leaves these individuals unable to satisfy these requirements. Being subject to coercive control will commonly result in an individual entering the country outside of approved routes or unable to claim asylum immediately. Furthermore, Madam Deputy Speaker, in order to benefit from a stronger protection against detention, once brought under the Adults at Risk guidance, potential victims of trafficking with a positive initial reasonable grounds decision will now need to provide additional professional evidence demonstrating not only that they are an adult at risk, but that detention is likely to cause them harm. Therefore, the primary impact of these changes will be that potential victims of trafficking will be detained and will be detained for longer. Not only is that the view of the opposition and various specialist stakeholders, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's also the view of the government. In response to concerns raised about these changes, the Home Office admitted that some individuals may, as a result of the changes, be more likely to be detained or have their detention continued than would currently be the case. Why, therefore, has the government continued to press ahead with these changes when it is well aware of the damage and distress this will cause, particularly when you consider they sought to deliver these changes by a negative SI, deeming them to be unworthy of debate and scrutiny. I want to take a moment to thank the Honourable Member for North East Bedfordshire, who secured a Westminster Hall debate on this very issue just yesterday, <clears throat> demonstrating that there are serious concerns about these proposals right across the benches. I listened carefully to the Minister's response in that debate, and it would seem that the Government have sought to justify these changes by citing that similar protection will be provided through casework guidance and training, which we haven't yet seen and can only trust that they'll be published in due course. Yet we also expect there will be changes made in the caseworker guidance, such as the increase in requirements for medical evidence, 
further weakening the protections for victims of trafficking. For example, the plans to introduce quality standards for external medical evidence and the adults at risk policy, with proposals including limiting the weight of remote assessments and stipulating healthcare professionals should have all the immigration documents and medical records relating to conditions which potential victim may not have been comfortable or able to disclose. The Minister yesterday stresses pride at this country's leading role in identifying and protecting victims of modern slavery. But he also stressed that a rebalancing is required, if I've understood correctly, between protections for victims and immigration controls. He identified, in his words, the extremely low threshold by design for reasonable grounds modern slavery decision, where there is a requirement to only suspect rather than prove someone is a potential victim of trafficking and explain that the government is looking to make adjustments to that as set out in the new plan for immigration. I'm sorry to say that all of this is delivering a downgrading of those protections, which we could have been proud of. It's an erosion of pre-existing safeguards and will undoubtedly increase the risks of vulnerable individuals of being re-traumatised in detention. Not only are we concerned by the implications of this statutory instrument, Madam Deputy Speaker, but also by the way in which this government has sought to circumvent good practice and due diligence in its processes. The consultation period lasted just two weeks during the summer last year, <clears throat> without the presence of specialist stakeholders and organisations. The Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee have aptly described the consultation as poor practice, and I note that, shockingly, the government didn't consult with the independent anti-slavery commissioner or her office on the proposals, and I very much hope that the Minister has read Dame Sarah Thornton's letter, dated the 19th of April, outlining a range of issues with these proposals. As many will already be aware, survivors of modern slavery are at increased risk of long-term depression, anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder, suicide attempts and health complications. Last week, the Royal College of Psychiatrists published a statement stating that they believe that detention centres are likely to precipitate a significant deterioration of mental health in most cases, greatly increasing both the suffering of the individual and the risk of suicide and self-harm. In 2017, the government promised a scheme called Places of Safety, which would allow survivors to access their rights sooner after being identified in settings such as police raids or labour inspections, which would have given survivors an opportunity to access legal representation and advocacy whilst at their most vulnerable, as well as increase the number of successful trafficking referrals to decision makers. Sadly, the place of safety scheme was never delivered, and as a result, thousands of suspected slavery survivors are identified, but never referred for support or decision making. I'd very much like to ask the Minister what has happened to that scheme. Additionally concerning is the government's decision to cancel the pilot schemes exploring community alternatives to detention, and I'm hoping the Minister can also offer some clarity as to that perverse decision. Madam Deputy Speaker, these changes represent a significant downgrading of the protections against detention currently given to potential victims of human trafficking. The government says it wants to introduce this statutory instrument so that the adults at risk policy can be used as the singular mechanism for vulnerable individuals in order to clamp down on the policy anomaly that currently exists. To perceive such legislative change purely in terms of fixing a policy anomaly fails to acknowledge the devastating impact it will have on vulnerable victims and represents this government's concerning approach to wider immigration policy. This government has previously stressed that a reduction in the number of people in detention is a key aspect of the series of reforms the government is making across the detention system. Yet this statutory instrument will achieve the exact opposite. Regrettably, Madam Deputy Speaker, this statutory instrument represents this government's failure to offer a solution that is compassionate, fair and deserving of vulnerable victims of human trafficking. Question is, as on the order paper, Minister Chris Philp. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Honourable Member for Halifax, the Shadow Minister, for her speech just now. As she said, this matter was debated just yesterday in a Westminster Hall uh, debate which was attended by one colleague. Let me start by reiterating the Government's commitment to tackling modern slavery. The UK has led the world 
in protecting victims of this heinous crime, and we will continue to support those who have suffered intolerable abuse at the hands of criminals, traffickers, and we'll do everything in our power to ensure perpetrators face justice. In a further demonstration of our commitment to supporting victims of modern slavery, the new Modern Slavery Victim Care contract went live in January this year with an estimated whole life cost of £379 million over its five-year lifetime. It will deliver a better service that is needs-based and will do even more to look after individual victims. It is also worth mentioning, Madam Deputy Speaker, that last year there were around about 10,000 claims uh, by victims of modern slavery, and we made around about 10,000 uh, reasonable grounds, positive reasonable grounds decisions. Um, that is, I think, uh, one of the highest, if not the highest, numbers in Europe, and it is many times higher than comparable sized European countries. So there is no question at all, Madam Deputy Speaker, the United Kingdom leads Europe in its work on protecting victims of modern slavery. We've also embarked on an ambitious national referral mechanism transformation program to do even more work than we are doing already. We have, moreover, uh, launched a review of the 2014 Modern Slavery Strategy that will allow us to build further on the progress made. But, Madam Sl uh, Deputy Speaker, while our commitment to cracking down on these appalling crimes remains undiminished, being recognised as a potential victim of modern slavery does not and should not automatically result in being granted immigration status in the UK or immunity from immigration proceedings. There may be potential victims or victims of modern slavery who have no lawful basis to remain in the UK, some of whom will be dangerous foreign national offenders, and for whom we are faced with decisions about using detention lawfully as a means of securing their removal. And that is especially true when other options, including voluntary return, have been exhausted. Where we are faced with these decisions, it is important they are made in a way that is consistent, fair, and balanced. Uh, the Shadow Minister mentioned detention in her remarks, and it's worth saying that the use of detention for immigration purposes has been reduced significantly. The number of people in immigration detention in December 2019, before the pandemic started, was around about half the level reported in September 2017. Uh, moreover, of those entering immigration detention in 2019, I think from memory 39% only spent a week in immigration detention, and about 75 per cent spent less than 28 days in immigration detention. It is something used sparingly and only where necessary to deliver uh, our immigration rules properly. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, the rules we are discussing today rectify an anomaly in the existing policy to bring detention decisions for potential victims of modern slavery within the scope of the Adults at Risk policy. Um, that is the policy we use to make detention decisions for vulnerable people, um, including those with serious physical or mental health uh, disabilities. At present, the Alice at Risk policy requires detention decisions uh, for potential victims of modern slavery to be made with reference to separate Modern Slavery Act 2015 statutory guidance. That guidance does not steer decision makers in how to balance a person's vulnerability against other considerations. Um, when making detention decisions, but makes reference only to public order, as the Shadow Minister has already said. We believe the Adults at Risk policy in itself, which already caters to all kinds of other very serious vulnerabilities, is the appropriate framework for detention decisions for potential victims of modern slavery. It allows for a nuanced and balanced assessment of detention decisions to be made, which the current policy does not allow. It also supports our desire for a clear and consistent approach to safeguarding in immigration detention decision-making and will enable decisions for potential victims to be made in line with those for other categories of vulnerable individuals. To be absolutely clear, Madam Deputy Speaker, the vulnerability and risks associated with potential victims of modern slavery will continue, will categorically continue to be fully accounted for and fully considered. So let me be clear, these regulations will not weaken the protections afforded to potential victims of modern slavery. The adults at risk in immigration detention policy is well established, well established, been in place for at least five years. It enables officials to identify vulnerable adults 
and make decisions about the appropriateness of their detention, balancing all consider relevant considerations. The adults at risk policy strengthens the presumption in immigration policy that a person will not be detained where that person may be particularly vulnerable to harm in detention. And moreover, we do recognise and will continue to recognise the specific protections afforded to those in receipt of a positive reasonable grounds decision um, in accordance with the European Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings or ECAT. All of those protections will of course be respected and I can also assure the House that caseworkers and other Home Office staff will receive the appropriate guidance and training uh, so they are able to properly take into account those special protections for potential victims of modern slavery. Uh, we fully accept that those specific considerations exist. Uh, we recognise that in some circumstances an individual's uh, history may have been influenced by their trafficking uh, or their previous um, modern slavery experiences and that will most certainly be reflected in guidance and in subsequent decision making. Um, let me also be clear that every single uh, decision is taken individually on a case-by-case -case basis. There is a presumption against detention where there is uh, particular vulnerability to harm, uh, and so those two things, I think, should give the House a great deal of reassurance um, on these points. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, in conclusion, um, as I set out, modern slavery is a despicable crime. The UK is leading Europe in identifying and protecting victims and going after perpetrators. The changes we are contemplating today make use of a well-established, very effective policy uh, for protecting vulnerable people and enable a rounded and balanced decision to be taken in these difficult cases. Uh, we now go to the SNP spokesperson, Stuart C. Macdonald. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. SNP MPs are fully behind this motion to revoke, and I support the arguments that the Shadow Minister has already set out. As well as the Honourable Member for North East Bedfordshire, who secured yesterday's debate, can I also uh, thank the Right Honourable Member for Hayes and Hallington for his work in raising this, and pay tribute to all survivor groups and others working in this field who alerted MPs to the significance and consequences of these regulations. For while they are short regulations, they are also deeply worrying regulations and could have very severe impacts for trafficking survivors. And the so-called consultation on them was indeed a pretty abysmal exercise altogether. As we have heard, the goal of the statutory guidance on adults at risk in immigration detention is that it will, in conjunction with other reforms, lead to a reduction in the number of vulnerable people detained and a reduction in the duration of detention before removal. But these regulations will have the opposite effect, and that is because they remove crucial protections provided to those with positive reasonable grounds decisions. No longer will detention of potential victims of trafficking be considered with reference to the separate Modern Slavery Act statutory guidance. Instead, the process is to be merged into the overall adults at risk system. And this means a serious dilution of the protections against detention currently afforded to potential trafficking victims. Potential victims are and should continue to be entitled to a proper recovery period during which it can't be removed and therefore can't generally be detained thanks to the Modern Slavery Act guidance. But unless these regulations are revoked today, other immigration eh, considerations will potentially be prioritised. An irregular immigration history, which many victims of trafficking will have, may mean a victim been locked up. The standard of evidence of potential harm and detention required of them will be ramped up. In short, more victims of trafficking will be detained and more will be detained for longer, something the government does not actually even seem to dispute. And that means more potential victims suffering real and serious harm to their mental health. That is utterly against the government's stated objective in the guidance, and it is against their obligations to assist victims in their physical, psychological and social recovery. In response to these very serious arguments, the government seems to provide two arguments of its own. But the first seems to justify the regulations on what amounts to little more than tidying up or administrative convenience, why burden officials with two systems of statutory guidance when one will do. The government points out that potential victims of trafficking are the only group of people for whom such a special provision exists, and it calls this a policy anomaly requiring correction. But these additional protections are absolutely justified, given what we know and understand about trafficking and the potential consequences of detention for such people. It is not a policy anomaly, 
but a perfectly reasonable and proportionate response to specific dangers that face trafficking victims. If anything requires correction, it is the mainstream adults at risk policy into which the government wants to throw trafficking victims. We know that it is overly burdensome and fails too many adults at risk. Let us fix that system, not meddle in the additional protections offered to trafficking victims. The other government argu argument appears to assert that there has been some evidence of abuse of the system, with false, false claims of trafficking designed to avoid detention. Well, the answer to that is not to make genuine victims suffer, as these regulations will, but to tackle that abuse head on. It is the Home Office, Home Office itself who assesses who is a victim of trafficking. So invest in doing that better and doing it faster. Why is it taking 456 days for potential victims to get conclusive grounds decisions? That is where the Home Office should look to weed out any abuse not by throwing victims under a bus instead. Finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, even if the Minister does not accept our analysis of the system as it stands, at the very least he should accept that if we are going to put everyone into one system, we should have a wide-ranging consultation and debate on how that system is working, what needs changed and what a better system could look like. But instead of proper debate and consultation, as we have heard, what we had was poor practice, as the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee said. After two years of Home Office policy development, a small group of stakeholders had two weeks during the August summer holidays to feed back. The whole process was hush-hush, with those involved not allowed to share the proposals beyond the select few. Those was lucky enough to participate were largely ignored. This so-called targeted engagement failed to consult relevant groups, including, as I understand it, the government's own modern slavery strategy implementation group or the independent anti-slavery commissioner. Wendy Williams' Windrush Review demanded consultation on changes to policy that was meaningful, offering informed proposals and openly seeking advice and challenge. This consultation did nothing of the sort, and a bad piece of secondary legislation as a result, one that will harm victims of trafficking. And that is why these regulations should be revoked. Thank you. We now go to John McDonnell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I I find it hard to believe that we're having this debate today and that this delegated legislation has been brought forward at all. Emotionally, for many members of the House, I think it, we find it hard to take, especially those members who have taken any interest in detention and specifically modern slavery and trafficking over the last two to three decades. After all the years of campaigning to expose modern slavery and tracking, trafficking and then to achieve as a parliament, which we're all proud of, the Modern Slavery Act in 2015. This is like stepping back in time. It's a hugely retrograde step that I thought after the exposure of trafficking and the recoil from the policies of the hostile environment, I thought we'd never see this sort of legislation again. It's shameful that it's been brought before us. Just ask the question, have we learnt nothing about the suffering that trafficking imposes upon people? I urge the Minister and Honourable Members to not support this motion, and actually to go back and look at some of the reports and investigations that led us to bring forward the extra protections for traffic victims. In 2017, Rahila Gupta, who is a member of the South All Black Sisters and a famous author now in my local community. She, she wrote the book Enslaved the New British Slavery, and it reported extensively at the time and shook many of us to the core with its descriptions of trafficking and its impact on our fellow human beings. And many other reports then followed. And what we learned, we learned something of the scale of trafficking and its consequences in this country. Yesterday in Westminster Hall, the government seemed to claim that the reason for this legislation was that the system was being abused somehow. We haven't seen any evidence published by the Home Office for this claim, and we've had no independent assessment of this claim or any data the government may want to bring forward to argue this case. But what we do know, and it's on the basis of the research backed by the Home Secretary and undertaken in 2020 by Justice and Care and the Centre for Social Justice. What we know is there's an estimated over 100,000 victims of modern slavery in the UK. In 2020, only 3,000 people were positively identified as survivors of slavery 
in the second stage of decision-making process. So my contention is that the government's main worry should be about its failure to identify and make safe the vast majority of people who have been trafficked into this country, rather than concentrate on unsubstantiated allegations of abuse in the system. With no data published to prove it, the government has also argued that there has been a surge over the last 12 months in foreign national offenders claiming to be victims of trafficking to disrupt the immigration proceedings. This completely fails to understand everything that we learn, that many of those convicted are convicted of crimes which were they, they were forcibly trafficked to commit in this country. And I just cite the recent examples we've had in many of our constituencies of the Vietnamese young people trafficked into cannabis farms in the UK. And often many of the people who've been trafficked and are then convicted of crimes, often we find that their access to legal advice and support to even explain their circumstances and case has been lacking. The government also appears to be arguing that the threshold of reasonable grounds for determining someone who's been trafficked is too low. Well, under the European Convention on Action Against Trafficking, it was, it was a deliberately set low to ensure that people are identified. And I believe we have an international obligation to uphold that standard under the Convention. People who are referred into the system are done so as the Minister knows, by first responders. And these are professionally trained and they're authorised by the government. And in detention, virtually all the referrals come from the Home Office itself. The government has offered us, as the Minister has said, revised casework guidance. It hasn't even been published, and yet we're expected to vote into law this statutory instrument. A leap in the dark. If the consultation had been adequate, I feel no government could have reasonably brought forward this statutory instrument. As other members have said, the consultation was extremely limited, both over who was consulted and the time scale. Only two weeks to consult on something as significant as this is a dereliction of government duty, particularly about openness and transparency and consideration of all reasonable factors. At the Stash Instrument Committee, the Home Office did admit, as others have said, that more people will be held in detention if this Stash Instrument is approved. It will mean more people going into detention, but also more difficult for people to get out of detention. And we need to recall the people we're talking about. These are traffic, exploited, abused physically, sexually and mentally. They're extremely vulnerable. They're isolated, confused, often lacking and the ability to speak English even. And they're suspicious of authority. They've often been emotionally abused to the extent that they're traumatized, and many suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. These are the people that this statutory instrument will increasingly force into detention. And in detention, let's be clear, we know now there's little access to legal advice, emotional or health support. And often it's very difficult, therefore, for these people to be able to communicate their circumstances in their case. And what does detention mean? Well, I tell you, this is the reality of detention. I have two detention centres in my constituency, Harmsworth and Colnbrook. Over 30 years I've been visiting Harmsworth. There was a couple of Nissan huts years ago, no more than about a dozen people detained there. Now we have effectively what are two prison-style buildings housing anything between 800 to 1,000 detainees. These detention centres are notorious. Detainees have died with accusations of neglect and lack of care and abuse. Maybe the minister can remember the 83-year-old man who was taken from detention to Hillingdon Hospital and died still in handcuffs. On two occasions, riots have broken out with Harmsworth being burnt down. Detainees get lost in the system as well, with examples of some being detained for long periods, trapped in detention. And the irony is that most will eventually be released and allowed to settle to become valuable members of our community. The moral of this story is we detain too many people unnecessarily and in unacceptable conditions. 
I believe in years to come, people will look back on this system with incredulity, but also with disgust. In addition to increasing the numbers of victims who've been trafficked into, who've been trafficked, increasing the numbers in detention, I believe this legislation will deter victims from coming forward and it will be used by traffickers to discourage victor, victims escaping. If this SI goes through, traffickers will say <laughs> to the victims with some accuracy that if you try to escape, you'll be locked up anyway in a detention centre or prison. I believe if this House allows the statutory instrument to go onto the statute book, it will be seen as a disgraceful act of inhumanity to attack some of the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable people living in fear in our community is a new low for this parliament. I thought that we'd all moved on. I thought we'd move forward. I hope that there are a sufficient number of members of this house that still have the humanitarian instincts to reject this appalling measure. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister and, uh, and, and all the contributors to, to what has been said? Um, it's, it's an issue of uh, great importance to me. I, I uh, recognise the Minister as a, as a, uh, a, member, a, a, a minister sorry, who, who does his utmost in the capacity to which he has responsibility for. Uh, and I do believe, in all honesty, that he, that he understands uh, the issues that the, all of us are, 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 have contributed, sorry, would contribute from my point of view and others who have contributed beforehand. The, the legislation before us with updated guidance, uh, cited as the Immigration Guidance on Detention of Vulnerable Persons Regulations 2021, and coming into force on the 25th of May 2021, is an attempt, I believe, to update the legislation with the latest information. Um, it is clear that this is essential as the number of people forcibly displaced around the world as a result of persecution of conflict, of civil violence or human rights violations has so rapidly increased in the last five years. And I, I, I declare, Madam Deputy Speaker, a, a particular interest in this matter, and the, the, the Minister will know that and other members will know that. Uh, I'm Chair of the APPG and Freedom of Religious Belief. So one of the things that burdens my heart, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, is, is those who are persecuted due to their their faith in the religion and their ethnic minorities. So in this house we've been tried over the years to ensure that uh, that we have a system which enables uh, uh, um, those people to be considered for asylum uh, and, and for uh, relocation. And, and, and just for the record I want to put it again, I, I've done it before but I think it's important in these types of debate to, to give credit and, and thanks for, for jobs they've done. The Syrian re resettlement scheme was one that this government brought in which uh, I personally and, and, and indeed all of us in this house supported. But uh, I just want to say that in, in my constituency uh, of Stratford, we were able, through the scheme, uh, to relocate four Syrian families who have been there now for almost five years. Uh, I met one of them just there last week and, 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 and an issue to do with housing. Uh, it's wonderful uh, that I hadn't really perhaps maybe seen them in person from that period of time. But here we were, they, they were settled. They had work, they had their families. The lady in particular, Madam Deputy Speaker, had a second baby. Um, so, and, and she said to me, and this is why I want to put it on record, she said to me, you know, um, uh, along with some of the people from the churches who have helped out as well, um, she says, you know, this is now my home. Our government made that possible for people to have their home in my constituency and indeed across many, many constituents across the whole of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So that's life changing. That is what we can do so well when we do it right. So I just want to have that on record because the opportunity came last Friday just to, to meet that lady again and, 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 and um, her, her grasp uh, of, of, uh, of and that terrible life that they went through uh, and, 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 and that upheaval that they had just because they were Christians. That's the fact of life. Uh, so we were able to help, and I thank my government and my minister for that, on behalf of them and of myself as well. The United Nations Commission for Refugees estimates that there are uh, currently 79.5 million forcibly dis displaced persons around the world. Madam Deputy Speaker, I have raised the issue on many occasions, said that some of these are the most vulnerable people brought from the most difficult of backgrounds. Wow, they, they absolutely burden me when I, when I hear them. Many countries detain asylum seekers in detention centres whilst their applications are processed or following a decision to refuse them protection. 
at present. The, the, the total number of, of, of third country nationals held in immigration detention in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland in the year ending June 2020 is 698. And whilst this number is undoubtedly affected due to COVID-19, and I understand we have had some incredibly difficult times in the last year, impact on the Home Office in relation to being able to release detainees, the United Kingdom has yet to introduce and that's why I made the comment earlier on, it's resettlement programme. And I'm not sure if the Minister is in a position to respond to me on that, but I would really be keen to see if there's any indication to do that again, what they've already done, and done well. And we must ensure this happens, I believe, as soon as possible. Madam Speaker, it is important to recognise that vulnerable persons detained in immigration centres have already experienced severe trauma. Many have PTSD. Many have seen things that we would never in a million years be able to, to envisage or, or, or totally understand or, or even contemplate in our, in our own minds and, and, and emotions. But, but I do believe uh, uh, even those with, with severe mental health issues as well uh, who are associated with pre-migration experiences and prolonged deten detention in, in, in a prolonged detention, Madam Deputy Speaker, for a period of time, on, 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 on top of all the trauma that they've had to go through, I, I find, uh, I, I do believe uh, uh, that we need to do better for those people. So, without sight of resettlement heightens these issues. I would again, uh, and I conclude with this, Madam Deputy Speaker, as, as my last comment. I would like to ask the Minister what protections will be offered by the regulations that will ensure detention of uh, uh, vulnerable Persons will be a limited process instead of one of indefinite and non reviewable mandatory detention. And if the updated guidance, as cited, is able to stand in this post COVID world, in other words, within the problems that we have and which we find ourselves coming into. Madam Deputy Speaker, thank you so much. Minister. Um, well, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and thank you to all the members who have contributed to this discussion so far. Uh, I'd like to particularly thank the Honourable Member for Strangford for his very uh, well-considered and thoughtful comments on the issues before us this afternoon. Um, and I'd particularly like to um, thank him for his remarks about the resettlement scheme, which his constituents have benefited from. I think that demonstrates the government's unshakable commitment to protecting vulnerable people uh, around the world. Our resettlement programme that the Honourable Member referred to has resettled now 25,000 people over the last six years which is more than any other European country, which I think is clear evidence of this government's compassionate commitment to those in genuine need. And he referenced, the Honourable Member for Strangford uh, referenced um, particularly persecuted Christians, of whom there are very many around the world. And in fact, following um, a speech I heard him make in a debate in this chamber, uh, I think uh, a year or so ago, uh, he will notice that the new plan for immigration expressly references persecuted Christians around the world and the need to offer them sanctuary here in the United Kingdom, uh, where, uh, where, where Shannon led the way, the rest of the United Kingdom uh, will, I hope, follow. Uh, the Honourable Member for Strangford um, asked about uh, for an assurance that, there would, that this resettlement programme would continue. Yes, it will continue. In fact, it is continuing already. We recommenced uh, a few weeks ago, so I can give him the assurance that he asked for. And on the question of indefinite detention, and we don't detain people indefinitely for immigration uh, purposes. Uh, I think uh, about 75% of people in immigration detention uh, are in there for 28 days or less. It is used as a last resort. Uh, the Hardy or Singh principles uh, set, strictly set out the circumstances in which it can be used. And at any time, anyone in detention can apply for immigration bail. And um, Madam Speaker, most importantly of all, it is categorically not true and not the case that we will be turning our backs on victims of modern slavery. Uh, on the contrary, we have done more than any government in history to look after them. Indeed, we're doing more than any government in Europe to protect and look after victims of modern slavery. And this change we're discussing today does not alter that fact. I can assure the House that decision makers will continue to take careful account of vulnerability, of risk, of the experience of modern slavery uh, victims or potential victims when making these decisions. That will be fully taken into account um, and, of course, balanced with other considerations as well. But victims will be respected, they'll be uh, treated carefully, they will be looked after as they have been in this country for many years. We have a proud record on this topic and that will continue for many decades to come.
Uh, we now go to Shadow Minister Holly Lynch. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm afraid that we have not been at all satisfied by the contribution from the Minister this afternoon that this isn't a shameful downgrading of what are essential hard-won protections for those subjects, some of the worst forms of exploitation and abuse. The Minister says we lead in Europe on modern slavery, but he uses that as a justification for downgrading the protections, which means that we'll be trampling all over that sense of leadership and welcome progress on this issue. And we'll no longer lead in this policy area, which is much more about humanity than it ever will be about practicalities. He suggests that only one other colleague attended the Westminster Hall debate yesterday, but he didn't clarify that it was a 30-minute debate. And as such, uh, there are no contributions from other parties or other members. Whereas perhaps the early day motion praying against this statutory instrument, which has 77 signatures, will be a more appropriate reflection of the interest of colleagues in this really important matter. I thought my honourable friend, the member for Hayes and Harlington, made some incredibly powerful points, and I want to thank him for his leadership on this issue. We do not have the confidence to support government on proposed guidance that is yet to be published. And I want to thank the honourable member for Strangford for his typically powerful contribution as well. The protections currently in place represent far more than a policy anomaly. There's a strong case for them to be in place and we want to see those protections extended. We seek to divide the House to revoke these proposals, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Division, clear the lobby. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Tell us for the ayes, Colleen Fletcher and Bambos Charalambos. Tell us for the noes, David Rutley and James Morris.
Lock the doors. Order. Order. The eyes to the right, 270. The nose to the left, 358. The eyes to the right, 270. The nose to the left, 358. So the nose have it, the nose have it. Unlock. We now come to motion number seven, relating to the business of the house today, number two. Uh, Minister to move. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. National Security and Investment Bill. Consideration of Law's message. Now. We now come to consideration of the Lord's message to the National Security and Investment Bill. I call Minister Paul Scully to move the motion to disagree with the Lords in their amendments 11B and 11C. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that this House disagrees with the Lords in their amendments 11B and 11C. Madam Deputy Speaker, these amendments made in the other place concern what is effectively a reporting requirement to the Intelligence and Security Committee in the National Security and Investment Regime. They incorporate the texts of uh, Amendments 11 and 15 considered this in this House on the 26th of April. In addition, they would end the reporting requirements of the Secretary of State provided for by those Amendments 11 and 15 should the Memorandum of Understanding that governs the remit of the Intelligence and Security Committee be amended to bring the Secretary of State's activities under Clause 26 of this Bill in the scope of ISC scrutiny. This House has offered a view on the substance of these amendments already. It is disappointing that the other place has not heeded the clear and carefully considered message from this Chamber that this amendment, provided for a reporting requirement to the ISC, is neither necessary nor appropriate. While I welcome the Lord's continuing attempts to find compromise, I must respectfully disagree with them. The Bayes Secretary of State has written to confirm plans for scrutiny with the Chair of the Bayes Select Committee and the Chair of the Science and Technology Committee. The ISC remains able to scrutinise the work of the intelligence services where it falls within the Memorandum of Understanding and in accordance with the Justice and Security Act. We rapidly approach the end of this session, and it is essential that this vital bill regarding the national security of the UK does not fall as a result of our failure to agree that the Bayes Select Committee will continue to scrutinise the work of Bayes. I therefore beg that this House rejects Amendments 11 and B and 11C from the other place and reiterates its message about the will of this democratically elected House yeah, yeah. to help ensure that this bill becomes law without yeah. delay. Here, 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 here. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their amendments 11B and 11C. Uh, we now go to Shadow Minister Chi Onwara. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And let me once again thank colleagues in the other place who have worked tirelessly to improve this bill. Labour of the Party of National Security have long called for a new regime to deal with evolving national security threats arising from mergers and acquisitions, which the bill seeks to do. It has been much improved in committee, as the Minister acknowledged in Monday's debate. However, as members from all sides of the House highlighted then, 
this bill is still lacking an appropriate level of oversight for critical national security decisions. Labour believes that Intelligence and Security Committee scrutiny is essential to provide the robust and sensitive oversight and accountability that matters of national security require. This bill gives significant new powers to BASE, a department traditionally lacking in national security experience. Now, on Monday, as the Minister indicated, the government rejected Lords Amendments 11 and 15, stating that, and I quote, it is appropriate and sufficient for oversight and scrutiny decisions made by the Secretary of State for BAYS to be conducted by their departmental select committee, the BAYS Select Committee. Now, uh, the Lords have responded with Amendments 11B and 11C, which, following Monday's debate, allow the government to add uh, the Investment Security Unit into the Government and ISC Memorandum of Understanding, thereby removing the obligation to provide the ISC with a confidential annex. So we maintain our position that the base committee does not have the security clearance necessary to provide scrutiny. At Monday's debate, the chair of the Bayes Select Committee, the member for Bristol North West, said very clearly that the committee does not have the access to the intelligence information that it would need in order to adequately scrutinise the investment security unit in the Bayes Department. As the Minister indicated, the, the, the Secretary of State and, uh, is saying that classified information could be shared on a case-by-case -case basis with the base committee, but retaining, recording, discussing or reporting on that information after the fact would constitute a security breach, somewhat limiting the committee's actions. And during this afternoon's debate in the other place, the government said that they will carefully consider ways in which this classified information could be provided so that the base committee can do their job. But I must ask, Madam Deputy Speaker, what, what are these, what, why do we need careful consideration when we have an existing and functioning mechanism for parliamentary scrutiny on issues of national security through the Intelligence and Security Committee? Now, earlier this afternoon, the government were again defeated in the place this time by an even greater margin, showing that despite the Minister's efforts, support for intelligence and, se and security committee oversight is growing. And I fear this is becoming an issue of intransigence and stubbornness, or as former Conservative Health Secretary Lord Lansley put it today, arrogance, by a government refusing to prioritise national security in the National Security and Investment Bill, and determined to overturn common sense for reasons which are unclear to us all. Because it is clear to us that, that there is a need for intelligence and security committee oversight. Indeed, the member for New Forest East and chair of the ISC said that the setting up of a new investment security unit in Bayes, the function of this bill, is precisely the situation that the government ensured the House would receive ISC oversight under the Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, between the government and the ISC. So today's amendment provides for ISC scrutiny until an amendment, amended MOU resolves the confusion which appears to exist on the government side, at least. Madam Deputy Speaker, if the government are serious about protecting the UK's national security through this bill, they will not force through legislation with such a significant blind spot. Labour, the Chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee, the Chair of the Base Select Committee, government, many government backbenchers and cross-party consensus in the other place all agree that the ISC is best placed to provide national security oversight. Why is the government determined to stand alone in risking our national security in this case. Ben Thompson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'll be very brief. I think the case was made very clearly by my honourable friend, Member for Aberdeen South, uh, earlier in this week, uh, where we made clear that we broadly support the principles of the bill, however, do still have concerns over the levels of scrutiny, as we've just heard from, from others. We've attempted to be constructive at all stages in trying to support the government to find a balance between the needs of business and national security, and particularly in relation to SMEs, 
Uh, many of the amendments have been accepted uh, and it will help to achieve this and we welcome uh, the Government's steps in this regard, but the scrutiny process does remain vital to this and we are not yet satisfied uh, that that has been taken fully into consideration. And, uh, the comments made by the Chair of the ISC earlier this week certainly highlighted that. Um, so with that, Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, I would uh, urge the Government to, to heed those words uh, and those of my honourable friend, the member for Aberdeen South. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'm grateful to honourable and right honourable members for their contributions and considerations in this debate and others. And I'll make a, just very briefly um, a couple of uh, quick points in response. Um, in terms of whether the Bay Select Committee will have access to top secret information, which is the nub of what the Honourable Lady was saying in response, we'll make sure that the Bay Select Committee has the information that it needs in order to fulfil its remit and scrutinise the work of the ISU under the NSI regime. Much of the information is unlikely to be classi highly classified, and where the Select Committee's questioning touches on areas of high classification, it's likely that relevant information could be given in a way that doesn't require as high classification and pro provided on a confidential basis to the Committee. If, however, the Base Select Committee does require access to highly classified information, we'll carefully, clearly, carefully consider how best to provide this while maintaining information security and close collaboration with the, uh, with the Committee's Chair. But the, uh, the, the government's main powers to scrutinise and intervene in mergers and acquisitions for national security reasons comes from the Enterprise Act 2002. The powers under the Enterprise Act 2002 sits with the Secretary of State for Bays and DCMS and not in the Cabinet Office. So given the Bays Select Committee's oversight of the new NSI regime is entirely with keep, in, in keeping with this and it doesn't represent a reduction in the ISU's, ISC's remit. So there's no barrier to the committee handling top secret material or other sensitive material, as I said, subject to the, the agreement between the Department and the Chair of the Committee on appropriate handling. This House, though, should continue its excellent work of speeding this bill towards becoming law for the benefits of the UK's world-leading investment environment, as well as protecting the nation's security. I do therefore beg to move that this House disagrees with the Lords in their amendments. Yeah, yeah. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their amendments 11b and 11c. As many as are of that opinion say aye, oh. of the contrary, no. no. Division, clear the lobby. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their, 11, in their amendments 11b and 11c. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Oh. Tell us for the ayes, David Rutley and James Morris. Tell us for the noes, Colleen Fletcher and Bambos Charalambos.
Lock the doors. Order, order. The eyes to the right, 358. The nose to the left, 269. Eyes to the right, 358. The nose to the left, 269. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Unlock. Minister to move that a committee be appointed to draw up reasons. I beg to move that a committee be appointed to draw up reasons to be assigned to the Lords for disagreeing to their amendments 11b and 11c, that Paul Scully, Michael Thomason, Joe Gideon, Lucy Powell and Stephen Flynn be members of the committee, that Paul Scully be the chair of the committee, that three be the quorum of the committee, that the committee do withdraw immediately. The question is that a committee be appointed to draw up reasons to be assigned to the Lords for disagreeing to their amendments 11C and 11B, that Paul Scully, Michael Tomlinson, Joe Gideon, Lucy Powell and Stephen Flynn be members of the committee, that Paul Scully be the chair of the committee, that three be the quorum of the committee, that the committee do withdraw immediately. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye, of the contrary no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. In order to observe social distancing, the Reasons Committee will meet in Committee Room 12. Thank you. We now come to motion number eight on amendments to the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme. Before I call the Leader of the House to move the motion, I should inform the House that Mr Speaker has not selected Amendment A in the name of Sir Christopher Chope. I call the Leader of the House to move the motion. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move the motion standing in my name on the order paper. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, before I begin, as I may not have the opportunity tomorrow, May I start by thanking Ray Mortimer for his service to the House, who is leaving after 18 years um, of serving us, and has always been in my time in the House, and I'm a mere stripling of only 10 and a bit years' service, one of the friendliest, most approachable and helpful members of the First Class Doorkeepers team, who was welcoming to me from the day that I arrived, and has always been smiling, positive, and knows better, dare I say, what the business of House is going to be if you need advice than sometimes one's own whips do, sometimes even than the Leader of the House himself knows. And this is characteristic uh, of, of, the, of, of the doorkeepers. And I know that um, my private office has particularly always appreciated Ray's good humour and support and friendliness too. And I'm sure that members from across the House will want to thank Ray for his service. And may I actually also thank the Shadow Leader who warned me that this was happening, and that's why I, I knew. So, Turning to the motion in my name, um, the central aim of the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme is to help improve the working culture of Parliament. The Government continues to be determined to play its part, giving the House an opportunity to have its say on the proposed reforms and their relative merits in achieving the change we are all striving for. This motion endorses the report agreed by the House of Commons Commission on amendments to the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme. 
At the time that the ICGS was created, it was important that the scheme was established as rapidly as possible. Built into the setup process were two reviews, one after six months, a second after 18, both to provide an opportunity for the scheme to be assessed and improvements identified. Inevitably, when looked at over time, there were aspects that required improvement. I am grateful to Alison Stanley for the dedication and professionalism she showed in her work reviewing the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme, in particular for her most recent extensive review, published on the 22nd of February. It has been useful to have an independent and expert assessment of the ICGS, providing Parliament with a carefully considered set of recommendations that will help us to hone the scheme further and make Parliament a better place to work. As the Leader of the House of Commons and co-sponsor of the review, I have taken a keen interest in the report. I am confident that the proposed changes will improve the policies and procedures of the ICGS while simplifying and streamlining the management of cases. We have already made progress with the implementation of the proposals for textual changes to the policies and procedures concerning complaints of bullying and harassment or sexual misconduct in response to Alison Stanley's report. These changes, endorsed by the Commission on the 22nd of March, include the retention of the factual accuracy check as the key means of review, imposition of a time limit for bullying and harassment cases, and textual changes to the ICGS policies and procedures. The motion today will amend the ICGS in several important ways. The language of the ICGS will be amended to make it less prejudgmental, for example, by removing phrases such as a case to answer. The terminology will be updated to reflect language actually used by the ICGS helpline and team. The wording of the bullying and harassment policy will also be amended to align more closely with that in the Equality Act 2010. The procedure will also be altered to enable the independent investigator to consider at the initial assessment stage whether the complaint has already been fully and fairly considered in another context. This is an important development that will mean that double jeopardy is avoided. Oh, it would be a pleasure, yes. Thank you for giving way. And, uh, we, we uh, as a party, are supportive of uh, what the government is bringing forward tonight, and I want to put that on record. But I just want to say, whenever we get the conclusions of, 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 of what the Leader of the House is saying, I think it would really be important, Madam Deputy Speaker, if those conclusions, and I'm sure it's going to be done, are um, given to the Northern Ireland Assembly Number 1, to the Scottish Parliament, to the Welsh Assembly, so that they can also endorse them in their own regional uh, administrations. I am very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for raising that extremely sensible point. Obviously, I would not wish to trespass on the exclusive cognizance uh, in their own fields upon the various um, other parliaments, uh, but if it were thought useful, I could certainly ensure that copies of what we propose were sent on an information basis. Um, but I am looking at both the SNP and the DUP in the hope that they wouldn't think that was an impertinence and an attempt to interfere. But if they were of use, I think that would be a sensible thing to do. Um, but to continue, the procedure will also be altered to enable the independent investigator to consider at the initial assessment stage whether the complaint is already... Uh, sorry, that, that's the bit I said about double jeopardy. The ICGS will also be streamlined through the removal of the right to seek a review of the draft formal assessment which is a current means for complaint request review where an investigation concludes that the case is not upheld. The factual accuracy check will now be the single point at which both parties, complainant and responder, will be able to correct inaccuracies in the report. The system we have had until now, which combines a factual accuracy check and a review, has resulted in delaying some cases substantially. We have debated the need for investigations to come to a conclusion more speedily on a number of occasions, and this straightforward measure will help achieve that. Another important recommendation concerns the introduction of a time limit for non-recent cases. This will apply only for bullying and harassment cases. The new time frame will be brought in a year from now, applying to new complaints arising from the 28th of April 2022. From that date onwards, people will be able to report an incident of bullying or harassment up to one full year after it occurs. This compares to the three-month deadline for claims to an employment tribunal. So I think this House is once again setting a standard higher than that that is expected in external workforces. 
But given the particular nature of sexual harassment cases and the understandable reality that people often need longer to feel able to bring forward a case of such a nature, there will be no time limit for those cases. In addition to the changes recommended by the review, there are further technical changes proposed to the policies and procedures. These include making clear that although bullying, harassment and sexual misconduct are defined in the same way across the parliamentary community, the Commissioner for Standards in both Houses are responsible for overseeing investigations and therefore there are some procedural differences. Aligning the language of the two policies and procedures more closely, amending the procedure documents to be clear that they provide an outline only of the procedure, making clear that complaints can be made of any former member of the parliamentary community, including in the bullying and harassment policy that victimisation is an aggravating factor as is included in the sexual misconduct policy. And finally, including information on data protection. Nonetheless, I would like to provide some reassurance about whether the changes set out in today's motion would have retrospective effect. For the majority of the changes made to the text of the policies and procedures, the question of retrospection does not arise. Some of the changes are purely linguistic. For example, the change in terminology from case manager to independent investigator to ensure that the documents reflect the terminology used by those involved in the process or the change from reporter to complainant in sexual misconduct complaints. In those cases, it would not be meaningful to talk about retrospection. Other changes that have been made to reflect existing practice, for example, the factual accuracy check, which was introduced as a procedural step some time ago as a matter of fairness to both parties, is now expressly referred to in the documents. Others have been made to clarify the language and to amend defects in the drafting to ensure that the documents clearly reflect the policy intention at the time they were made. It will be for the decision-maker to decide how to apply the policy in cases already underway, considering both the language at the time and the intention. And I think I might repeat that for the benefit of the uh, House, because this, I think, is a fundamental point. It will be for the decision-maker to decide how to apply the policy in cases already underway, considering both the language of the policy at the time and the intention. For members or former members, the Commissioner for Standards makes the initial decision, which can then be appealed to the IEP in accordance with the IEP's own procedures. For former staff, the House Service is the decision-maker, and for members' staff, the decision-maker will be the member. There are also some minor changes where it is fair and reasonable to apply the changes... Of course I'll give way. I'm very grateful. And, and he's, he's addressed the issue which has been of concern to me and which led to me uh, seeking support for an amendment, which is the issue of retrospection. But I'm rather disappointed that he doesn't seem to be ruling out the fact that changes to paragraph 4.3 are, are, are retrospective. Uh, and how, how can it be justified that we make retrospective changes to paragraph 4.3, which, subject to the decision-maker, uh, can be allowed to uh, be lawful. But surely, if we change the rules, uh, we should change the rules prospectively uh, rather than retrospectively. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, mean, I think my honourable friend makes a very important point. Um, the issue here is that it is not at this stage clear what decision the decision maker would make on the language that is currently used in light of the policy that was adopted by the House. And what I am saying is that what we are passing today does not change the ability of the decision maker to make a decision on the language of the policy at the time. It is not an attempt to say that the decision maker must follow a new set of words or an old set of words, but for them to look at what was there at the time, both in policy and in terms of language, and decide what the right decision is. Can I come back again? Yeah, of course. I, I, Most great to my right honourable friend. But, pa but paragraph 16, Madam Deputy Speaker, of the Commission report states that the drafting has merely, of uh, pa paragraph 4.3, has merely been updated, and I quote, so that it m more clearly reflects the policy intention of the Commission and the House when the resolution relating to non-recent cases was passed in July 2019. Without anticipating my own 
speech. All I can say is there is no evidence at all uh, that there was such a policy intention at that time. And I'm very worried uh, that the, those words in paragraph 16 could be used by a decision maker uh, in order to justify what I would regard as retrospective change. It is not for me to say what decision the decision maker should come to, but the decision maker should base any decision on the language of the policy at the time. It would not be fair to make a decision on our clarification ex post facto, which I hope is helpful to the House. Well, I, well, I uh, of course, I'll give that. I think this is quite important. The House is perfectly entitled to change its rules, but there's ab absolutely fundamental part of natural justice that laws should not be changed retrospectively. So just for the sake of argument, if we are dealing with an historic case, for instance, if we're dealing with a case that may have happened several years ago, the member may have left this House, it's absolutely vital that the Leader of the House makes clear that that person would be judged according to the rules at the time, not according to the way we are changing the rules now. Do I make myself clear? And I think if the Leader of the House makes that clear, that will be very helpful. Right Honourable Friend is absolutely clear, and I think that is broadly what I have been saying. What I am not committing to is to saying how the decision maker would interpret the rules as they were at the time in view of the stated intention that the House had, because there was a degree of um, disagreement between the two. And that is a matter for the decision maker to make on the basis of the wording at the time not on the basis of subsequent changes to the wording. What we are doing today should not influence the decision-maker's view of what existed at the time in one direction or the other. It should be based on what existed when it... In, uh, uh, of course I will. Sorry. Then who will decide whether a complaint is in scope or out of scope according to the rules as drafted two years ago, the rules that are being changed today? The, the interpretation of the rules is going to be for the people who are the decision makers. As I set out earlier in my comments, um, ultimately it is for the IEP on an appeal for a member in relation to uh, a member's staff. It would be the member, him or herself, um, for somebody working for the House, it would be the House authorities. And for a Member of Parliament, uh, it would be for the Commissioner to determine what the rules at the time meant, but not to jump to a change in the rules. And that, I hope, is clear. And I wish I could give the interpretation of what the rules mean that I'm being asked for by my Honourable and Right Honourable Friends. But that's not my territory. I would then be trespassing in the independence of this process, which is its whole virtue, is that it is independent. What I am simply doing is making it clear that any decision-maker should base it, as I said, on the language of the policy at the time. Can I have one more of course. But on that basis, it is possible for decision-makers, looking at the rules as they were or as they are today before they're changed, for a variety of decision makers to come up with different decisions. And isn't that a problem? Because one decision may interpret the rules in a different way to another decision maker as to another decision maker, and that in itself creates a problem. Uh, my honourable friend um, makes a point that is sorted out by the fact that there is an appeal system and that there is a senior body that can, on appeal, determine this which I imagine other decision-makers would then want to follow. It is not the same as a court, but it is not entirely dissimilar that, yes, lower courts can make a decision, but ultimately there is an appeal body that will make a decision that then you would expect the lower-down decision-makers to follow. So I don't think the problem that my honourable friend, um, uh, the problem that he outlines, is actually one that would last because there is a proper appeal system to the Independent Experts Panel, which, of course, very much at the request uh, of honourable and right honourable members across the House, contains very serious legal expertise so that we can ensure that in all these cases natural justice is done and that it is fair both to complainants uh, and to respondents. 
on, on that point, uh, yes, of course. I, I'm most grateful to my right honourable friend. Will this independent panel be accessible by former members rather than just current members of, of this House? And in paragraph um, three of the uh, Commission report, there's a reference to these changes to which we're, we're referring being recommended by staff for clarification and updating of the documents. Are those staff involved in any of this decision making? And is it possible for my right honourable friend to ensure that those recommendations from the staff are published so that we can all see what they were and the basis upon which they were put forward? I'm great for my own friend, but um, Alison Stanley carried out a very thorough review and spoke to a number of people across the parliamentary estate to get their views and to get a full understanding of how the overall system was working and drew her conclusions from that and made recommendations to the Commission, the bulk of which are being uh, implemented if the House decides to support tonight's proposal. Um, I think when uh, discussions are held in confidence, it is unfair, retrospectively, to um, undermine that confidence. So, no, I couldn't give a commitment that the views given to Alison Stanley should be made public because the views weren't solicited uh, on that basis. So, um, to come to the other minor changes... It's a big mistake, Madam Deputy Speaker, to put two points in, a, in an intervention. But my, because my first point was about whether or not former members of Parliament will have access to the independent panel for appeal. Uh, the independent experts panel is available for appeals for people who get caught up in the ICGS system. And if um, any conclusion is made, I believe people have the right to ask to appeal to it. Not all appeals are guaranteed, but there is a right to ask for it. Um, and um, certainly, as far as I'm aware, that applies to anybody who comes up within the system. Um, but let me come now to the other minor changes. Um, the, the original documents were clear that confidentiality is central to the process, but made reference to the possibility that either a complainant or respondent might wish to discuss the matter with a small number of people to seek practical support. Those mentioned were managers and HR services or other relevant parties. The new version refers expressly to trade union representatives and party whips because concerns were very reasonably raised that the document should make clear that a member who discussed his or her case with a whip would not be in breach of the requirement of confidentiality. That clarification is relevant in all cases whether or not the complaints procedure has already begun. Where there is a real change to the policies and procedures, I'm happy to confirm that the changes are not being applied retrospectively. In particular, the new one-year time limit on complaints of bullying and harassment will not be applied to any complaints made before the 28th of April 2022, and this is clear from the text before the House. Alison Stanley also recommended the removal of the complainant's right of review because of the degree of overlap with the factual accuracy check. And any complainant who has made a formal complaint before this House's approval of the amended texts will continue to be able to request review on the grounds set out in the existing documents, namely that the procedure was flawed or that substantial new evidence has become available. The purpose of all these changes we are debating today is to ensure the ICGS is effective, an efficient, clear and comprehensive system for complaints and support. These alterations will make a difference to the running of the scheme and will help us to make progress towards real and sustained culture change of Parliament, something I know members across the House are keen to continue to champion and support. And, Mr. Speaker, I commend this motion to the House. I know the um, Speaker and the other Deputy Speakers would want me to agree wholeheartedly with the Leader's words about Ray Mortimer, whose service to the House is deeply deeply appreciated, as is the kindness and courtesy that he has always shown to us. Um, we will miss his cheerful presence, um, but we wish you well, Roy. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, as on the order paper, Shadow Leader of the House, Valerie Vaz. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, can I start by uh, thanking the Leader for outlining the position in relation to the motion. Um, 
Um, I would start by saying it's a good time to thank the people who started off the whole process of the ICGS setting it up and who may have moved on uh, and don't get a chance to, to be that. But it was a difficult task from the start uh, and they've done incredibly well to do that. As the leader has said, Alison Stanley reviewed the process and she undertook an 18-month review on the 22nd of Feb. Uh, and I'd like to thank her for her diligence in her work. Um, the Commission did discuss a report on the proposed changes, and that's what is now before the House, and it, it includes amendments made in response to the 18-month Stanley Review and additional changes to the policies and procedures. Um, I want to just deal with uh, the response to the Stanley Review. So there was this introduction of a time limit from the 28th of April 2022 uh, that a complaint may not be brought more than one year after the incident complained of. At present, there is no time limit on non-recent cases. Stanley suggested two years, acknowledging also in her report that tribunal cases have a time limit of three months. Um, and the uh, Commission report states that it will be one year uh, from the date complained of. Uh, secondly, the independent investigator will also be able to consider at the initial assessment stage whether a complaint has already been fully and fairly considered in another context. And if it has, there will be grounds for rejecting the complaint. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we've seen incidents, or we know of incidents, where sometimes uh, staff have taken it through the normal grievance procedures and also through the ICGS. So as the leader outlined, we can't have this double jeopardy. Again, the definitions are being aligned with the Equality Act to include all the protected characteristics. And the 18-month review found a combination of, fact, of a factual accuracy check and the right of the complainant to seek a review of the investigator's findings have delayed some cases substantially. But that remains, the factual accuracy check remains available for both parties to correct the factual inaccuracies. Can I just turn now to the policy and procedural change, uh, changes? And these will use the same words for both the complaints and respond, respondent for all the bullying, harassment and sexual misconduct cases. Um, it also states that the existing procedure documents have been shortened and amended to make clear that they provide an outline only of the procedure and that further de detailed information on the different stages of the process is available from both the ICGS team and the relevant decision-making body. Now, uh, the leader has uh, actually not clarified some of the questions that were answered. And I find that concerning, um, that the procedure should be in lots of different places, and they're not in a usable form. He will know, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we have standing orders, we have our Erskine May, so things are out there transparent. And we also have obiter dicta from the leader's podcast about how Parliament works, <laughs> making, making it obscure and asking the team and the relevant decision-making body doesn't give clarity, certainty and transparency. And people shouldn't have to go to different places to find what the procedures are. So I hope and I'm happy to work with the leader and anyone else to ensure that the procedures are published in full so that everyone is aware of them. Again, victimising a complainant for bringing a complaint would be treated as an aggrav aggravating factor. And now turning to the uh, vexatious question that has been before the House, the change to the drafting in relation to non-recent cases, which was agreed in July, that it should be possible to complain of the conduct of any former member of the parliamentary community, be they clerks, be they anyone else, whether or not they hold a parliamentary pass when the complaint is made. Now, as currently drafted, there is an and, as the Honourable Member has, has um, alluded to in, I think it's uh, paragraph, uh, section 4.3 and they have to hold a parliamentary pass. And the change is, former members of the parliamentary community, whether it's a clerk or a member or anybody else, it's whether or not they hold a parliamentary pass. Now, I think that offends the principles of natural justice, one of which is, and I'd like to remind honourable members, is procedural fairness, a right to a fair hearing. And that means you know the rules by which you are being judged to act fairly to act in good faith without bias and to give each party an opportunity to state their case. Now, to me, procedural fairness, in my view, is not changing the rules and making them apply retrospectively, which I think the leader wasn't quite 
uh, didn't actually say uh, whether the rules were retrospective or not. So I'd ask him to confirm again whether any changes made today will apply to the current cases that are currently going forward. And I know that he suggested that it was the decision maker, but actually it was pointed out earlier by my honourable friend from Broxtow that it, it's an individual decision maker. They're all separate and we're all different. And this is why I go to the fact that there should be a set of rules that everybody can see and everybody can apply to. Now, no one, in no, in no situation, in a quasi-judicial situation, do you ever have different decision makers making different decisions on a rule that is not clear. And I think the amendment sought to clarify that. Um, so I hope that the leader will, in his remarks, clarify that too. Yes. May I apologise to the chair that um, I didn't hear the uh, leader of the House's opening comments because I was chairing a committee meeting in another building. But following as closely as I can what the shadow leader is saying, as I understand it, this particular section 4.3 about passes, I presume that she wouldn't have any objection to a change in the rule saying that, well, passes, passes used to be required, um, but no longer will be required, as long as that applied only to future cases. What seems rather strange is that it should be said, we're not changing the rule, we're just clarifying what the House meant previously. And when it previously said the person has to still be holding a parliamentary pass, what it really meant was that he or she didn't have to be holding a parliamentary pass at all. That's surely not a clarification to the rule, it's a change of the rule, and therefore it should be forward-looking and not retrospective, should it not? Can I thank my Rajnambra friend for, for that? Uh, and I think he'd missed the earlier discussion about the, the lack of clarity around that. But it shouldn't be the case where current cases going through um, are subject to changes of rule. That, to me, is, 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 a, is a breach of natural justice. And, and you can't have different people, different decision makers, applying the rules as they interpret them to cases. Uh, you, you can't have changes in procedure, in my view, uh, you can't have changes in procedure to cases because each case will be dealt with differently. But as it was set out, as my honourable friend read it out, 4.3, it is fairly clear that there are the two limbs and that should therefore, any changes should apply to future cases. Yes, sir. It's grateful, sir, and I, I obviously agree with, with her uh, assessment of, of the importance of getting proper clarity and ensuring that we're not going to have uh, retrospection. But can I also draw her attention to the, the sentence in paragraph 3 of the Commission report? Because I think my right honourable friend misunderstood that, because it says that these changes which we're discussing at the moment were recommended by staff for clarification and updating of the documents. I'm not referring to the Alison Stanley recommendations. This is something completely different. These changes, which are causing us concern, were recommended by staff. And is it unreasonable to ask whether we can see the document in which those recommendations were made and see whether some of the staff who made those recommendations may themselves have been involved or know decision makers? Thank you. I, I, I don't have an issue with uh, clarity. In fact, I think it's really helpful uh, to see the thinking behind uh, why the changes are being made. So uh, unless there is some confidentiality, uh, then I don't see any problem because we, we're sitting here, we're standing here and discussing this, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I think we're not getting any clarity on this. It's, it's getting, and certainly not from the interventions uh, and the responses, we're not, there is no clarity on this. And I, and I wish there were, and it could be. And it, it actually helps to make a system much more fairer and work better. So uh, yes, I, I would agree with uh, my honourable friend. Can I just move on to the, the next part of the um, Stanley report? And she found in her review that those with a BAME um, visible minority background were less likely to have used the ICGS helplines compared to their white colleagues. Several surveys, she was concerned that several surveys carried out across Parliament have indicated that these groups are more likely to report that they have experienced bullying and harassment, sexual misconduct, 
or discrimination. And despite these findings, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are no specific recommendations in the report which try to remedy this. So certain things have been remedied but not others. And I find that um, in the light of uh, the current climate uh, with Black Lives Matter that, that, that we should, they should be considered. And interestingly, in the introduction to the 2019 Parley Reach Report, Stand in Our Shoes, they concluded, which has been um, actually published again on the internet uh, for Stephen Lawrence Day, uh, they said their findings confirm their view that there was insufficient focus on actions, uh, focus on and actions to challenge racial bias, both conscious and unconscious, and that many BAME visible minority staff expend effort each day to defend their right to work in Parliament and to progress through the organisation. They found that only 54% felt that they were confident to raise issues of concern and 56% uh, for being themselves. Now, we know from other regulatory bodies like the GMC and the SRA, Sisters Regulation Authority, uh, where they regulate professions, that uh, BAME visible minority figures are over represented as to those who are being complained about. And Stanley, uh, uh, Alison Stanley Review recommended demographic analysis of the helpline usage statistics should be carried out as soon as possible. And I hope the leader will ensure that that's undertaken because it's unclear whether that recommendation has been implemented or not, or whether there are any other measures taken to address this issue. Uh, I just want to draw uh, honourable and right honourable members' attention, uh, which they, they may not be able to see uh, in some of the reports, about the costs of, of the ICGS. And these, their budget for 2021-22 is 1.8 million. We have investigators, uh, and I do recall from the start uh, of the setting up of the ICGS, we wanted it to be as fair as possible. 28% of those investigators are police officers. These are not criminal matters. And if they are criminal matters, they should go to the criminal justice system. And that's what they're there for. Uh, I would like, in my view, I think there are many uh, barristers on the uh, Attorney General's panel, even C panel, who are, are, are not very uh, expensive, they're quite cheap, who could actually um, do the investigations cheaply and weigh the evidence uh, in, a, in a proper way to a fair system. But in the end, we all want to see a system that works. We want to stop bad behaviour. It's in all our interests to have a fair system that is transparent so that we abide by the rules of natural justice and we get justice for all. And in that sense, I support the motion. But Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to finally, because there isn't an opportunity tomorrow unless the leader is going to put in more business, just to say a few thank yous at the end of the day. Now, the Parliamentary Digital Service is getting us all back. We've got a message uh, from them to turn off and turn on our computers. They are showing us as we all come back to the estate, uh, as more people come back. But I specifically want to thank Ian Doubleday um, in Norman Shore South, who has been really helpful uh, in enabling members to come back, keeping us safe and member staff. Uh, so I want to thank Ian. And finally, also to pay tribute to uh, one of our senior doorkeepers, Ray Mortimer. He's been here since 2003. He's led the Speaker's possession for eight years and the procession to the Lords during state opening on two occasions. He's been through six sergeant at arms, three speakers, and on his fifth prime minister. His good friend, mentor, and boss, in capital letters, Phil Howes, said, and I'm sure the whole house will agree, Ray has been a superb asset, not only to the doorkeeper team, but to the House, dedicating the past 18 years delivering fantastic service. His colleagues will miss his knowledge and guidance to the team. He's going from one house of drama here to another, the Marlowe Theatre in Canterbury. <laughs> we wish Ray good and good luck to his wife, Sam. All the very best for the future and thank him for his amazing public service and the loyal service to the House of Commons. And from me on a personal level, just as the leader said, he's always been good fun He's always ready to, with advice as to what's going on in the chamber. He's extremely supportive of members, all our work and the smooth running of the chamber, always smiling and in a good mood. We will remember him as our little ray of sunshine. 
Thank you, Ray, from all of us. Sir Christopher Cho. M Mr Deputy Speaker, can I also express my thanks and good wishes to uh, Ray, Ray Mortimer? My interest in this issue arises from the time when I was on the Standards Committee, and particularly during the 2017-19 Parliament. And during that time, I was involved in discussions leading up to the creation of the ICGS scheme and the extension of the scheme in 2019. And I read the conclusion of the House of Commons Commission following Alison Stanley's review, and I accept that the Commission is right in taking the necessary measures in response uh, to that review. But my uh, concerns tonight are about the Commission's endorsement of, and I quote, the other changes recommended by staff for clarification and updating. And I say to my right honourable friend, uh, those are changes recommended by staff, not in response to a request from Alison Stanley, but off their own back. And I don't know how they've appeared, who they were sent to, why we can't see them, but I think it would be very useful for um, the person's purposes of transparency if uh, we could. And they are set out in paragraphs 12 to 18 of the report. And as has been discussed, the most significant change is in paragraph 16, which changes the scope of the provisions about bullying and, and harassment. And as a result, paragraph 4.3 is revised, and that's as set out in the appendix. I don't have any problem with the revision, but what I do have a problem about is the possibility that that provision, that change, is retrospective. And the issue of retrospection is one that was discussed quite usefully in the original uh, report, uh, because there was a legal opinion on what was then being discussed as pre-scheme cases from Tom Linden QC, and the opinion is set out at page 93 and uh, following in the uh, delivery report published on, in July 2018. And in that legal opinion, Tom Linden makes clear that there is a common law presumption against retrospective effect. And uh, I hope uh, that we're not going to get into territory uh, where there's litigation arising uh, uh, um, uh, if people feel that the common law presumption against retrospection is not being honoured by the decision makers. And in that opinion from Tom Linden, he quotes um, the L L Lord Brightman um, saying, uh, giving a, a good definition about the retros what is retrospective and not. He, and Lord Brightman says it's retrospective if it takes away or impairs a vested right acquired under existing laws or creates a new obligation or imposes a new duty or attaches a new disability in regard to events already uh, past. And it seems to me, uh, from what we've heard, uh, that uh, the changes to paragraph 4.3 would be regarded as retrospective um, if uh, that, those principles uh, were uh, applied. So, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think that the words in paragraph uh, 16 that these changes are so that it more clearly reflects the policy intention of the Commission uh, are weasel words, because I can say there's no evidence, and I was, on, uh, I was on the Standards Committee, there is no evidence whatsoever that the Standards Committee, the Commission, or this House ever intended, when extending uh, the scope uh, to non-recent cases in July 2019, it never intended that it should be possible to complain of the conduct of any former member of the parliamentary community until that person died. In other words, it might be 10, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years uh, hence. And would my moral of course would. Yes. Would it not be very helpful if the Leader of the House, when he sums up this debate, makes absolutely clear that if we're talking about historic allegations and if the subject of that complaint is no longer a pass holder, then that complaint should firmly be judged on the rules of the time. Would that help if the Leader of the House said that? 
Well, I think the Leader of the House would say that he has more or less said that, but I think anything else that the Leader of the House can do to reconfirm th this it, it would, be, would be extremely uh, helpful. Because where is the evidence that uh, there was uh, a, a, a misrepresenting, uh, misrepresentation of the intention in the wording of paragraph 4.3? Um, the text of the paragraph um, remained the same in July 2019 as it had been in 2018. And uh, if the uh, new text had intended to change the rules, then I think the, the, certainly the Standards Committee and I think this House and the Commission would have uh, been totally uh, uh, in opposition to any suggestion that we could expose former members uh, of Parliament uh, to the risk of uh, being uh, complained against and investigated for the rest of their lives after they've left uh, the, um, the House. And that is, in a sense, what is being said, it seems, in this Commission report, is that that was the intention, but it was never properly expressed in words. My view is that if that had been the intention and it had been expressed in words, it would never have been passed by this House. And that's why I um, agitated about this and particularly keen to see um, the terms in which the staff were recommending uh, these uh, changes. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I realise that other people want to join in, in uh, this debate, but this issue is not going to go away unless we clarify uh, that these changes are not going to be retrospective in any respect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Thompson. Thank you, my, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I associate myself and that of my party with the comments of uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Leader and the Shadow Leader, and uh, paying tribute to, to Ray, who's, who's <laughs> not the, who has changed, who's changed uh, swiftly. It's just like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it, it goes without saying that, uh, that all of us in this place who have uh, use and, and the benefit of the experience of all the doorkeeping staff, um, they are just such a, a resource and, and guidance, and, and especially for, for members when we first come in uh, and helping us to f basic things like finding a way around and how the place works. They really are an amazing, an amazing team. Uh, so it would add uh, my thanks and, and tribute to, to Ray and, and, and all of the, the doorkeeping team, but certainly wishing Ray all the best for his new yeah. uh, endeavours. Um, I would also largely echo the comments of the, the Shadow Leader of the House. We, we very much support the, the, the amendments that are before us here tonight and the, the intention behind them and, and what we're looking to achieve. Uh, I would add my thanks to Alison Stanley for the, the review that's been conducted. Um, no one deserves to be victimised, bullied, dis disrespected or harassed in any workplace, let alone uh, in a parliament, and we certainly shouldn't be tolerating any form of sexual harassment or assault of any kind. So the, the processes that we're, we have in place in the review certainly helps, helps in this regard. Um, we've certainly found that the, the, the fact that there's no cut-off date now for, for sexual misconduct cases, that is a, a, a real positive step forward. I, I would certainly agree that we may perhaps need to look again at the time limitations on other incidents because I think that does uh, need further review. But I, as, as with all of these things, I think this, sort of, this is a process that needs to be organic. It does need to be able to adapt as it moves forward. And what we agree tonight cannot simply be what it is forevermore. It does need to uh, adapt to circumstances as, as we move forward. Um, and, and, and a time when trust in politicians is at an all-time low. I mean, I think there's, there's no hiding from that. It's critical that we do everything that we can uh, to enhance that trust with the public who, who send us here to do a job, who send us here to represent them and who send us here to, to be upstanding citizens and to do our bit to, to do our bit to move things forward. And I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that we should all be held to the highest possible of, of standards uh, in regard to dignity, courtesy and respect. And it should not detract from anything that we do that we put in place the measures that are before us tonight. Video link. Janet Davy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And although I am uh, speaking virtually, I would also like to join in and express my thanks and best wishes to Ray Mortimer. Um, I welcome the uh, amendments being uh, proposed today. I can see that both houses take the culture of bullying and harassment extremely seriously in Parliament. And Mr. Speaker has shown his commitment to all staff working on the estate. 
The creation of the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme is a significant undertaking and we need a system that works. And in the spirit of supporting uh, the scheme to be the best it can be, I need to raise the issue of discrimination against black, Asian and minority ethnic people to ensure that it is, it is not overlooked. And indeed, I, it's already been mentioned uh, in this house, so I am uh, feeling uh, fairly confident that it is not being overlooked in this uh, debate. Parley Reach, the Workplace Equality Network, focused on enhancing racial and cultural awareness in Parliament. It released a report in 2019 which showed the scale of difficulties that people from diverse backgrounds alone face. The Stand in My Shoes report found that this staffing group in particular faced daily struggles to be treated uh, with respect and with decency. From cleaning staff right to MPs and peers, we can be made to feel unwelcome in the very own place we work in. Staff reported having their presence questioned and equal opportunities denied. Parley Reach said that many of their members were reluctant to speak up when they felt discriminated against. They spoke about worrying that they would be seen as calling the race card and feared recrimination as a result. They felt that they had to be cautious to pick their battles carefully. This should not be the environment that staff are being made they uh, have to work in on, on top of the work they, they have to do. It's very, um, it's, it's very uh, distressing. Parliament must therefore advocate justice equally for all protected characteristics. And I myself, have had a completely demoralising encounter when I was relatively new to this house. I was made to feel as though I did not belong here. And I feel this was because of my gender as well as my ethnicity. Although this happened almost three years ago and uh, I went through the formal complaint system, it is still yet to be resolved. Does this tell us that tackling racial discrimination is a priority for the ICGS? Because it absolutely must be. Cases must be addressed faster and each one treated with care and the sensitivity it deserves. Parley Reach also pointed out the need to make the ICGS more accessible for their members. For non-desk based staff in Parliament, many of whom are from Black, Asian and minority ethnicities, it is not easy to make a complaint. If they don't work at a desk or do not own a computer at home, how can we say the system is equally working for them? when their only option is to report something to their manager, who themselves may indeed be the problem, it is not serving their needs. We must understand that many people coming from diverse backgrounds may struggle to believe that processes such as the ICGS will deliver justice. We need to ensure that they are confident in the process and that the ICGS is working for them as well as others. The amendments discussed will make uh, going through the ICGS a much smoother process, but I do hope that the comments that I've expressed will be taken into consideration so that the ICGS can be further improved to best serve all the people it pledges to help and to support. Thank you. Leader of the House. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm very grateful to all the people who have participated uh, in this debate. Um, as always to the shadow leader who along with me serves on the commission and of course these recommendations though they're brought forward by me as leader of the house are brought forward on behalf of the commission and so a number of the questions that were raised uh, by the right honourable lady are for the commission um, rather than for me as leader of the house uh, but the commission does of course have its own spokesman and as we both serve on it that is probably the best way of getting the information uh, that the right honourable lady requires because I don't wish to blur the lines between what is my responsibility as Leader of the House and what is the Commission's responsibility. Um, my honourable friend, the Member for Christchurch, went back to his fundamental point and I do want to give him one clarification on who may appeal to the IEP. Um, there is one category of member or former member who is excluded and that is a former member who has had the good fortune, if it is a good fortune, uh, to go to another place who would not be able to use the IEP, but anybody who brings a complaint against a member is able to appeal to the IEP, and any member or former member except a peer is also able to take their case uh, to the IEP. But in his speech, he reiterated um, his concern 
about the issue of retrospection. And the best I can do is go back to what I said uh, in my speech, because this is fundamental. The people considering any of these cases must do so looking at the language of the policy at the time. And I said that twice when I was speaking. I think I then reiterated it to a, an intervention, and I have now reiterated it for a fourth time uh, in, in winding up. I think that is very clear. Where I cannot be clear, because we haven't had a decision, is how they would interpret the rules at the time, because that is rightly a matter for them because they are independent. So I hope I am giving my honourable friend most of the comfort that he wants without trying to be a soothsayer and make the prediction of what would have, what would have been determined or what may be determined in future. Um, I will give way to my right honourable friend. I am very grateful to my right honourable friend, and I know it will only be a matter of his opinion, therefore, uh, in the light of what he's just said, but is there any specific historical case currently underway of which he knows which would be ruled out of scope unless the rewording of 4.3 is applied retrospectively? My um, friend raises a question of considerable importance and one that I've been very careful to avoid in all these discussions. It seems to me it would be quite wrong to be making this decision either in relation to what I've said about the rules at the time or to the new rules in relation to any specific cases. And that is fundamental to having a just and fair system. Now, the question he asks me, I know of gossip, but I have no confirmed knowledge of reports of who may or may not be facing an investigation and in all the deliberations I have done, both on the Commission and in preparing my speech, I have done it on the basis of general principles, and indeed in discussions I've had privately with the Right Honourable Lady, general principles rather than trying to consider specific names, and I think that is very important. Uh, I was just about to thank the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Midlothian, for uh, his support and for the contribution of his Honourable Friend, uh, the Member for Perth and North Perthshire, who is a member of the Commission, and is always um, fully engaged with our discussion and makes a very serious uh, contribution to our deliberations. Um, I am concerned about the um, issue raised by the Honourable Member for Lewisham East about a complaint that has taken three years. That is one of the reasons uh, that we had the Alison Stanley Review. It was one of the issues that came up most commonly from people uh, who have been involved with or have an interest in the ICGS, a feeling that things are taking too long, and it is absolutely the aim of the Commission and the ICGS itself to try and ensure things happen in a timely manner. And I thoroughly agree with her. Every member of this House and everybody who works for or in the House should be treated with respect and decency, regardless of their ethnic background or any other background issues. This is fundamental to the House, to our democracy, and dare I say to the constitution of this nation, and I think you can go back, though I went in this speech, to Magna Carta and the idea that we have equality under the law and that we all should have, and that is a fundamental position uh, of the British constitution. Um, I am, of course, and I reiterate this, acting for the Commission, but in acting for the Commission, I commend these motions to the House. The question is, as on the order papers, many of the can say aye? Aye. aye. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. And before I move on to the other motions, I too would like to send my thanks and congratulations to Ray Mortimer, who I can see is hovering in the back. Uh, Ray, I've been a member for 29 years, and you've been a member, a part of my life, therefore, for the past 18 years, as you will have for many people uh, sitting around the chamber. You've heard the accolades. You'll be able to get Hansard tomorrow, take it home with you, and uh, in your future life, I hope that you'll flip through the pages and read the warm wishes that you've received from so many people here, and that I hope it brings you great joy and your family as well. You've been very much uh, front of house uh, during, that part, uh, during the past 18 years, irrespective of what you're going to do with the Marlowe Theatre, but I hope you'll take it in uh, the right spirit, as I know you will, 
when I say in the future, break a leg. Good luck. And also, um, this may be the appropriate time to thank everybody uh, who has made the uh, past parliamentary session work for us under the most strenuous of conditions. I don't think any of us thought uh, that uh, as we went into this COVID situation that we would be able to get the democracy working in the way that we have. It was a bit clunky to begin with, but my goodness me, it's, we've learned lessons and uh, it has worked incredibly well. Uh, and so we want to thank the technicians and the broadcasting union uh, for, uh, well, we, we wish Ray breaking a leg. They've been breaking their backs uh, to make sure that the democracy here has worked and we'd like to thank everybody uh, from the doorkeepers, those who in the catering staff, the security, the cleaners and everybody who has made this democracy work. Thank you very much. We hope that there's light at the end of the tunnel and that, uh, that the stress that they faced uh, will be eased somewhat uh, with the relaxations uh, in the coming weeks and months and we can get our democracy back working as is normal. And I know that's what everybody wants. Uh, in this place. So thank you, everybody. I remind the House that in accordance with the order of the House today in Standing Order No. 41A3, uh, any divisions on the next two motions will not be deferred. So we now come to motion number nine on environmental protection. And Minister, to move. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order papers, may that please say aye. 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 And now I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to motion number 10 on senior courts of England and Wales. Minister, to move. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order papers, may that please say aye. Aye. And know, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to petition. Alexander Stafford. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise to present a petition on behalf of the residents of Rother Valley calling for a powerful bid to be placed by Rother Metropolitan Borough Council to secure a grant from the Leveling Up Fund. My petition, both online and on paper, has received strong local support, with over 1,800 constituents signing it. The people of Rother Valley are calling for our high streets to be transformed. I believe it is high time that local authority delivers on this priority. The petition states... The petition of residents of the constituency of Rother Valley declares that a strong bid for the levelling up fund must be placed on behalf of the Rother Valley constituency. Further, that high streets in Rother Valley should form a central aspect of the bid placed. The petitioners therefore request that the House of Commons call on the Government to urge Rother Metropolitan Borough Council to ensure that high streets in the Rother Valley constituency can be rejuvenated via the levelling up fund. And the petitioners remain, etc. Yeah. Petition, Leveling Up Fund. Thank you very much, Mr. Stafford. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn, and we're going to have Andrew Salou on the video link. And during, uh, whilst you're speaking, Andrew, if you don't mind, but we will be sanitising the, uh, the government's uh, dispatch box. And I know Mr. Scully has been on strict orders not to go anywhere near it until it's been properly sanitised. So thank you very much. Andrew Salou. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'm very grateful to Mr. Speaker for granting me this debate. And I'm very proud to support a government that has committed to the national living wage to be equivalent to two thirds of the median income by 2024, in addition to reducing the age for accessing the national living wage to 23 this month and reducing it further to 21 by April 2024. We want work to be worthwhile and an effective route out of poverty, so it's important that everyone is entitled to the legal minimum wage. Unfortunately, the combined impact of the National Minimum Wage Act 1998 and the National Minimum Wage Regulations 2015, along with the provisions of the Care Act 2014 and the enforcement role of HMRC, have all been completely ineffective in enforcing the law for one of my constituents, a carer, who is owed £62,961 of unpaid wages below the minimum wage. There were also four other carers in the same position, and who knows how many others across the United Kingdom are in the same position. I will use this case to demonstrate how the law has not worked effectively. 
I do not expect my honourable friend, the Minister, to comment on the individual case, but I would like him to set out the plans the government has to remedy the flaws in the current legislation so that an effective remedy can be provided to people like my constituent where now there is none. My constituent, I shall call her Mrs Wright, it's not her real name, provided care for seven years to a disabled woman who I shall call Mrs Edwards, also not her real name. The wages to pay Mrs Wright were provided by Lucian Borough Council and paid by a local charity into the account of the person being cared for, and cheques were then made by Luton Borough Council to make sure that the money provided was paid over to the carer. Section 33 of the Care Act 2014 enables care to be devolved to the person being cared for who enters into a contract of employment with her carer. After seven years of good and faithful work caring for Mrs Edwards, the local charity who'd received funding from Luton Borough Council sent the carer a schedule showing that throughout the entire seven-year period, she'd been underpaid a total of nearly £63,000. The local charity also paid the premium for an insurance policy to cover employers' liability and legal expenses and costs should the carer have cause to sue the person being cared for, her employer, Mrs Edwards. Mrs Wright, the carer, was never provided with the contract of employment by her employer. Both Luton Borough Council and the local charity say they are not liable for this massive underpayment of wages because the contract of employment is between the carer and the person being cared for and has nothing to do with either of them. The legal expenses insurer did not even bother to reply, which is completely shameful as well. There's no point suing the person being cared for, the employer, because she lives in a rented flat, has no other assets, and all her income comes from state benefits. As my constituent, Mrs Wright's solicitor, said to me, this is a wrong with no remedy. So the aim of this debate today, so that the Minister and I are not wasting our time, is to make sure that a remedy is provided to Mrs Wright and other carers in her position so that the law requiring the payment of the minimum wage applies to them as well as to everyone else. The matter was first brought to my attention in the summer of 2018. I did my research and indeed found out that everything I'd been told about the inability to secure the payment of wages legally due was true. So I contacted Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs to try and get enforcement action. HMRC said in a letter back to me that they were, and I quote, determined that everyone who is entitled to the national minimum wage should receive it. That turned out to be a hollow phrase because no effective enforcement action can be taken against an employer who has no assets and indeed never had any in the first place. Luton Borough Council wrote back to me to say, any issue regarding alleged historical underpayment of minimum wage will be a matter for the person being cared for and the carer to resolve. I should point out there is no alleged underpayment because the agency employed by Luton Borough Council to check wages paid against wages legally required to be paid came up with a schedule showing the underpayment of nearly £63,000. So, having hit a brick wall with HMRC and with Luton Borough Council, who were the local authority responsible providing the person being cared for with funds to pay uh, for the care provided, I went to see the previous Minister for Small Business Consumers and Corporate Responsibility, who was very sympathetic and and agreed there was indeed a problem. At that meeting, I was told that local authorities did indeed have a responsibility for direct payments in that they must be satisfied that personal budget holders are capable of paying the minimum wage and the local authority should have undertaken a six-month review, after which the local authority should have reviewed the making of the direct payment no later than every 12 months. The Minister's predecessor then very helpfully wrote to the Chief Executive of Lucian Borough Council, pointing out that they should have had an effective monitoring process of the direct payments 
to ensure the individual fulfills their responsibilities as an employer and that following the six-month review, the local, local authority should have reviewed the making of direct payment no later than every 12 months. Lucian Borough Council, in their reply, said that the carer had been paid a fixed weekly rate based on unmeasured work hours, when in fact the carer had very clear hours that she was expected to work. The Minister's predecessor also wrote to the Ministry of State for Care at the Department of Health, Health and Social Care to explain the problem. The previous Minister for Care wrote back to say that Lucian Borough Council should have been satisfied that the person being cared for was capable of managing direct payments by herself or with the help of the charity who was asked to provide that help. As I said earlier, it was the local charity Luton Borough Council used who have produced a schedule showing an underpayment of wages throughout an entire seven-year period amounting to nearly £63,000. I've raised this matter before on the floor of the House with the leader of the House of Commons who said... I am clear that care workers provide essential support to some of the most vulnerable members of society, and it is essential that they are paid in accordance with the law, including the national minimum wage for the work they do. This is a responsibility of local authorities, which should ensure that personal budgets are sufficient to, de to deliver a person's care needs, including making sure that they cover the cost of wages, and local authorities have a duty to monitor how personal budgets are spent. The Department of Health and Social Care will take this up with the local authority and ask it to investigate what sounds like a very serious and concerning case. I've also had a meeting with my honourable friend, the Minister, replying to the debate this evening. Now, in the 2019 Queen's speech, the government announced that it would legislate to create a single enforcement body in an employment bill. That bill would give us the opportunity to remedy this very serious loophole which I have outlined. We should also remember the payment of premiums for an insurance policy to cover the employer's liability and legal expenses and costs, which has been of no assistance whatsoever in this case. The Minister will agree with me, I'm sure, about the importance of people receiving the wages they are legally entitled to. And we share a commitment to increasing the minimum wage to make it always worthwhile to go out to work and to lift more people out of poverty. I would please ask him to make sure that the single enforcement body in the employment bill will be up to the task of providing effective remedy in situations such as the one I've described and that it has retrospective power to help diligent, hard-working and highly compassionate carers, such as my constituent, Mrs Wright. Please. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd like to congratulate my honourable friend, the member for South West Bedfordshire, for securing today's important debate and, indeed, his tenacity in, uh, in uh, uh, supporting and representing his constituent. I'm, proud to serve as the Minister responsible for national minimum wage and national living wage and workers' rights, in amongst my other responsibilities. And I uh, very much value um, his uh, fulsome words for the benefits of the national minimum wage to make sure that we can encur uh, encourage people, and as he rightly says, um, to encourage people that work pays, that we must protect the, the people at the lowest, uh, um, in the lowest pay grades, but ma make sure that they can stay within work and have a fruitful career. Because this government is committed to building an economy that works for everyone through that national minimum wage and the national living wage, we continue to ensure that the lowest paid in society are rewarded fairly for their contribution to the economy. In April, we increased the national living wage by 2.2% to £8.91, and that's the, ever, the highest ever UK minimum wage. A full-time worker on the national living wage will see their annual earnings rise by over £345. That amounts to a total increase of more than £4,000 since the national living wage was announced in 2015. But we also lowered the age threshold for the national living wage to 23, and as a result, 23 and 24-year-olds will get a 71 pence increase. And we increased the time for which employers must keep minimum wage records from three to six years. That means workers will get more of the historic arrears owed to them. The government is committed to cr cr cracking down on employers who fail to pay the national minimum or national living wage. And that's why we... 
I'll indeed give way. Can I first of all thank the Honourable Gentleman for South West Bedford for bringing this forward. Uh, I am always encouraged by what the Minister says, and it, and it is encouraging of the things that have been done. But could I ask the Minister this? Does he not agree that there is a, a need to ensure that there are some loopholes which are co allowing casual workers to have their hours not recorded, and therefore not having an appropriate minimum wage in force must be closed? And can I ask the Minister? Is it the intention of his government to, to, to ensure that employers will start doing the right thing and, and, and instead of, at this moment time, that they are able to avoid it? Thank you. I thank the honourable gentleman. And he raises the important points twofold. First of all, about anomalies. And it is important that ignorance is no, no defence in terms of paying the national minimum wage, and that is where enforcement comes in, which I will expand um, uh, uh, on in a second. But he is absolutely right to raise these issues, that we must make sure that we are not balancing the books of, uh, of um, companies, are not ba balancing their books on the poorest paid within their uh, companies and indeed society, as I said. So we relaunched the minimum wage naming scheme on the 31st of December, naming and shaming 139 employers, including some of the UK's biggest household names, for failing to pay the minimum wage. We have also doubled the budget, more than doubled the budget, for minimum wage enforcement and compliance since 2015. There are now over 400 officers in HMRC dedicated to ensuring compliance with the minimum wage. But I would like briefly to take the opportunity to share the results of HMRC's work in the 2020 to 2021 financial year. It was a really challenging year, as we have heard, for the whole country. Much of HMRC's investigations are carried out face to face. They can arrive unannounced at business premises to check minimum wage records or to interview employers and workers. These face to face visits clearly had to be limited in line with COVID restrictions and with many businesses temporarily closing their doors. Nevertheless, this government believes that the pandemic is no excuse for not paying staff correctly, and especially in sectors like social care and retail, which have provided invaluable services over the last year. So I am pleased that HMRC continued its enforcement and compliance work, prioritising desk work where possible, and also expanding its educational work with employers and workers. So despite the pandemic, in 2020 to 2021, HMRC closed over 2,700 cases securing more than £16.7 million in arrears for more than 155,000 workers. They also issued 575 penalties worth over £14 million. HMRC also contacted more than 770,000 employers and workers to improve awareness of the minimum wage. As part of this, they sent over 400,000 texts to apprentices regarding the risks of underpayment from unpaid training time. They wrote to nearly 200,000 employers and workers, and they produced a variety of webinars and educational videos that accumulated nearly 20,000 views. One of these webinars is aimed specifically at the social care sector, covering travel time, waiting time and breaks. Around 12,000 letters are being sent to CQC registered providers of home care service to highlight this webinar. And this brings me on to my honourable friend's uh, concerns. The government acknowledges the particular challenges in enforcing minimum wage in the care sector. We estimate that approximately 27,000 social care workers were underpaid the national living wage or national minimum wage in 2020. This represents just over 3% of all workers in the sector and is in line with previous years. All workers deserve the wage they are legally entitled to, but particularly key workers in the current context of the coronavirus pandemic. The government therefore asks HMRC to focus on the sector in its targeted enforcement activity. The government has also recently published comprehensive revised minimum wage guidance for all employers. That includes guidance on the recent Supreme Court judgment on sleep-in shifts, where we now have clarity after years of evolving court judgments. But I'm well aware of my honourable friend's concerns about social care workers. We met late last year, as he's outlined, to discuss the issue of care workers providing care to individuals with direct payment arrangements, also known as per personal budget holders. And I appreciate the situation with per personal budget holders is particularly tricky. They're vulnerable individuals, but in minimum wage terms, they are often the employers of their carers. And that means, under minimum wage legislation, any enforcement action to, by HMRC for underpayment of their care workers can only be taken against these individuals. But I'd like to give some assurances on how enforcement works in practice in such cases. Where complaints are received, HMRC works with all parties to ensure that personal budget holders receive the necessary help and support while also continuing to protect the rights of workers. And as my honourable friend has said, local authorities have a duty of care, uh, under the CARE Act to give personal budget holders 
clear advice about their responsibilities as an employer. Local authorities must also be satisfied that a personal budget holder is capable of managing direct payments and they should put in place an effective monitoring process relating to those direct payments. Crucially, this involves checking to ensure the individual is fulfilling their responsibilities as an employer. Now, I understand there are examples of local authorities stepping up to financially assist personal bu budget holders when minimum wage cases are brought against them. And I strongly encourage this, which is in line with the Local Authorities Care Act duties. But ultimately, HMRC needs to protect the right, rights of any underpaid worker. However, where arrears have been repaid to the worker, HMRC has discretion on whether or not to issue a formal notice of underpayment. So HMRC rightly makes limited use of its discretion in practice, but cases brought against personal budget holders are instances where I would expect HMRC to consider using that discretion. So I therefore urge work workers who care for personal budget holders and who believe they've been underpaid, such as the honourable, my honourable friend's constituent, to complain to HMRC or contact ACAS for advice. But I understand, having spoken to my honourable friend, that this is um, clearly an issue. His individual case, which I can't comment on in, in detail, but is something that has been going for a number of years and is a, a, a good few years old. But uh, I, as I say, admire his tenacity, um, the, working with um, the, the, the council as well, pushing the council to do more, and also speaking to my predecessor as well as myself, because I know he's calling for HMRC to be able to enforce directly against local authorities in such cases. However, HMRC can only enforce against the employer. That's laid out in primary legislation. But it's right there's a clear line. So employers are always clear about their responsibilities and workers are always clear about their rights. Any change could call into question other scenarios where there are multiple parties involved in employment, such as agency workers, umbrella companies or contractors. It could lead to protracted court cases to determine who's responsible for paying the minimum wage. And that would only delay workers getting the pay they're legally entitled to. So we have, no, therefore, no plans to change the minimum wage legislation. But we are extremely proud of all of our health and social care staff. We recognise their extraordinary commitment, especially during the COVID pandemic. The 1.5 million people who make up the paid social care workforce provide an invaluable service to the nation, especially during the pandemic. Putting social care on a sustainable footing where everybody is treated with dignity and respect is one of the biggest challenges that our society faces. These are comp there are complex questions to address to which we want to give our full consideration in the light of current circumstances. And that's why the government is committed to the sustainable improvement of the adult social care system and the Department for Health and Social Care will bring forward plans for workforce, workforce reform later this year. We're providing an extra £341 million for adult social care to pay for infection prevention control measures and to support rapid testing to the ed end of June 2021. This will bring specific funding for adult social care during the pandemic to almost £1.8 billion. We're also providing councils with access to over £1 billion of additional funding for social care in 2021-2022, on top of the significant support provided over the last year to support the sector deal with COVID-19. My honourable friend also talked about the single enforcement body coming back to uh, I I enforcement, and indeed that is something that, uh, that, that we are consulting on that we're working through as well, not least as we uh, move towards um, uh, issue, uh, the, our employment bill. We are taking the time to reflect on, on what the lessons that we've learnt uh, from the COVID-19 situation, those baked in behaviour changes and what in work practices in the wider sense of the employment bill, that the single enforcement body is going to be a really important part of that. And I look forward to my own defence uh, contributions to that debate as we, as, as we begin the legislation to uh, bring that new body into uh, existence. And he has made some important points, and I'm really pleased to have had the opportunity to respond. The government's committed to ensuring that all workers are paid at least the minimum wage. This is their legal entitlement. We also recognise that personal budget holders and individuals arranging their own care are often amongst the most vulnerable in society. Where complaints are received, HMRC will work with all parties to ensure that these individuals receive the help and support they need, whilst also continuing to protect the rights of workers. I look forward to continuing the work with ministerial colleagues to ensure that all care workers are paid appropriately under the National Minimum Wage Act. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I join your words, uh, associate myself with your words and wish you a very uh, good prorogation, whatever the term is, as, as, as you sit there, and, uh, uh, and, and, you know, because members and the staff and your team 
have played an amazing role in allowing us to continue scrutiny of government's work and our work as a, as a fully fu functioning democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. It is really much appreciated, and I'll make sure it gets passed on to the speaker and the, other, uh, the others in the team. The question is that this House do now adjourn, as many as other people say, aye. Uh, Don't you know? I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. Order.